The Wedding, Book 10 of the Ramsley Brothers Series, written by Josephine Bintema, narrated by Josephine Bintema. Chapter 1 Marshall He felt like a boy asking a girl for a first date. His hands were sweaty, his breath shallow, and his heart was thumping. This was silly, he thought to himself. He was a Ramsley. He had been talking to her for nearly three years. He had never talked to her about this. Marshall cleared his throat, waiting as the call connected. He had tried to get off work early to be home on time and make the all-important phone call from there. Instead, he was stuck in traffic, waiting as an accident was cleared up. Marshall could not delay the call. There was only an hour for her lunch break, if she was even available. For all he knew, she was in surgery. This is Jasmine. Please leave your name, phone number, and a brief message. Thank you. Marshall was not sure what to say. He couldn't very well propose over voicemail. A car honked and he realized some space had cleared up in the street in front of him. Edging his car forward, Marshall wondered if he had missed the tone from the answering service. Hi, it's me. Look, you're probably in surgery right now. Um, I was kind of hoping to talk to you about something. Call me when you get done your shift. Don't worry about what time it is here. Just give me a call. Hope you have a good day. Marshall? A breathy, slightly accented voice asked. I just got back from the cafeteria and saw your cell number. How are you? Did you get to do the cholecystectomy? No, Stiles took the gallbladder surgery, replied Marshall, relieved to hear her voice. The board meeting was pushed up and I had to be there. That is too bad, murmured Jasmine. I have a pacemaker implant surgery this afternoon. If you want, I can send you the chart and say you are consulting with me. Nice remarked Marshall, carefully maneuvering his vehicle forward before stopping in traffic again. Jasmine and he consulted on a number of their patients. They had been doing so for three years, ever since he had contracted her as a renowned heart surgeon for a case at Mercy Hospital. Several times he offered her a position at the Ramsley-owned chain of hospitals. She declined each offer. Instead, they talked on a regular basis about the cases they had. Over time, they had ventured to talk about nearly everything that was happening in their lives. It was why he wanted to speak to her now. Marshall hoped she felt the same way he did. I was hoping to speak to you about something else, though. Is this about your father's ultimatum? wondered Jasmine, homing in on his thoughts. I've been thinking about it, and your brother Parker is very brave for taking on a wife he has never even met. Also, did the engagement ring work to get Gabe to agree to marry Brittany? Or was it too much? I think it may have been too much. Don't tell me. You've gotten engaged to Brittany by accident. Her delighted voice dissolved into giggles. I am not engaged to Brittany, smiled Marshall, enjoying her laughter. Gabe took the bait. You were right. The ring was enough to push him over the edge and propose to Brittany himself. Oh, good, exclaimed Jasmine with satisfaction. I am most pleased. What was it that you wished to speak about? I know I said I was okay if I lose out on my inheritance, he began with some trepidation. It doesn't affect me the way it will my brothers. I'm a surgeon, and I can do surgeries full-time happily. The only thing I might regret is, as part of the board, I get to push a lot of charity work. I have made Ramsley HMC a leader in pro bono work and research. I'm proud of it. You're having regrets in your decision mused Jasmine. No, I have no regrets. Marshall took a deep breath. However, it did get me thinking about who I would want to spend the rest of my life with, and I thought of something. I like talking to her, she makes my day better, and we seem to click. I really like her. There was a slight pause. Who is this mystery woman? This was it. This was the moment. Marshall was about to take a leap of faith. A car horn sounded. Distracted, Marshall moved forward, and more horns blared. You. What? I couldn't hear you, explained Jasmine. Are you in traffic? It's you, Marshall said louder. I see a future with you. A truck horn blared loudly. Marshall looked to his passenger side in time to see a truck coming toward him at too high of a speed from the off-ramp. Metal and plastic screeched as the frame of Marshall's car buckled. Glass shattered. 
The airbag went off as the seatbelt tightened, cutting into Marshall's chest as the car moved sideways. Marshall, are you okay? A concerned Jasmine asked. What happened? It sounds like you were in a car crash. His ears were ringing. His face felt bruised from where the airbag had hit him. His chest was in pain. There was a gasping breath, and Marshall realized it was him. He concentrated on breathing in and out, slowly, deeply. Marshall? Jasmine was sounding more panicked and tinnier. The Bluetooth in the car had cut out, and she was on speaker from, from his suit pocket. Talk to me. Tell me if you're okay. There was an accident. The words tumbled from his brain. Marshall brought his fingertips to his stinging forehead. They came away bloody. He blinked as a drop of blood tried to enter his eye. Wiping his forehead, Marshall tried to take stock of his condition. I think I'm okay. Does anything hurt? Jasmine called out. I can barely hear you. Reaching into his pocket, Marshall pulled out the phone, pressing it to his ear, which was still ringing. I'm all right. It's just some bruising and a cut to my head. He unbuckled his seatbelt. Thankfully, it was the passenger side which was crumpled in. If anyone had been in the seat next to Marshall, they would have sustained some serious injuries. What happened? she wondered. I think I was hit by a transport truck, surmised a bemused Marshall getting out of the car. Sure enough, embedded in his vehicle was the front of the smoking tractor trailer. Wow. Smoking? Panic flared in him. Wait a sec. Marshall tucked the phone back in his suit jacket pocket as he came around his vehicle, climbing between his bumper and the car behind his. Jumping on the running board of the truck, he tore open the door to find the smoke had filled the cabin of the vehicle. Sir, sir, you need to get out. Oh, I would, but my seatbelt won't undo, and I dropped my stupid pocket knife on the floor. The brakes failed as I came off the ramp, grumbled the man as he coughed on the smoke. You need to get out of here. Marshall leaned over, looking at the floor mat, trying to find the knife. You need to run, the truck driver said gruffly. If the engine catches fire and spreads to the cabin, there'll be nothing from stopping it getting to my load. I'm carrying a Class Three gas in the tanker behind me. I don't know what that means, stated Marshall as he found the knife. Grabbing the seatbelt, he began sawing at the safety device. It means this whole truck could blow higher than a firecracker on New Year's Eve, grunted the driver. Are you injured? asked Marshall. I'm fine. Truck took the brunt of the accident. Your car got the worst of it. The trucker's eyes widened. Your car just went on fire. Do you have a fire extinguisher? questioned Marshall as the seatbelt gave way. Behind the seat, the trucker pushed away the seatbelt. It's too late, though. What we need to do is evacuate everyone nearby. Go. Marshall helped him down from the truck. Tell people to go. Not waiting to see what the trucker would do, he flipped the seat forward looking for the fire extinguisher. Marshall? Jasmine's voice came from his pocket. What are you doing? Tell me what is happening. Found it, muttered Marshall as he grabbed the fire extinguisher. A rush of heat hit him as something in his car exploded, and Marshall automatically ducked as a reaction, even though he was somewhat shielded by the door in the cab of the large truck. Looking at his brand new burning Maserati, Marshall did not think that the fire extinguisher was going to cut it. However, he had to try. He had to give everyone enough time to get away from the impending explosion. Marshall hopped out of the truck. Pulling the pin on the fire extinguisher, he aimed it at his car, hoping it would impede the fire a little before it spread to the truck. Even if it was only for a couple of minutes, that was more people who would be able to get to safety. Talk to me, yelled Jasmine over the phone. Say something. What is happening? The extinguisher sprayed and finally depleted its supply. Marshall grabbed out his phone as he turned to run through the mass of cars. I'm okay. Marshall, a relieved Jasmine said. You have no idea how worried I was. Are you a safe distance from the transport? Not really, replied Marshall as he spotted someone waving a hand out of the passenger side of their car. Hold on a moment. Gasping for air, his sore ribs protesting, Marshall wove his way through the now abandoned vehicles to the car where the person was. Oh, thank you, an elderly woman cried. My husband, I think he's having a heart attack. Marshall looked back at the transport, 
judging that they were probably still too close. He really had no idea, but it would be better to be safe than dead. Ma'am, you need to get out of the car. What about my husband? She looked tearfully at Marshall. I'm a doctor. I will look after him, stated Marshall. He went around to the driver's side of the vehicle, opening the door and checking the elderly man. Chest pain? The elderly man nodded, trying hard to breathe through the pain. The fingers of his right hand were digging into the flesh of his upper left arm. Okay, seat belt off. Marshall reached across him to undo the seat belt. First, we're going to move to a safe distance. Then we can worry about your heart. Marshall put his phone back in his pocket and pulled the elderly gentleman out of the vehicle until he was able to lift him up to wrap an arm around the man's torso and pull the other man's arm across Marshall's neck. Marshall grunted, bearing most of the man's weight as they moved forward. The wife followed them. Do you think it's wise to move him? she fearfully asked. We should wait for the ambulance. They say never to move someone after an accident. I don't want my husband to be paralyzed. Keep moving, Marshall ground out. He was not very far when another man came to help him, grabbing the other side of the ill elderly man. Thanks. Let's go, urged the stranger. The tanker is going to blow any minute. They hobbled as fast as they could getting to where the crowd was being held back by a group of frazzled policemen who were trying to hold the line. Marshall directed his helper to let the elderly gentleman sit while he checked on him. He's still breathing, still alive. What sort of doctor are you? asked the elderly woman suspiciously. An herbalist? A foot doctor? What do you know about heart attacks? Ain't that funny? An amused voice spoke. Doc Ramsley being asked if he's a real doctor. Dr. Colburn, Marshall greeted his half-cousin. Our friend here thinks he's having a heart attack. Is he now? Molson Colburn crouched down, pressing his stethoscope to the man's chest. He closed his eyes, concentrating on listening. Are you a real doctor? The elderly woman frowned at the tattoos on Molson's neck. I'm a resident at Mercy Hospital explained a patient Molson, still listening to the heartbeats. They let us out on a field trip to the accident scene today. Then you're not a real doctor, she sniffed. We want a real doctor. We're both real doctors, coughed an irritated Marshall. He searched his suit pocket for his phone and came up empty. Your husband isn't well, concluded Molson. We'll know more once we can get him to the hospital for tests. Why don't you tell me what sort of medications he's on? The elderly woman began a litany of medications. Marshall stood, looking back at his burning car. He must have dropped his phone when he had been pulling the elderly man along. Marshall couldn't see it nearby. The tanker exploded. There was a gasp from the crowd as everyone instinctively flinched away from the fireball hurling upward. The police urged people to step back further as a fire truck tried to get closer to the blaze. Hey, want to help me get Mr. Possible Heart Attack to the ambulance? questioned Molson, seemingly impervious to the chaos. Sure, Marshall grimly agreed, pulling his attention away from the angry fireball on the street. He assisted the elderly gentleman to stand, supporting him with Molson as they wove through the crowd to find an ambulance. The elderly wife chattered fretfully in their wake the entire time. Once they had deposited the pair with paramedics, Marshall grabbed Molson by the shoulder before he could head into the crowd to help more patients. Can I use your phone? Mine is back in the explosion, and I need to call someone. Sure thing. Molson dug his phone out of his pocket of his scrubs. You going back to the hospital? I wasn't paged, frowned Marshall as he tried to remember Jasmine's phone number. Usually, he just selected her from his contact list, so it was difficult to think what the digits were. Was it a large accident that shut down the freeway? Pretty big, shrugged Molson. I heard something about a tour bus, so I'd expect a lot of injuries. This isn't what I meant, though. You should get checked out. It's just a scratch, dismissed Marshall as he dialed numbers on the cell phone. Molson grabbed Marshall's head and pushed the hair out of the way to inspect. It's five stitches minimum. Get to the hospital in one of those ambulances, or I'll take my phone back. Molson let Marshall go a little roughly, cocking his head to the side to see if Marshall would concede to his ultimatum. 
Marshall frowned at his half-cousin, trying to decide how serious he was. While they were now family and worked at the same hospital, they were still cautiously getting to know each other. Okay, I'll meet you at the hospital to return your phone, decided Marshall, as he took a chance on the last digit and put the phone up to his ear. It was ringing. Your girl? questioned a curious Molson about the phone call Marshall was making. Maybe. I hope so. Don't you have victims to see to? asked Marshall, hoping for a little privacy. Sure thing, Doc. An unrepentant Molson grinned as he walked away into the crowd. Hello? came Jasmine's worried voice. Jasmine? Marshall closed his eyes in relief, surprised he had gotten through to her. Marshall! When the phones cut out, I thought... She trailed off, obviously upset. I'm okay, he assured her. So is the guy with the possible heart attack. Everyone is okay. I just lost my phone in the chaos. There was silence on the phone. About what I said earlier, began Marshall nervously. Marshall, Jasmine softly said. I really think you and I could have a future together. Now that he had started, Marshall found the words tumbling over themselves. We're friends. I can talk to you about anything. I like you. In fact, you're the only woman I have ever considered marrying. There are things you don't know about me, warned Jasmine. I'll learn them, quickly replied Marshall. I'm sure there's stuff you have to learn about me yet. It's part of what marriage is, learning about each other. You cannot be serious, chided Jasmine. We've never even met. Not even a Zoom call. I want to meet you in person, declared Marshall. I want to take you on a date. A lot of dates. When works for you? Jasmine had a breathless laugh. You're not serious. You're just feeling a little left out now that both your brothers are getting married. I'm very serious, defended Marshall. To show you how serious I am, I'm coming to your hospital. I'll bring flowers and a ring. I'm ready to go down on one knee. Marshall, no, giggled Jasmine. You are joking. I think I might love you, he admitted. Do you hear me? I love you. Silence greeted him. When it continued, Marshall pulled the phone away from his ear. The battery had died. Chapter 2 Ben Ben looked at the invitation. Aunt Dottie had an obvious hand in it. She loved purple, and the invite was full of purple flowers on a delicate green vine on the expensive cream paper. The date registered in his brain with some surprise. Ben frowned. None of his cousins had told him they were engaged, let alone getting married. Gabe, Parker, and Marshall weren't even dating anyone as far as he knew. He set the invitation on top of the rest of the unopened mail as the phone rang. Ben? Automatically greeted Ben as he held his cell up to his ear. I couldn't think of anyone else to call, came a tearful voice. I'm so sorry. It's okay, Kitty, replied Ben as he recognized her voice despite her distress. What's going on? She had a watery sigh. It's just, I left my purse in the cab. Tristan and I got into a fight about whether to call this taxi service to try to get my purse back. Then Tristan left without paying for the meal because he was upset. Now the restaurant is threatening to call the police and I have no money to pay the bill. I offered to do dishes, but they didn't take me seriously. Ben genuinely hated Tristan. He reined in any anger he felt toward the other man and softened his voice. Could you put the manager on the phone? I'm so sorry, Ben. I didn't mean for this to happen, apologized Kitty again. She gulped and choked on a sob. I thought he was going to ask me to marry him. Instead, he dumped me. Ben held back a curse. He couldn't think of a suitable reply. Thankfully, he didn't have to as the manager came on the phone. Ben took down the address and promised he would be there shortly to settle the bill. Less than a half hour later, Ben was getting out of his prototype coupe convertible. It was a limited model which had certain self-driving capabilities not yet available to the general market. Ben made his living testing and creating at the cutting edge of technology. He entered the restaurant, the much-reputed Antonio's, meeting the manager at the front. You're Mr. Ben Ramsley? The man questioned, 
noting Ben's jeans, sneakers, and long-sleeved black tee, which sported a happy emoji on it. Thankfully, it was after hours in the fine dining establishment. Antonio's was a black tie sort of place, an expensive place, which was something Tristan would have known before sticking the bill to his minimum-wage-earning girlfriend, Kitty. Ben pulled out his wallet, let them think whatever they wanted. He had been comfortably at home, working on a project. He rarely dressed up for anyone these days. He was a large guy, and comfort was his main priority in clothing. Picking out his gold credit card, he extended it to the man. How much is the damage? Eight hundred and change. The man took the card. He had a huff of annoyance. She thought she could do dishes to work it off. Eight hundred dollars, whistled Ben. He had the lobster bisque, remarked the manager as he ran the card through the till, and two bottles of red wine. Ben supposed he should be happy it was only eight hundred. He has horrible taste in wine. Agreed, the manager muttered. He gave Ben back his credit card. She's in the back. Ben followed the manager to the back seating area of the deserted restaurant. Kitty sat at a table, sniffling and pressing a tissue to her eyes. She wore a pretty white dress, which now had a red wine stain. I'm so embarrassed, she whispered as he approached. I promise I will pay you back. Grabbing a chair, he sat beside her. You don't need to. It's all taken care of. She burst into a fresh set of tears as she hugged him. I'm the worst friend ever. Hey, that isn't fair, he remonstrated gently. You're a good friend. You make sure I go to the gym. You've been trying to get me to eat healthy. You make me take breaks from work. You're a good friend, Kitty. Since your brother died, someone should be taking care of you. She hiccuped and laid her head on his shoulder. I just wanted you to stick around. You're my best guy friend. Friends, echoed Ben, absently rubbing her back. He broke up with me, murmured Kitty. Ben nodded. It was the fifth time Tristan had dumped Kitty. Knowing the pair, there would likely be a sixth. He's getting married, she choked, her tears wetting his shirt. He wanted to know if I thought she would like the ring. Tristan was seeing her the whole time he was going out with me. Ben muttered a word, which would have had his mother ordering the nanny to soap his mouth when he was younger. Kay gasped in surprise. He hardly ever swore. Sorry, we should probably go. Kitty nodded, exhausted. Ben helped her up from her chair, keeping his arm around her, a hand on her waist. Can I stay over? She questioned quietly as she leaned on him. Any time you want he agreed. You know that. I'd rather not go home to my roommates who are going to be disappointed Tristan didn't pop the question to me, sighed Kitty. I just can't face them right now. Stay as long as you want, offered Ben. Just remember, my fridge is healthy now, courtesy of you. If you want comfort food, we'll have to order something. I'm not very hungry right now, noted Kitty. Ben got the door of the car for her, making sure her dress was fully in before shutting it. As he got in the driver's side, she looked at the lush interior of the car. "'Is your work giving you cars now?' questioned Kitty as she did up her seatbelt. Kitty thought he worked for someone else, and Ben never corrected her. He was the head of his own company, and he preferred not to make a big deal about it. "'Kind of. It's a loner. The car maker wants me to test it out and give a review of what I think.' "'Oh,' Kitty looked it over. "'It's really nice.' Yeah, it is. Ben pulled his eyes away from her, concentrating on the road. What the company really wanted to know was how hackable the model was. As cars became more and more technologically advanced, they carried computers that could be tampered with. Ben was hired to ensure that didn't happen, by figuring out ways to hack the car, then program in defenses against such events. It was a challenging side project to the other work he did on a regular basis. Not that Ben had to work any more. He was way past that point. There was more than enough money in his bank account to run a small country. It was just something to do with his time. He stole a glance at Kitty. Even with swollen eyes and a blotchy face, she was the most beautiful girl in his world. He had a hard, mad crush on her. One he did nothing about. Ben didn't want to lose her as a friend. He didn't want to hear her say she had never thought of him that way, 
because no girl ever thought of him that way. Not chubby, shy, quiet nerd Ben. It was still a mystery to him how he had managed to get the few friends he did have. They were a small circle of people, and he loved each of them, especially Kitty. To confess his feelings for her would be social suicide. It would be awkward. It would mean teasing from the guys and pitying looks from the girls. No, it was best to leave those feelings buried deep. Ben pulled into the parking garage, driving up to the elevator. Shutting off the car, he got out. Going around the vehicle, he opened Kitty's door. What about parking the car? she asked in surprise. It parks itself, commented Ben as he shut the door. Tapping a code into the key fob, the car engine started. They watched as the now driverless vehicle drove away, going through pre-programmed motions of parking itself in Ben's assigned spot at the condo complex. Super cool, remarked a bemused Kitty. Are you Batman in your spare time? I wish. Ben had a half-smile, pressing the elevator button. Want to be Batgirl? Batwoman, thank you. Kitty primly corrected him. If there isn't one, there should be. There is. He pulled the information from his extensive knowledge of all things comics. Detective Comics number 233, Kathy Kane made her debut as Batwoman. It was July 1956. Kitty had a little laugh as they made their way to his condo. You're such a nerd. Yep, concurred Ben in a slightly self-depreciating tone. At his door, the facial scanner recognized him, automatically unlocking the condo. After you. Can I borrow some clothes? asked Kitty. I can't wear this any more. I need to soak it to get the wine out. Whatever you need. Ben locked the door, putting the key fob away. He made himself a fruit smoothie, giving Kitty some privacy while she changed into one of his tees and a pair of shorts with a drawstring. They would be far too big for her, but Kitty never seemed to mind the few occasions she had borrowed his clothes. Usually, it was after one of her many breakups when she would stay over at his apartment to nurse her heart and ego for a few days. Splitting the smoothie, Ben knew Kitty would want some, despite what she said about not being hungry. He grabbed his laptop and got settled on the couch. Dressed in his clothes and having washed her face, Kitty put her hair in a messy bun as she went to the kitchen to snag the fruit smoothie he had left for her. On the way back, she snooped through his mail. CIA again? Just toss it, replied Ben. It's another recruitment letter. I got one from the NSA last week. And the FBI two weeks before, commented Kitty as she put the letter in the garbage. Do you ever think of taking one of them up on their offer? Nope. I like my life the way it is, replied Ben. He liked being close to Kitty. If he accepted a position with any of the agencies who kept hounding him to sign up with them, there was a good chance he might have to leave his friends behind. It didn't bear thinking about. You would probably make more money, mentioned Kitty as she tossed another recruitment letter into the trash. I think they just put you on their monthly mailing list. Ben seriously doubted any agency could afford to pay him what he was already drawing in each year right now, let alone what his investments were accumulating. I like my job. There's no reason to change. What's this? Kitty held up the wedding invitation, coming to join him on the couch. A wedding? Looks like it, Ben stated carefully. He hoped she wouldn't start crying again. The tissue box was in the bathroom. Kitty settled into the crook of his arm, leaning her head on his shoulder as she read over the invite. It's pretty soon. Have you sent the RSVP? It came today, explained Ben. I guess I'll just have to give Aunt Dottie a call so she knows I'm going. Who are you bringing with you? A curious Kitty asked as she sipped the smoothie. No one, I suppose. Ben stopped typing. I don't usually bring anyone to these sorts of things. Why not? she asked, tipping her head back to look at him. Ben shrugged, choosing not to reply. Truth was, he had never asked anyone. Ben never ventured against rejection when it came to girls. Taking risks in business, that was just business. Taking a risk in his personal life was off-limits. Ben felt he was a coward in that respect. "'You should bring someone,' mused Kitty. "'It's a plus-one invitation to the wedding.' Triple wedding, commented Ben. 
It's last minute for the holiday weekend. I'm sure no one would be available. I'm available, stated Kitty quietly. We could go and mock the bridesmaids' dresses together. I could be your wingman. Kitty then began, uncertain of how to spare her feelings. He wondered what his family would say if he showed up with a girl on his arm. He wondered if she would change her mind before the event, and he would end up going solo anyways. Tristan and you just broke up. I would understand if you'd rather not go to a wedding. No, decided Kitty. Let's go to the wedding. It'll be fun. You and I can go as friends, and we'll have a great time. Friends, echoed Ben, not for the first time. He had a nod. Okay, if that's what you want. Cool. She leaned her head on his shoulder after grabbing the television remote. I will put the date on my calendar. Chapter 3 Parker Parker looked up at the sign of the building. Ms. Matron's matchmaking service stared back at him. This was it. He had committed. He had paid the bills. His bride-to-be was behind those doors, waiting to meet him. When he first signed up for the matchmaking service for an overseas bride, it had seemed like the perfect solution. Here he was, getting a bride who would do everything necessary to meet the demands of his father's ultimatum of marriage within a month, a pregnancy within the year, and staying in the marriage for five years before divorcing. He would, of course, retain custody of his son. She would be handsomely paid for her part of the project and remain in the country as a new citizen. It was a win-win situation. Now the time had come to meet her, the fabled woman who was willing to be part of the cold-blooded marriage he had told the matchmaker Ms. Matron that he wanted. Parker felt a feeling of complete nervousness and anxiety. What stupid idea had gotten into his head to commit to this? too late now, he told himself firmly. It was four days until the wedding. He was going to keep his job, salary, condo, and inheritance. To do it, he needed to meet the terms of his father's demands. He needed to marry. Parker loved his job. He made a difference. Being part of the day-to-day -day operation of Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation was his passion. James Ramsley might think his second son was a bum who couldn't do the job correctly but Parker wasn't about to give up the position. If he couldn't be a part of Ramsley HMC, Parker didn't know what he would do with his professional life. He enjoyed his career. Besides surfing, it was his passion. There was nothing else to do but go in, he decided. Stepping into the building, Parker went directly to the elevator. He knew what floor the matchmaking service was on. While on the elevator, he noticed a curvy blonde. Maybe it was her. She would be okay, he reflected. When the doors opened to the floor, he was going to. She didn't get off. Okay, not her. Parker didn't have time to be picky. There was a ring burning a hole in his pocket and a deadline to adhere to. Ms. Matron had said she was a master of her field. She had taken all sorts of information down and promised the perfect match. It was going to be fine, he assured himself. There was no other option, not with a scheduled wedding ever so soon. Parker entered the reception area of the small office. He gave the woman a quick, unfelt smile. Parker Ramsley. It will be just a moment, she smiled warmly, if you'd like to have a seat. Parker didn't like waiting. As a member of the prestigious Ramsley family, he rarely ever waited for anyone. However, the matchmaking service made no exceptions and treated all their clients the same. Parker had a seat in the waiting area, just like every other client. He ignored the various magazines which were available to peruse. Instead, he checked his phone again. His secretary had cleared the entire day for him. She had also suggested he take flowers to meet his soon-to-be wife. Parker had thought the suggestion a little too cheesy. This was a business contract between himself and his bride. Flowers weren't necessary. He had brought the ring after confirming the size. Mr. Ramsley, came Miss Matron's pleasing voice. The plump, graying woman gave him a matronly smile. Parker stood and gave her a nod of respect. It's good to see you again, Miss Matron. She ushered him into an office. 
The results from the fertility clinic are back. Everything went well, and she's been deemed perfectly fit to conceive children. Good. Uncomfortable, Parker cleared his throat. He didn't like talking about his future wife this way, but it was necessary. He needed to know if there were going to be any issues with having a child. It was a condition of their marriage. He was getting married. He was tying himself to an absolute stranger in just four days. Parker dragged himself out of his thoughts. Is there anything else I should know? The family has come for the wedding, warned Miss Matron. They're a little rough around the edges, but well-meaning. Her uncles are especially pleased to meet you. Parker had the feeling Miss Matron was leaving something out. And? I talked to the office overseas, admitted Miss Matron. The impression might have been given that you were willing to sponsor the entire family. Parker stared at her for a moment. This wasn't part of the bargain. What? Not the uncles, she hastily replied. The mother and the bride's younger sisters. The mother is a widow. She has no sons. The uncles are looking for someone to support the woman so they don't have to. So they're just foisting her off on me, he wondered. It's how their culture works. You're marrying the daughter, Miss Matron reminded him. She comes with her unwed mother and siblings. How many sisters? Parker ground out. Two. They're very quiet and well-behaved, quickly inserted Miss Matron. The uncles are insisting it's part of the match, or they'll renege on it. They come from a part of the country which is a little backward and traditional. Women are not allowed jobs outside the home in their particular culture. He had no time to search for another bride. The wedding was just days away. Fine. I'm sure I can afford a condo or something for them. We will figure it out. Excellent, breathed Miss Matron in relief. I have all the paperwork ready. I'm sure she'll be relieved to have some immediate family nearby. True, reluctantly agreed Parker. He supposed he would appreciate it if he had his brothers with him, if he were to move to a whole new country. Not that he had any intentions of ever leaving his home for any extended period of time. Her name is Adriana, Adriana Karina Bukui. She's very shy, but an agreeable young lady, noted Ms. Matron. Shall we go meet her? Parker took a deep breath and nodded. Ms. Matron led the way to a second office. The room was crowded with a number of men, perhaps a dozen of them spanning anywhere from fifteen to fifty standing around the perimeter. All of them had dour looks as they measured him. Two women and two girls, perhaps preteens, sat quietly on the couch. Their heads were bowed. While the elder woman's hair was covered with a scarf, the other females had the same strawberry blonde shade. One of the men grunted something. The woman gave her mother's hand a squeeze, then stood before him, clasping her hands in front of her, fidgeting with her fingers. Pasting a smile on her face, she lifted her chin, darting a quick glance at him to reveal amber eyes before looking down again. She was thin, almost too thin in Parker's opinion. He realized she was trembling. Everyone was looking to him to make the first move, to say something. He cleared his throat. Could I please speak to Adriana alone? One of the younger men said something in another language. Parker didn't follow. He had no gift for foreign languages. He looked at Ms. Matron in confusion. One of his stipulations was that his bride would be fluent in English. There was a response from one of the older men, and they all seemed to frown a little more. The younger man came back with a heavily accented, No, it is not done. You will be alone with her once you are wed. How on earth was he supposed to find out if she were a willing participant in all of this, Parker wondered. An unwelcome sensation came to him. It felt like he had just bought a woman from the slave market. Parker felt dirty at the thought. What had he done? How did anyone fix something like this? Miss Matron, could we have a word? Yes, nodded Miss Matron. They stepped outside, Ms. Matron gently closing the door behind them. Parker ran a hand over his jaw. 
It was unexpected that all of the uncles and some of the cousins would come, she began. I understand it can be quite intimidating. Parker cut her off. Is that poor girl in there being coerced into this? She is twenty-six, Miss Matron calmly reminded him. This is probably her last chance to be married. In her culture, she's considered quite old for a wife. If she remains unwed, she will be a charity case and an afterthought in her family. This wedding not only helps her, it also helps her mother and sisters. I would assume you will be treating them with more consideration than her uncles would. This is despicable, breathed Parker. How can they put her in this position? This is a contract deal, firmly stated Ms. Matron. You have your stipulations. These are hers. I don't know what I expected, but it was definitely not this, muttered Parker, glancing back at the door. You were expecting some cold American-like socialite to take you up on your crazy offer, interjected Miss Matron in a clipped voice. It was an unrealistic expectation. I found you what worked within your stipulations in your time frame. This girl needs a new life. You can be the one who gives it to her. She has every motivation to keep you happy. This is a good match, Mr. Ramsley. It was bordering on criminal, in his opinion. Parker's stomach bottomed out, and he hoped he wouldn't be ill. He didn't want his bride to be some scared wisp of a girl who was doing this just so her sisters could have a better life. She was some sort of martyr, and he felt like he was the ogre she was sacrificing herself to. This isn't right. Parker managed to say. He was on the edge of losing everything. The job he loved, his passion in life. If he turned this down, there would be no going back. Parker wasn't going to fool himself. James Ramsley wouldn't soften his stance on his demands. It was either be married in four days and secure his future, or walk away and lose everything that mattered. I need to be able to talk to her to find out if this is really what she wants without those men staring at us. They might let her talk to you with the mother present. I will ask, agreed Ms. Matron. Okay. Parker cleared his throat, shoving his hands in his pockets, then taking them out again. His mother harped when he put his hands in his pockets. It was something he had not done in ages. It was a sign of how Parker didn't feel in control of the situation. Ms. Matron left him in the small hallway, shutting the door behind her as she went to talk to Adriana's family. Adriana. His bride finally had a name. She was a person with feelings and worries and concerns just like him. Would he do the same for his brothers? Cast himself at the mercy of a stranger in hopes of making a better life for them? Parker wasn't a fool. He knew there was a large imbalance of power here. Adriana could only hope Parker would be fair and kind to her and her family. Any other man could easily play the monster and win. Parker wasn't that type of guy. I'm sorry, Miss Matron spoke. They insisted one of the uncles accompany her. I don't think he knows much English, though. Parker gave a jerky nod. A moment later, Adriana and one of her uncles joined him in the hallway. They all stood around awkwardly. Are you certain you wish to marry me? managed Parker. He wasn't sure it was the right question to ask, but now it was done. She gave a small, quick nod, still not meeting his eyes. I could sponsor you, your mother, and your sisters into the country, he offered, wincing slightly. The selfish part of him wanted to just accept the marriage and keep his personal and professional life intact. The better part of him understood he couldn't just do that blindly that marriage would change things. You don't have to marry me if you don't want to, Adriana. My uncles would never allow it. Her accent wasn't as thick as the other man who had spoken before. Her voice was quiet and sweet. She glanced up at him, a touch of what could be fear in her eyes. If there is no marriage, they will take me home. She really didn't have an option then. Parker wondered if he said no to the marriage, what would happen to her and her family. He felt like it might be an impossible choice. 
Miss Matron says you must marry, began Adriana hesitantly. She says you must have a son. Or a daughter, he said absent-mindedly, even though Ramsley's had a habit of producing boys. Do your sisters understand English as well as you do? Yes, nodded Adriana. They will need to go to a good school, mused Parker, trying to focus on something outside of his bride and him. I will see if Livingston Academy has any openings. If they get in, they'll have a better chance at a good secondary school and a good college. College? Her tongue tripped over the word. Parker looked at her, ready to offer an explanation, when he realized her reaction wasn't because she didn't know the word, but was because she had not expected him to offer post-secondary education to her siblings. She was looking at him in absolute surprise. At least she was looking at him and not at the floor, he acknowledged, deciding it was some improvement. Yes, college. Do you think they would want to go? Yes, breathed Adriana, hope in her eyes. Very much so. He wondered how much education she had gotten. It didn't matter. If she wanted to continue learning, she could. Parker could easily do that for her. I know you expected probably someone prettier and younger blushed Adriana, looking at her clasped hands again. I promise I will be a good wife. Parker had no doubt the timid young woman in front of him would do everything she could to be a good wife. The question for the first time was, would he be a good husband to her? Then again, if he wasn't her husband, what would happen to her? Would the uncles just find another person to foist her off onto? The thought didn't sit well with him. He supposed he was partially responsible for her situation. Parker would figure out a way to make this marriage work. Now he was facing the person who would be his bride. Parker decided she needed someone who would protect her, plus put some of her wants and needs first. He could do that much, Parker vowed. He pulled the engagement ring out of his pocket and reached out for her left hand. Adriana? The uncle snaked out a hand grabbing Parker's by the wrist and uttering a sharp rebuke. He says you cannot touch me until the wedding, softly stated Adriana. Parker gave the man a leveling look. Her uncle finally let go of his wrist. Instead of reaching for Adriana's hand, he offered her the engagement ring instead. Will you marry me? Yes, she shyly took the ring, careful not to touch him before putting it on her finger. Her amber eyes lifted to his, and Adriana gave him a small smile. Parker, who had hoped his world wouldn't change, realized it just had. Everything was different. He wasn't just acquiring a wife. He was going to have to be part of this marriage. He hoped their union might just work out for the both of them. It was both a frightening and comforting thought. Chapter 4 Jasmine he said he loves me, ruefully remarked at Jasmine as she speared a piece of lettuce with her bamboo fork. The hospital she worked at had recently gone green, and plastic was out when it came to the cafeteria. He did? Priya looked at her cousin in surprise. What did you say in return? I couldn't, sighed Jasmine. The call ended. Ever since then, I have avoided talking to him. He calls, and I let it go to voicemail. Why? Priya cocked her head to the side. I have googled the man. He is handsome and rich. He thinks he's in love with you. It's not like you're young anymore. You sound like mother. Jasmine rolled her eyes. I don't know. What if he ruins our friendship with this love nonsense? What if I did fall for him, and then I have to return home? You know father's health isn't good. I could be asked to go back at any time now. Take him home with you, shrugged an unconcerned Priya. Jasmine looked at her cousin in exasperation. You know an American won't go over well as my husband. Who said you had to marry him? A cheeky Priya asked. Jasmine tossed a piece of lettuce at her cousin. Squeaky clean reputation, remember? It's the reason you're my footsteps everywhere I go. I could look the other way murmured Priya with a happy sigh, especially if he will introduce me to one of his cousins. They are very good-looking. 
I think America has corrupted you, smiled Jasmine. I was always corrupt, huffed Priya. I simply never showed it. That isn't exactly true, murmured Jasmine, remembering all the pranks the pair had been involved in while growing up. Munching on a carrot and looking up, Jasmine saw that her cousin had paled and was setting her drink down with a shaking hand. What is it? He is here, hissed Priya. Marshal Ramsley is here. No, breathed Jasmine in disbelief. You're joking. He has flowers, whispered Priya as she looked across the expanse of the hospital cafeteria. Pink calla lilies. My favorite, murmured Jasmine. Touched, Marshall had even remembered. He looks so handsome in a suit, mentioned Priya. The photo I saw had him in scrubs. It was some PR thing about how Ramsley HMC had a real doctor on the board to help guide decisions. This is why it wouldn't work, whispered Jasmine. He loves being on his hospital board. It makes him feel like he has a chance to guide policy. He wouldn't want to marry me, then have to give up his position. Ramsley's like to come first. He would have to be second in our relationship. He is coming this way. Janice at the front kiosk pointed you out. Priya straightened in her seat, wiping her face with a napkin. How do I look? How do you look? asked Jasmine in confusion. If you don't want him, shrugged Priya, there's no reason I cannot marry an American doctor. I think my parents would definitely approve. Jasmine raised an eyebrow. You're not serious. It's half the reason they sent me here to follow you around. Priya mimicked her mother's voice. Come back with a rich doctor. We didn't send you to expensive medical schools to get substandard grandbabies. Jasmine couldn't stop the bubble of nervous laughter. Her aunt did sound just like Priya had portrayed her. Jasmine? A distinctly male voice asked. A sexy voice that she had talked to nearly every day for the past three years. A voice she had shared nearly everything with. Nearly everything except the biggest secret she owned. Her breath caught in her throat. Jasmine slowly looked up to see what had to be the handsomest man she had ever met, standing before her in a perfect black suit, holding a bouquet of her favorite flowers. Black hair and a sensible cut, blue eyes, classic features, tall but not so tall as to be a problem. Marshall Ramsley was Hollywood handsome. Her bamboo fork fell from lifeless fingers. She was at a distinct disadvantage, sitting here in scrubs, no makeup, her hair tied back. Priya cleared her throat, jumping to her feet. Yes? Jasmine gave her an astonished look. Excuse me? Marshall tore his gaze away from Jasmine to Priya. I'm Jasmine. Priya straightened her slim frame, smiling brightly. No? Marshall gave her a critical look. I know Jasmine. I know her voice. We've been speaking over the phone for nearly three years now. I sound different over the phone, hastily explained Priya. Marshall shook his head. I heard Jasmine laugh when I came over to the table. I'm sorry, you're not her. Priya huffed in annoyance. Jasmine couldn't help but laugh again at Priya's expression. You will have to forgive my cousin. She enjoys pranks. It's nice to meet you, Priya remarked Marshall with a smile, recalling Jasmine's cousin's name from their numerous conversations. He was more handsome when he smiled, thought Jasmine. His eyes crinkled at the corner. She dragged in a breath and tried not to fall into lust just looking at him. Her traitorous heart skipped a beat. I will take those flowers and put them in water, sniffed Priya, plucking the bouquet out of Marshall's hand. She gave a wink to Jasmine. Good luck, cousin. You know what I would do. What would she do? A curious marshal asked as Priya walked away. Jasmine ignored his question and tried to get her thoughts into a coherent order. Good manners prevailed, and she found herself asking, Would you care to have a seat? Not just yet. Marshall pulled something from his pocket, going down on one knee before her. Marshall! 
Jasmine managed to say as her eyes were drawn to a delicate ring in his hand. She watched as he slid it onto her finger, then kissed the palm of her left hand. Jasmine closed her eyes at the sensation of his lips on her skin. Think about it, rasped Marshall, still holding her hand. You and me. She had thought of nothing else since he had suggested the idea over the phone. Jasmine opened her eyes to see him uncertainly watching her. I would like to spend the rest of our lives together. He swallowed thickly. I love you, Jasmine. Marry me. It wasn't so simple. What would her parents say? He wasn't exactly on their candidate list of who their only daughter should marry. It had been a miracle she had convinced her parents to let her learn and practice medicine here. It had only happened because she had given her word she would return and be the dutiful daughter when it was time. A groom from America? Impossible. Yet there was no one else she wanted to spend her life with, her traitorous heart replied. She had a duty to her family. She had a duty to Jasmine, whispered Marshall. He reached up to wipe away a tear from her cheek that she had not even realized had escaped. So lost in her thoughts she had been. She was going to have to refuse him. However, before she did, why not have one kiss? One taste of everything she was about to miss. Laying a hand on his shoulder, the other on his cheek, Jasmine leaned forward and kissed him. Marshall kissed her back, settling both hands on her ribs. He could probably feel her fluttering heart. Jasmine wanted to sink into him right there. His kiss was everything she had imagined it might be and more. She reluctantly pulled away. Is that a yes? he asked hopefully, searching her face. She meant to say no. She had to say no. Yes, came her breathy answer straight from her heart. She had fallen in love with him. Maybe she had been in love all along. Marshall smiled. Raising himself to his feet, he pulled her into his arms, sweeping away her good sense with another kiss. Oh, what had she done? Chapter 5 Kitty It's obvious you're not in love with the guy, said Haley with authority. What do you mean? An indignant Kitty frowned at her friend. It was late afternoon, and the store was slow at the moment, so Kitty, Haley, and Maya were stocking items. Kitty was lucky enough to work with some of her friends at Haley's shop, where various pottery items were made and painting classes were held. It's so true, Maya agreed. She straightened the display of pottery mugs behind the cashier's till. Haley and I have decided that you're not in love with Tristan so much as the idea of him and what he represents. You knew he was cheating on you, addressed Haley. You saw the signs but refused to break up with him because you didn't want to give up on the dream of being a stay-at-home mom and married to a guy of means. What is so wrong with wanting to be a stay-at-home mom? questioned Kitty. It's what I have always wanted. No offense, but I don't want to go back to school or have a career. I love kids. I love the idea of being a housewife, taking care of my family. The only way to do that is with a guy who's financially stable enough to afford a one-income household. Not with Tristan, though, added Maya. And I didn't know he was cheating, insisted Kitty stubbornly, even as her mind whispered her doubts back to her. The lipstick on his collar? Haley raised an eyebrow. His excuses as to why he was always working late? His wanting to check your cell phone to see if you were cheating, but not letting you check his? All red flags, tutted Maya. Kitty pouted a little as she rearranged a few teapots to make room for more stock. She had ignored the signs. Kitty acknowledged this to herself. She had made up excuses for him and hoped for the best while ignoring her intuition. Kitty had seen the credit card purchase for the ring on his bank statement by accident and had held out for the rock, thinking it was meant for her, and she could get Tristan to be faithful once they were married. Kitty let out a wistful sigh. Her head had been full of weddings and babies. I really thought he was going to propose to me this time. Maya rolled her eyes. Even if he did, it would end in disaster. Tristan is a selfish, conceited jerk. Hey, Kitty mildly said, 
heard her friend would call her former boyfriend such names. Not that Tristan wasn't those things. It just said something about Kitty's judgment in men. We tried to tell you, warned Haley. She grabbed a box, working on replenishing a rack of colorful clay flower earrings. You wouldn't hear two words against the guy. You know who you should date, started Maya. Kitty held up a hand to forestall her friend. I really don't want to hear it. I think I'm going to wait for a while. Let my heart and ego heal before jumping into another relationship. Haley stared at her friend in disbelief. That is the first mature thing I think you have said in a while. Thanks, Riley responded Kitty. I love you too. I think you should date Ben, undeterred Maya continued. He's exactly what you're looking for. What? A surprised Kitty shook her head. He and I are just friends. Exactly, smugly said Maya. Plus, he owns his own condo, not like Tristan who mooches from his parents. Ben has a steady job. He is a kind guy. He's great with kids. I think he would make a cool dad and a steady, reliable husband. I'm pretty sure he makes enough dough so you could be a stay-at-home mom. You would never have to worry about him cheating on you, not with the extra pounds. He has lost some weight, you know, Kitty defended Ben. I've been dragging him to the gym, and Ben is doing really good. I wish you would be nicer to him and not make any chubby jokes. He's just a little husky. Actually, the weight thing is a bonus, mused Haley. If you gained a few pounds, he wouldn't care or be in a position to criticize. You could eat more chocolate guilt-free. How did she even meet Ben anyways? wondered Maya, her head tilted to the side as she tried to remember. I dated a friend of his before I met Tristan, sighed Kitty. We all met at some bar. When the relationship dissolved, Ben and I were still friends. He might be boring, but he would give you what you want, said Haley. Stop it, admonished Kitty in a stern voice. I'm going to go stock up the plates. Kitty grabbed the appropriate box and left her friends to their own devices. Taking the packing tape off the box, she began plucking out packing paper, setting it aside. Inside were stacks of colorful plates waiting to be set out for customers. Her thoughts returned to what her friends had said. She could admit to herself Tristan was just a bad habit. It was true. Kitty was more in love with the dream he might represent than the reality. He had been playing with her heart on and off for years now. Kitty had been very young and impressionable when Tristan and she first met. Who was she kidding? She was still young and impressionable, Kitty thought derisively. One might think her impetuous heart would learn not to trust in his smooth words and promises, but Kitty was a repeat offender, letting him smooth-talk himself back into her life each time. She kept forgiving Tristan and hoping for the best. He had used her. Ben would never use her. If anything, their relationship was decidedly in her favor. Ben was always willing to help her out or take care of one of her problems. Ben really was her best guy friend. He never asked for anything in return. Kitty had never thought of him as dating material, probably because he had never made so much as a move in her direction. She couldn't think of a time when he had dated someone else. Her friends were right about some things. Ben would make a wonderful dad. Kitty had seen him with his nephews, and he was great with Nick and Oliver. He was reliable, steady, responsible. Ben would be a good husband. Kitty bit her lower lip, turning the thoughts around in her brain. It would be an idea worth pursuing, if only there were any sort of spark between her and Ben or if he had given any indication that he was interested in her, which Ben never had. Emptying her box, Kitty checked her watch. She realized it was the end of her shift. She had been getting fewer hours lately, which had been okay when Tristan was showering her with extra cash. Now she needed the hours. Haley, are there any extra shifts? inquired Kitty as she flattened the empty cardboard box. I can't do before Christmas, but I could do any shifts after. Surely someone wants extra holidays. Sorry, shrugged Haley. Everyone seems to be keeping their shifts. It's a tight economy. No kidding, sighed Kitty. Okay. 
Kitty signed out for the day. Grabbing her winter jacket, she took the bus back to her apartment, where she roomed with three other people. Once inside, she went straight for her closet. The wedding she had agreed to go to with Ben was coming up, and she wanted his opinion on what she would wear. Grabbing three dresses out of her closet, Kitty remembered to take her purse, which Ben had helped retrieve from the taxi service. He really was her hero more often than not. Kitty had a smile. Ben was her hero. It was a funny thought after Maya's suggestion. Maybe there was something to what Maya had said. Then again, there was no spark. Kitty couldn't be in a relationship without spark. Shrugging, she went through the apartment. Hey, are you going to pay rent? One of her roommates asked. I get my deposit from work tomorrow. Kitty reminded him. Once that comes in, I'll give you the money for the month. Your week overdue, he grumbled. It's coming. Kitty went out the door, locking it behind her. She really needed to find another job with more hours, or even a part-time gig to supplement her budget. It was another reason Tristan had always been so attractive. He had always been happy to spot her some cash. Tristan was gone, Kitty firmly reminded herself. He was getting married, and whoever his girl was, she could have him. The bus dropped her off near the entrance of Ben's condo. The doorman allowed her in, knowing she was a regular visitor. Ben had given her a pass key and put her in the facial recognition system, which was part of the security for his condo. Then, if he wasn't home for some reason, she would have access if she needed to come in. Kitty let herself in, chucking off her shoes and hanging up her coat. Hey, Ben. Ben came out of the bedroom, doing up the cufflinks on his suit. I think I might need a belt. I said you have lost some weight. Kitty critically looked at the suit. It looked good on him. Ben rarely dressed up, and he was rather handsome when he did. She came forward to straighten his tie. You're looking sharp. Last time I wore it, the jacket was tight, grimaced Ben with a self-depreciating look. I thought I should try it on to be sure while there was enough time to get a new one if necessary. The last time he had worn the suit, it had been for his brother Nate's funeral. Kitty had offered to go to the funeral with him for support, but he had turned her down. Ben had expected to spend much of the funeral helping to care for his two nephews who had just lost their father. When he came back, Kitty had cleaned out his fridge and told him in no uncertain terms he was going to start taking care of himself because she wasn't losing him. She had dragged him to the gym every day since and stocked his fridge with healthy alternatives. Friend that he was, Ben had let her without protest. She didn't even think he had cheated on the change of food. Realizing she had held his tie for too long, Kitty let go and backed away, clearing her throat. Quickly picking up her dresses, she held them up for inspection. Which one should I pack to wear? All of them, replied Ben. It's a three-day affair, so I'm sure you'll have the opportunity to wear each of them. Three days? blinked Kitty in surprise. Yeah, it was on the invitation. We arrive Friday for cocktails and mingling. Saturday is the wedding. Wedding lunch, photos, more mingling than supper, explained Ben. Sunday is the send-off brunch. It's a whole weekend thing. Those who want to stay Christmas Day Monday are invited as well. Otherwise, they can go home to their own Christmas thing. I guess it could be a four-day thing if we want. Wow, you guys really know how to do a wedding, murmured Kitty. The good news was she had the weekend booked off. She was free until Boxing Day, when it was all hands on deck at the store. Are you certain I don't have to pay for my room or anything? Yes, Ben assured her yet again. He was going to pay for her room. Not that Kitty needed to know that. The whole thing is paid for. Anything you want, just charge it to the room and it'll be taken care of. Don't worry about meals, gratuities, the souvenir shop, or anything else. Kitty grabbed the dresses and headed for the washroom. Don't change clothes just yet. Quickly, she shucked her outer clothes. Grabbing a dress at random, Kitty pulled the silky material over her head. Drat. It was the dress that she had a hard time doing up the zipper. She had forgotten to bring her dress hook to slot in the zipper to make it easier. Kitty debated a moment with changing the dress out for one of her other dresses. Then a wicked little thought came to her. Why not? She would test the waters a little to see where they went. 
Maybe she was crazy, Kitty thought to herself. There was no reason to ruin a perfectly good friendship over a what-if. Then again, nothing ventured, nothing gained. Holding up the bodice, Kitty exited the bathroom. That is a nice dress, complimented Ben. Thanks. Suddenly, Kitty felt a little nervous. She didn't know why. She had known Ben for years. Sweeping her hair over her shoulder, she presented her back to him. Would you mind? Uh, sure, spoke Ben. A moment later, she could feel his warm fingers on her back. He pulled the zipper up with a bit of a jerky motion. It got halfway, then reached the trouble spot. It's stuck, a disgruntled Ben said. Sometimes the zipper gets caught in the fabric, explained Kitty. If you just move it back down, it usually unhooks. I can program anything, but I'm stimmied by a zipper. Ben had a small chuckle. He worked the zipper down, then slowly back up, careful of the fabric. There, should I do up the hook at the top? No, I'm just going to end up taking it off in a few minutes. Kitty tried to damp down her disappointment. Usually, guys would make a move when presented with a bare back, even just running a hand down her skin. Not that Kitty was the sort of girl who would let the move go far with someone she wasn't in a relationship with. She had that much going for her. Ben pulled her hair gently back. Now you're perfect like always. She felt a slight shiver. Kitty turned around to find Ben standing just a little too close. She cast around for something to say. Would you like to dance? Dance, he echoed. A practice dance, Kitty suggested. We haven't danced in a while. Maybe we should again. Um, okay, ventured Ben. Should we have some music? Sure, agreed Kitty. When Ben brought out his phone, she plucked it out of his hand. You have awful taste in music. What? I don't, protested Ben. You listen to all that pop junk. Pop is fun smiled Kitty as she blasted a beat from his phone. Pop won't be at the wedding, advised and amused Ben as he took the phone back. There'll be a small orchestra playing mostly classical. No DJ? How do you have a wedding without a DJ? scoffed Kitty. Please tell me the bar is open. It is. Ben set the tune to a common wedding theme before setting the phone down. He offered her a hand. May I have this dance? You may. Kitty smiled and took his hand. She let Ben lead her through the motions of the dance. He really was good on his feet and easy to follow. After a few songs, she tipped her head back to look at him. Does the orchestra play any faster songs? Not really, shrugged Ben. Truth be told, he rarely paid attention to what the orchestra played. He didn't dance much at weddings. Too bad, murmured Kitty, snuggling closer and leaning her head on his chest. Ben immediately slowed the pace to a near crawl, just holding her. Kitty stayed in his arms, listening to his heartbeat. Nope, she decided a little sadly. There was no spark. Chapter 6 Adriana He was far handsomer than she had expected. Truth be told, Adriana had thought her intended would be some old, balding man with a belly. She had been passed up so often in favor of someone prettier and lately younger. Adriana had not had very good expectations for the groom now promised to her. Instead, she had found a very handsome man who was in his prime and wanted to marry her. It was the stuff of fairy tales. There had to be something wrong with him, she knew. A man like Parker should be easily able to find a bride, not have to order one from overseas like her. He didn't appear to have a temper. He seemed kind. He had offered for her sisters to continue their schooling and to house her mother. It was too good to be true. There had to be some flaw. Something was very wrong for him to agree to this bargain. It didn't matter what the flaw was, decided Adriana. She had agreed to marry him. Money had passed hands. Her uncles were pleased by the bargain. Adriana was more pleased by it. She would have her mother and her sisters close. It appeared her husband-to-be was a good man. At least she hoped so. She was tying her entire future to him. He wanted a child. Adriana was happy to give him children. It was expected in her role in life. 
she was determined he would find no complaint in her. Stand tall, gently admonished her mother through a mouthful of pins. Adriana straightened her posture, looking at the three-way mirror which had been set up in the hotel room. Her mother was making alterations to the wedding dress her uncles had purchased. It was too large and needed to be taken in. The material is difficult, tutted mother. It wasn't something Adriana would have chosen for herself. It was white, frothy in the skirt, with fake-looking stones sewn onto the bodice. It came with a very short jacket she would be expected to wear for modesty. The bright white material made Adriana look pale and washed out. It was rather ugly. The uncles had refused to purchase a sewing machine. It meant Adriana and her mother would have to put in hours of work stitching by hand. Adriana wasn't looking forward to it. Do you think it might be changed? Just a little? Could we at least take off the shiny stones? The stones are glued on, sighed mother. They're not coming off. Oh. Adriana fingered one of the offending fake plastic stones. Her mother was right. To take them off would leave her with a gluey bodice which would probably look worse. Maybe if they were to cover the offending stones somehow? No. That would mean asking the uncles to get material. They would probably come back with something which didn't match. Adriana's shoulders slumped. I had hoped to look nice for him. You are a pretty girl, her mother admonished as she stuck the last pin in the fabric. You will look nice for him. Adriana had a doubtful look in the mirror. If she was so pretty, as her mother told her, why had it taken this long to find a husband? Carefully, they took the dress off. Adriana dressed while her mother started sewing. She would help her mother make the alterations. They had little time before the wedding to get them done. The uncles were away, exploring the city. Her sisters were in the adjoining room, watching television. There was a knock at the door. It was likely the hotel staff bringing the lunch they had ordered. Adriana went and opened the door, grateful for the reprieve from sewing. Parker stood there. He gave an uncertain smile. Hi. Hello? Responded Adriana, drinking in the sight of him before timidly dropping her gaze. He truly was the most handsome man she had ever laid eyes on, with his dark hair and clear blue eyes. I was wondering if I might be permitted to take you on a walk, inquired Parker. There's a nice little garden here. My uncles are not here, mentioned Adriana. She looked back at her mother and her two sisters, who were eavesdropping. Could your sisters be chaperones, he ventured. Your mother can come as well. In fact, my mother is hoping to meet you and your family. She's come by the hotel today. If you would like, we could have tea with her. She should meet his mother. Adriana knew it was important. They were going to become family. He wishes for all of us to go meet his mother. She's here at the hotel. Mother hesitated, then nodded. I would like to meet his mother. If we all go, it should be acceptable. Adriana turned back to awaiting Parker. We can meet with your mother. Good, nodded Parker. Mother ushered Adriana's sisters to the door. Soon all of them were in the hallway. This is for you. An uncharacteristically awkward Parker handed Adriana a flower as he led them along the corridor. Adriana took the pink carnation, careful not to brush her fingers with him. Thank you. Parker cleared his throat. Are you enjoying being here? Have you been able to do any sightseeing? No, admitted Adriana. She gently touched a petal of the carnation. It was the first time anyone had given her a flower. We are a little busy. The dress needs to be altered. The wedding dress? he asked. Yes, there is much sewing to be done, stated Adriana. Perhaps he could buy a sewing machine, piped up Christina in English. Then the sewing would be done faster. Christina! protested Adriana, flushing with embarrassment at her sister's remark. "'You're doing the altering?' questioned Parker in surprise. "'By hand?' Adriana nodded. "'You should be enjoying your stay here, not working,' frowned Parker, 
I can hire someone to come in and do the alterations for you. I don't know. Adriana looked to her mother. I will have to ask. It won't help, muttered Christina. The dress is ugly. You should not be speaking, admonished mother. She didn't speak English, so Parker likely wouldn't understand what was said, but anyone could understand the tone of her words. It's true, Christina protested indignantly in her native tongue. It's an ugly wedding dress. That isn't for you to say, rebuked mother. Adriana was mortified. She looked resolutely at the flower, her face feeling like it was on fire. What must Parker think of them? Do you like your dress? A tentative Parker asked her. She searched for something nice to say about the dress, but came up empty. It's just a dress. It's only worn one day. You should have a dress you like, commented a frowning Parker. Fortunately, Adriana was saved from having to respond. They had arrived at the dining area. It was deserted except for a table which was set for tea with a lone occupant. A middle-aged woman rose from a chair, smiling a welcome. It's so good to meet you. I'm Dorothy, but please call me Dottie. This is Adriana, Parker supplied when all Adriana could do was offer a shy smile. Adriana's mother, her sister, Karina, and her sister. I'm sorry, I don't believe anyone told me her name. Her name is Iona, spoke Christina, before her mother shushed her. Adriana's mother and sisters will be immigrating as well, explained Parker. I'm helping to sponsor them. How lovely, murmured Dottie as she eyed the small group. Shall we all have a seat? Parker pulled out Adriana's chair for her. Adriana sat, carefully setting the carnation on the table. She didn't want to damage it. What a pretty carnation, ventured Dottie. Thank you, managed Adriana. She glanced at the matronly woman beside her. Parker's mother seemed very nice. Adriana supposed she should ask a question in return, but her mind had turned blank. There was a bit of an awkward lull in the conversation before Parker filled it. I was thinking of checking with Livingston Academy to see if they might have openings for the girls. Livingston is a good school, approved Dottie. Picking up the teapot, she began to pour the tea. What sort of education do you have, Adriana? Did you study something in college? Adriana and Christina shared a slightly panicked look. Adriana had been taken out of school by her uncles in her mid-teens. They had not wanted her to get any ideas or become involved with a boy who wasn't approved by them. She knew many girls did go on to college, but not in her culture. Her people stewed education for girls, claiming it was a waste of time since they were going to be nothing but housewives. I haven't college. Adriana winced at her own grammar. In her embarrassment, she had neglected to properly speak her answer. Oh, uttered Dottie. To cover her surprise, Dottie asked, Milk or sugar, dear? Adriana felt too ashamed to reply. She took the tea as it was, even though she would have preferred the luxury of a little sugar. I know we talked about Christina and Iona going to school, began an uncertain Parker. If you wish to pursue any further education, you're more than welcome to. Can we have books? Adriana likes books, spoke Christina as she took a biscuit from the plate of goodies. She reads a lot. Anything she could squirrel away to read. It was how she had learned her English so well. Adriana glanced at her soon-to-be mother-in-law, who looked a little shocked at the idea they would be asking for books. Perhaps books were expensive here, and Christina should not have asked. You can have all the books you want, promised Parker. Adriana should also have the dress she wants. Adriana looked up to see him watching her. He seemed to make up his mind about something. Parker turned to look at his mother. Mom, would you mind going dress shopping with Adriana and her family? Minus the many uncles she has. We have a dress, weakly protested Adriana. Does it have any special significance that you would want to wear it? Continued Parker. You don't seem to like it. Christina does not like it. Do you like the dress, Iona? Iona looked shyly up at Parker, 
then shook her head before studiously studying her tea again. You should try one of these. They're very good with jam. Parker pointed to one of the scones with a gentle tone to Iona before taking one for himself. He turned his attention back to Adriana. If you don't like the dress, is there a reason I can't buy you a new one? My uncle's bought it, replied a conflicted Adriana. Would you like a different dress? questioned a concerned Dottie. I would be more than happy to go dress shopping with you. Your mother and sister should come as well. Adriana glanced at her mother. Mother would tell her to be grateful for the dress they had. Yet it was an ugly dress. She didn't think they could make it look any better. She would like a new dress, and if her soon-to-be husband was willing to give her one, should she not accept? She should do as her husband wanted. Adriana looked at Parker, who was patiently waiting for her answer. Okay, if you wish for me to have a new dress, I will have a new dress. Parker smiled. His smile spread a warmth through her, and she blushed before looking down at her tea. She was very fortunate, decided Adriana. She was going to do everything she could to make him happy. Chapter 7 Marshall You're more than welcome to crash here for a while, said Marshall as he set the pillow and blanket on the couch. You do realize Dad isn't going to kick you out of the condo until after the wedding, right? It was the terms of the deal. If that's your way of saying you'd rather I get a hotel, you can just come out with it, muttered Gabe. You might just be more comfortable in a bed than on my sofa, shrugged Marshall. I'm cool with you crashing here. Gabe sighed. The condo isn't the same without Brit. It's empty. Marshall hid a smile. Two weeks ago, Gabe had been complaining about Brittany invading his space. Now he was pining for her. What was the argument about? Why did she leave you? According to Tara, Britt thinks I'm marrying her for revenge against Dad somehow. Gabe sat down on the couch and put his head in his hands. None of this makes any sense. If Britt would just talk to me, I could straighten it out. Marshall had a seat beside his oldest brother. Gabe and Brittany had been at odds for years. Brittany had a huge crush on Gabe and had been very persistent until finally giving up. Gabe had avoided Brittany at all costs until James Ramsley's ultimatum. Marshall knew Gabe had feelings for Brittany, even if he didn't want to admit them. It had been Marshall who had finally pushed the pair together. Now it looked like Gabe had realized he did love Brittany after all. Right after Brittany left him. Then you need to figure out a way to talk to her, ventured Marshall. Tara won't tell me where Britt is, replied Gabe. I went to Britt's condo already. That's where I found the letter. What letter? A concerned Marshall asked. The one from her doctor, explained Gabe. He leaned back, slumping against the couch. Brittany has cancer. The doctor wants to start a treatment plan with surgery and chemo. She never told you, surmised Marshall. No, Gabe said shortly. He swallowed hard. Dad is dying of cancer. What if Britt does too? Hey, warned Marshall, there are many different kinds of cancer. Until you know how aggressive it is and what the average outcomes are, there is no point in worrying about it. The doctor has a treatment plan. As long as Brittany follows it, there should be a good chance of survival. A chance isn't good enough, muttered Gabe. She shut me out. I can't even help her through this. Marshall was silent for a moment, digesting Gabe's words. Do you have a plan to win her back? You're going to try to revive your relationship with Britt, right? Gabe, you can't just give up. Even if you don't make Dad's deadline, there's no reason the two of you can't be happy together. I'm not giving up, groused Gabe. I bought her house. The one you were worried might have termites? Questioned Marshall. Privately, he wondered if Gabe was going to recover if he lost both his job and Brittany. Gabe was very focused and controlled in his life. Without a purpose, he might spiral. She loves it, shrugged Gabe. The inspector said it was fine, so I bought it and I put it in her name. I'm doing the renovations to make it perfect for Britt, but if I can't get a landscaper, I don't know what I'm going to do about the backyard. It's horrible. There's a patch of dead grass which needs to be removed. Britt wants flowers and an ornamental tree. 
plus a playset for the kid we were supposed to have. What are you going to do with the house once you have it all renovated? Quietly asked Marshall. Give it to her, revealed Gabe on a sigh as he slouched back on the couch. Hope she'll reconsider leaving me and give me one more chance. How are you going to be financially if you lose out on your position with the company? Pressed Marshall. Gabe lifted a shoulder and a shrug. I will lose the condo and my income. I have some savings and investments I can pull on until I can find another job. Maybe Parker will hire me. Right now, it doesn't really matter to me. His brother had fallen deep if he wasn't even worried about his job, reflected Marshall. He checked his watch. You can stay as long as you would like. The couch is entirely yours. Thanks, nodded Gabe. I appreciate it. I need to make a call. Marshall gave Gabe an apologetic look. Jasmine's expecting me to video chat. She's going to introduce me to her parents tonight. Good luck, responded a lackluster Gabe. Thanks. Suddenly, Marshall felt nervous. He supposed because he didn't know what would happen if Jasmine's parents didn't like him. He had met a number of his girlfriend's parents before, but never had it been so important. He had never proposed marriage before, or asked for anyone's blessing. Not that he was nervous about the marriage. If anything, Marshall felt completely confident about being married to Jasmine. She was perfect for him. They knew everything about each other and were compatible in every way, especially after he had met and kissed her. Jasmine was exactly who he wanted. Marshall knew his mother, Dottie, would love Jasmine. As for his dad, James would be satisfied Marshall was fulfilling his obligations, even if the ultimatum wasn't why he had chosen to propose. It just made perfect sense. Grabbing his laptop, Marshall went to his bedroom. He plugged in the device and sat in the wing chair by the window as he logged in. After his proposal at the hospital, Jasmine had given him the grand tour. He had met people they had talked about, putting faces to the names they often discussed. Jasmine had surgery in the afternoon, so he had gone up to the gallery and watched. She was a magician with a scalpel and needle. Marshall was in awe of her skills. He could easily admit she was a better surgeon than he was. They had gone to dinner before jet lag had started to wipe him out. The time difference meant he was well past his normal bedtime routine. Jasmine had thought it funny and asked if he was bored with her already. Marshall had replied he would never be bored with her. However, citing fatigue, he had called it a night. The next day, Jasmine had seen him off early at the airport, promising to call him during her lunch hour. They had continued their routine of speaking every day, only now they were engaged. They had also shifted to video calling each other for the first time in their relationship. Marshall connected to the call, noting Jasmine was already online. He couldn't stop the smile from his face. That was work. Stressful, admitted Jasmine with a tired smile. I kept worrying about tonight. There's nothing to worry about, assured Marshall, even as he tamped down his own nervousness. We love each other. Your parents will see that and give us their blessing. Then you can meet my parents and we can discuss a timeline of when we would like to tie the knot, where we would like to live, and the future in general. It's a little more complicated than that, revealed Jasmine. She took a deep breath. There's something you need to know about me. Whatever it is, I'm okay with it. Marshall didn't like the serious expression Jasmine wore. She had a nervous laugh. You might regret saying such in just a moment. I will never regret anything about you, softly stated Marshall. I've been thinking. I could move to be with you. You love your career there as a heart surgeon, and it's obvious you love your hospital. I only work part-time here as a surgeon. It would be less of a bother for me to restart my career in your area. You would do that for me? Jasmine's voice softened. Of course I would responded Marshall. It makes the best sense for both of us. I admit I will miss hassling my brothers on a daily basis, but I can call them and fly over every so often. Hold on to that thought, weakly replied Jasmine. My parents are about to join our call. I should have told you sooner about them, and now it's too late. I'm sorry. Told me what sooner? questioned Marshall with a frown as the screen split so that he could see Jasmine and a well-dressed middle-aged couple. 
Mother and father, I would like for you to meet Marshall Ramsley, introduced Jasmine. Marshall, these are my parents, the king and queen of my homeland. Marshall blinked. Whatever he might have expected, it wasn't this. He cleared his throat, manners which had been drilled into him from his mother coming to his aid. Pleased to meet you. He does not know how to greet royalty, I see, harumphed the king, folding his arms. I've never met royalty before, admitted Marshall. He added quickly, if I've given any offense, I apologize. We accept your apology, inserted the queen graciously. Marshall is a doctor. Jasmine fixed a smile on her face. He works for Ramsley HMC. An American, grimaced Jasmine's father. Why not find a nice boy from our country? Someone suitable. Your Majesty, I understand I might not be the sort of man you had in mind for your daughter, began Marshall, hoping to salvage the situation. However, I love her. I'm willing to do whatever I can to support her and make her happy. Are you ready to be second best at everything? grumbled the king. Jasmine is my only daughter. She's going to take over my crown some day. You are not royalty. You won't be king. You would be the queen's consort and husband. Your primary duty would be to assist and support her. Jasmine will be first in everything. What she says will be final. She won't be your wife. She will be your queen first and foremost. She already is, responded Marshall. He realized it was true. Marshall had been willing to move across the country for her. Why not even further? What about his career as a doctor? The uncertain thought flitted across his mind, and Marshall pushed it away. He and Jasmine would work it out. I have my doubts, the king announced. Father, Marshall is a good man, and I really do love him, responded Jasmine. I know he isn't exactly the type of person you would have preferred. However, I think we should give him a chance. We can have a long engagement and see how Marshall copes with becoming part of the royal family. Raj, murmured the queen, she loves him. I knew this would happen, grumbled the king dampeningly. I knew it when we sent her away to college. She would find an American boy. I just thought she would graduate and come back first so we could talk her out of it. There was an awkward pause. Father, Jasmine gently reminded him, I have graduated. I'm a heart surgeon. You know this. Of course I know it, blustered the king. You don't think I don't remember? I'm sorry, father, a chastened Jasmine replied. Raj, it's time for your morning briefings. Mildly, the queen told her husband, You should start them. I'll join you shortly. We'll talk about this later huffed Jasmine's father as he grabbed a cane, using it to stand before leaving. Marshall waited in awkward silence until a door could be heard shutting in the background. How long has he been having memory issues? The queen sighed deeply. Early onset Alzheimer's. He is rapidly declining. How long have you known? asked Marshall. A few years now, confessed the queen. Lately he has become more difficult to handle. He becomes frustrated when he cannot remember. It's time for me to come home, a quiet Jasmine remarked. The queen had a tired nod. I had hoped you would have a little more time to enjoy your career, but we can no longer wait. He is no longer able to carry out his duties. Jasmine cleared her throat and nodded, blinking back tears. There are therapies, medications which might offer some relief, offered Marshall. He has been to the best doctors, gently reprimanded the queen. My husband wouldn't have lasted this long without them. I'm sorry, apologized Marshall. I didn't mean to overstep. Jasmine's mother studied Marshall, measuring him before making up her mind. How soon can you marry my daughter? Excuse me? asked Marshall, surprised at the turn in the conversation. I want my Jasmine to have an American wedding with her friends and your family, decided the queen, followed by a traditional wedding. Then we can establish her on the throne when we return from the United States. I'm sorry, any honeymoon will have to wait. This seems a little soon, 
a confused Marshall stated, he had not been planning to marry Jasmine right away. He had thought they would have some time to sort out their lives first. One moment we were talking about an extended engagement, and now you would like us to get married right away. It would make it easier for the coronation, explained Jasmine's mother with a touch of impatience. It will cement in the minds of our people that Jasmine is a grown woman and capable of being our queen. Jasmine, Marshall noted his fiancée had been silent for some time. What do you want? We should be married before returning home. Mother is right. We need to send the right message to my people, Jasmine quietly noted. That is, if you still wish to marry me. Marshall was about to reply, but the queen quickly interjected. It won't be easy. As my husband stated, you will be second in this relationship. Also, we have never had an American in our royal family. You will need to learn and adapt to our customs and traditions. You'll need to give up your career and focus on your duties as consort. If you cannot do this, if you don't love Jasmine enough to do this, then you need to say so now. It's a lifetime commitment. Marshall wanted to have a laugh at the absurdity of his sudden situation. Never in his wildest dreams had Marshall thought this would happen. Their kids were going to rule a country. I love Jasmine with all my heart. That does not answer the question, noted the Queen. To never be a surgeon again. Marshall took a deep breath. The alternative was to never see Jasmine again. Or worse, see her on a magazine cover with some other guy as her consort. Jasmine spoke to her mother in her native tongue and received a wry reply. The first thing he was going to do was learn the language, decided Marshall. He wasn't about to be left out of the conversation. I will do it. Jasmine's mother gave them a regal nod. Then I give my blessing. Thank you, mother, quietly spoke Jasmine. Marshall echoed the sentiment. Thank you. I will leave the two of you to talk details, the queen told them. Jasmine, don't forget to call me later today for our regular tea. The queen left the call. Then it was just Marshall and an uncomfortable Jasmine. Surprise! A half-hearted Jasmine spoke the word. I'm sorry I didn't tell you sooner. It's a bit difficult to explain, and I never like how people treat me afterward. I was happy just being friends with you, and didn't want to complicate our relationship. No one in America knows except for my cousin Priya, and now you. Jasmine waited anxiously while Marshall thought about their situation. It doesn't change how I feel about you, a somber Marshall said. It changes everything about the future I thought we would have together. Marshall thought about how Gabe's future had drastically changed by learning Brittany had cancer. The future was never promised to any of them. A person could plan all they wanted, but it didn't mean that things would turn out the way they had hoped. Just because Marshall had been used to getting what he wanted all these years didn't mean life wouldn't change his path without his permission. Marshall gently prompted Jasmine. He looked at the screen and wished in this moment he could hold her and reassure both of them that they were going to be all right. I have a lot of questions. I will answer every question I can, she responded. Then instead of being my plus one for my brother's wedding, would you like to be my bride? asked Marshall. Yes, nodded Jasmine with a relieved smile. Good. Marshall smiled back. Now, what country are you from? It's a little known place, began Jasmine telling him about her home country and childhood as a royal princess. Chapter 8 The Weekend Ben Ben handed over the keys to the coupe to the valet service. Someone was already grabbing the bags out of the trunk and putting them on one of those trolley things the hotel had. They have very good service here, murmured Kitty as Ben opened the door for her. I hope it's not too pricey for you, Ben. We don't have to stay the whole weekend if it's a problem. Family discount. Ben shrugged. It wasn't entirely a lie. My brothers and sisters are in the family hotel business. It'll be fine. Like I said, don't worry about charging anything to the room. It's all taken care of. Kitty looked at him a little doubtfully, but let it slide. Okay. Ben led Kitty through the foyer, a hand at her back. It was the main hotel, 
one which was upgraded from business class to sheer opulence. His sister Addison had outdone herself on the decor, making it the envy of any fashion hotelier's magazine cover. Gold trim, cream wallpaper, and navy touches made the room feel luxurious. Oh, wow, breathed Kitty as she looked around the hotel. Unconsciously, she stepped closer to him, and Ben wondered if she might be intimidated by the ambience. She looked at him with concern. Are you sure? It looks so expensive. It was expensive. Ben fully expected it to be a ten grand minimum weekend per couple, adding in meals plus gratuities. He was also paying for child-minding services as needed for the family. However, he didn't do it often, and he could well afford it. It's fine. Ben! A joyous voice carried over the length of the foyer. Ben turned to see his cousin Max with his wife Paget and their two children. Good to see you. You too greeted Ben as he stretched out a hand. This is Kitty. Kitty, this is my cousin Max, his wife Paget, and their two boys, Morgan and Ryder. Pleased to meet you, murmured Kitty as the group exchanged handshakes. Has anyone else arrived yet? asked Ben curiously. Max nodded. Michael and Anne went to find their rooms a moment ago. Elle and Noah sent me a text saying they brought their boys to the pool. We were thinking of joining them once we finished getting registered. Did you hear that? They have a pool, a very pregnant Kelly told her group of kids as she and Dylan approached. I told you they would. That's awesome. Can we go in the pool now? asked an eager Avery. Wait until after we register and find your luggage. You do need your swimsuits, responded Dylan dryly. Ben, Max, Paget, good to see you. This is Kitty, introduced Ben. Nice to meet you. Kitty smiled and shook Kelly's proffered hand. How far along are you? Kelly had a laugh. Overdue. Are you sure you're okay to be here? Wondered a surprised Paget. I'm fine. Kelly waved away their concern. Dylan had a beleaguered smile. At the first sign of any issue, we are headed to the hospital. So don't be surprised if we bail at some point this weekend. The doctor said I could come, protested Kelly. After you badgered him into it, murmured Dylan. He wrapped an arm around her shoulders to soften the statement. Kelly huffed a little. I wanted to come. I had hoped to have a brand new baby to present to all of you today, but little Jackson isn't ready to make an appearance. Jackson? asked Max. Are you sure you don't want his name to start with an M? After all, I did help the two of you to get together. Stop it. Paget rolled her eyes. You're not a matchmaker. Kelly laughed. If that were the case, the name should start with T or B for my friends who kidnapped Dylan for me. Kidnapped Dylan? asked a surprised Kitty. They took me camping, explained Dylan. It was a little rocky at first. I was put in the trunk of a car. By the end of the weekend, we were all friends. Stockholm Syndrome, laughed Kelly. Noticing the front desk was free, Ben motioned to it for Max. Do you want to go first? Oh, no, grinned Max. I'm looking forward to getting to know Kitty better. Is she your girlfriend? We are friends, explained Ben patiently. Be nice, Max. Always, replied Max. When am I not nice? Max, warned Paget. don't hound the poor girl. Come on, Ben, let's get registered before someone else comes along. Are you going to be okay while I get the registration done? Ben asked Kitty. She will be fine. Kelly hooked an arm through Kitty's. We will have a nice chat while Dylan and Max catch up. Taking that to mean Kitty was in good hands, Ben went with Paget to the front desk. She seems nice, casually mentioned Paget to Ben. How long have the two of you been friends? Six or seven years, shrugged Ben. He decided to change the subject before any tricky questions came up. Are you and Max still deciding on a gaming system for the boys? Don't remind me, sighed Paget as she handed over a card to the front desk person. They have too much screen time as it is. We thought it might be a good way for them to connect with their cousins, yet I'm worried about them having access to the internet. There are too many weirdos out there. I could put in some extra firewalls so they can only connect with who you want them to, offered Ben. You can do that? questioned an interested Paget. Sure. I already did it for Nick and Oliver. It wouldn't be too hard to replicate the program in any gaming device you choose to buy. 
Ben handed over his information to another desk person, giving them a quick greeting. That would be great, responded Paget. It would give me a lot of peace of mind if I could make sure they're only interacting with their cousins and friends on the internet. Once you get a system, let me know and I can set it up, replied Ben as he handed over his credit card. There you are, Mrs. Ramsley. The front desk clerk smiled and handed Paget her invoice and room keys. This can't be right, frowned Paget as she scanned the paperwork. It says there's no balance on the invoice. Your stay is being charged to another guest. It was pre-approved with a down payment, she explained. All incidentals, your room, and any deposits for damages are being charged to the account. There's no charge to you for your stay or the other guests of the Ramsley party. Mr. Ramsley, your invoice, offered the second desk clerk, handing over an invoice and returning Ben's card. Was yours paid, too? A nosy Paget managed to snag the edge of Ben's invoice, turning it so she could see. She gasped at the numbers on the invoice. You're paying for this, Ben? Ben flushed a little. He gently tugged the receipt out of her hand, putting it and his credit card away in his wallet. Don't tell everyone. I had a good year, and I thought it might be nice to cover for everyone for the weekend. I know that with the investigation going on and the frozen accounts, some of the family would have had a hard time paying for an event like this. I didn't want anyone to feel like they couldn't come. It's my present to the family. When Ben had phoned Gabe to float the idea of paying for the accommodations past him, he had found out that Gabe wasn't getting married this weekend after all. Jake and Sterling would be taking Gabe's place. Ben had also called Sterling's family to ensure that they knew they were welcome to a free stay at the hotel this weekend to watch their daughter and Jake get married. It wasn't an imposition to him to cover them, to ensure Jake and Sterling had a happy day. Ben had even extended the invitation a little further, to cover the Colburns, as the Ramsleys had lately been inviting the brothers more and more into the family functions. That is so sweet. Paget reached up to give Ben a hug. Thank you. I know that Max and I really appreciate it. Ben gave her an awkward pat on the back. You're welcome. Just keep it quiet if you can. You know Max, Paget warned Ben as she released him. Once he knows something, everyone knows it. Yeah, sighed Ben. I suppose so. Ben, Paget, greeted Jake as he and Sterling approached. Good to see you again. They shook hands. Paget gave Sterling a hug. I'm so glad you both decided to come. We are too, smiled Sterling. Jake had a tight smile. Excuse me while I register us. Finances are a little tough lately, sighed Sterling. We weren't planning on coming, but there's been a small change in plans. I think you'll be surprised on the price, Paget smiled. Ben paid for all the guests. Paget mumbled Ben as he felt his face flush. What? Max would tell them anyways, innocently said Paget. Ben decided not to point out that she was the one telling everyone, not her husband. I won't pretend it's not a relief to have it covered. Thank you, Ben. A grateful Jake extended his hand again for a handshake. Ben shrugged. It's a gift to everyone. No thanks necessary. We appreciate it, offered Sterling. In fact, it can be your wedding gift to us. Your wedding gift? questioned Paget. Gabe and Brittany won't be getting married tomorrow, Jake informed them. Gabe has instead offered his place at the altar to us. It was very generous of him, added Sterling. Jake and I have been trying to tie the knot for a little over a month now, but something always seems to come up. Do you mean the Brittany who stalked Gabe for years? wondered a concerned Ben. He always complained about her. Gabe never said it was her he was supposed to be marrying. I guess they've reached an agreement of some sort, shrugged Jake. More like Gabe had reached an impasse with his father, muttered Paget. At Ben's confused look, she explained. Gabe's father insisted that each of his sons get married within a month, or he'd cut them off. No jobs, no condos, nothing. They have to provide Dottie with grandchildren within the year and remain married for a minimum of five years. It's rather draconian. However, Max told me that Parker said it was legal and they have to do it, or they're out of the family business. Wow, a surprise Ben managed. No wonder the short notice on the wedding. Does anyone know who Parker and Marshall are marrying? Overseas bride for Parker, confided Jake. 
Apparently, no one knows who Marshall is marrying, but he seems confident and happy about it. I suppose that's good, replied Paget. I must admit, I have my doubts whether this is a good idea or not. Forcing someone to get married so quickly it is bound to be regrets. I feel for Gabe, mentioned Jake. He was raised to take Uncle James's place. It's his life mission. I don't know what he's going to do. I'm going to be fine. A grim Gabe approached the desk. Thanks for the concern. The group had the grace to look a little embarrassed at the interruption. I just meant we hope things are going to be okay for you. It's a big change you're facing, offered Jake. As I said, I will be fine, repeated Gabe. It's good to see you all. Thank you for thinking with us to fill in, inserted Sterling. We really appreciate it. Gabe gave them a brief nod. You're welcome. An uncomfortable silence descended, and Ben was grateful when Kitty came up beside him. He made the introductions. Kitty hooked her arm through his. Kelly has invited me to meet the other ladies this evening after dinner. She seems very nice. She is, agreed Ben. He was pleased with Dylan's choice of second wife. It seemed the couple were getting on really well, and Dylan was a happier man for the experience. Shall we go up and see the rooms before dinner? Sounds like a plan, grinned Kitty. It was good to meet you all. Same, agreed Paget. They split off from the group. Ben led Kitty through the familiar hotel. He had spent countless hours here and at other Ramsley hotels as a child. Most of the chain were laid out the same and had similar features. This particular hotel was one of the more opulent ones, with an indoor courtyard, finest of divine dining with two restaurants, a pool, hot tubs not only on the pool but also on the roof of the building, and lush decor. As part of the wedding party, Ben had reserved a set of rooms with an adjoining living space between them. He had wanted to make it easy for Kitty to find him, should she need him. Ben had also made certain the living space had a small kitchenette, should they want to have coffee or any other amenities. He unlocked Kitty's door first, giving her the keycard. Wow, breathed Kitty when she saw her suite. It's beautiful. I don't think there's a nicer hotel in all the city. Lincoln Waters might disagree, mentioned Ben. He's the Ramsley Hotel's main competitor. Well, I think this is the nicest, reiterated Kitty as she explored. They put my clothes away. Sure enough, Kitty's dresses were hung in a closet. Her other items had been carefully put away. It comes with the service, replied Ben. I forgot to ask if you wanted the staff to, or if you wanted to put your own clothes away yourself. Some people find it a little creepy. I'm just surprised, shrugged an unconcerned Kitty. It wasn't like she had anything super expensive with her for the trip. Her jewelry case was left on the side table for her, and everything appeared to be there. She moved along to the bathroom. There is a soaker tub. Look at the shower. It's like a spa in here. Ben slowly followed her. It looked like any upscale bathroom to him. You'll have to tell my sister Addison if you like it. She decorates and upgrades the hotel designs. I've never seen a hotel bathroom with a bathtub and a separate glass shower, murmured Kitty. It's one of those rain shower type faucets. Ben, just how much is this costing? Are you sure I don't need to pay you something? I already told you it's all paid for, repeated Ben. He wasn't worried about Kitty paying him. She had yet to make an installment on the restaurant bill Tristan had left her with, and Ben wasn't expecting anything. He knew she lived paycheck to paycheck. Can we go see your room? asked Kitty. Sure. Ben led her to the connecting door, opening it into the living area. What is this? Kitty said in awe as she surveyed the couch set, television, and kitchenette area. A connecting room. It's like an apartment almost in here. Just a nice, comfortable space, shrugged Ben. My room is almost a mirror of yours. It's right here. He opened the adjoining door to show her his room. The difference was that he had access to a balcony and a king-size bed. Otherwise, the room looked much the same as Kitty's. Kitty trailed a hand over the dresser as she looked everything over. This is like some kind of fairy tale. I have never stayed someplace this nice. The penthouse suites are nicer yet, replied Ben. However, only the grooms and brides are getting those. A balcony? Kitty moved to the patio doors. The balcony overlooked a courtyard. They have a courtyard with plants and a fountain? 
Breakfast on the balcony is one of the selling points of the hotel during the more seasonal times of the year, noted Ben. So are the rest of the amenities. It's a really nice place. Is it going to be formal tonight for dinner? asked Kitty. I would guess so. I expect everyone will be there tonight, replied Ben. Are your parents going to be at the dinner? wondered Kitty, turning to look at him with interest. Mom will be there. Ben cleared his throat. He hesitated a moment, but decided to continue. Kitty, you might hear some talk over the weekend. My dad and uncles were involved in something I'm not proud of. As Ben struggled to find the right words to explain, Kitty came forward, laying a hand on his arm. It's okay, Ben. You don't have to tell me if you don't want to. I just don't want you to be surprised if it does come up in conversation, explained Ben on a sigh. He decided to tell it plainly. My dad was involved in laundering money for an illegal drug operation run by my Uncle David. He is currently in prison. All the family businesses were involved in laundering the money. The FBI is running an investigation. Most of my family have their business and personal accounts frozen pending the investigation. I don't believe any of my siblings or my cousins were involved. They seem just as surprised by everything that has been happening as I am. It's a bit of a mess right now with the family. Are you okay? asked a concerned Kitty. I wasn't involved, and the FBI isn't investigating me, revealed Ben. I only do a few side gigs with the hotel security and technology for the family. I don't actually work for Ramsley Hotels. Ben, softly corrected Kitty, laying a hand on his cheek. I asked if you were okay. It has to be tough with your dad in prison and all this going on. I guess so, shrugged Ben. I worry about my family and how this is going for them. Since I'm not a direct member of family hotels, I don't have all the information they have, so I don't really know how serious the situation is. Plus, I feel bad about Dad. If he really did this, then he needs to make restitution, whether that is in prison or a monetary fine or both. I just feel sorry for him. He's a weak man. He isn't malicious or criminally minded. I'm guessing Uncle Dave had talked him into it and Dad went along with it since it would be extra money. He probably only knows half of what was going on. Kitty hugged him. Maybe you can get a chance to talk to your brothers and sister this weekend to find out more about how they're dealing with the situation and ask if you can help in any way. Everyone's here now, so it's a good opportunity to discuss it. I suppose I should, sighed Ben as he hugged Kitty back. I was just hoping it would be a happy weekend for my family. It is. Kitty pulled back to look up at him. They're celebrating a wedding, and so are we. We should get dressed for dinner. You're right, decided Ben. Thanks, Kitty. Kitty gave him a smile and returned to her room, leaving the door open after her. Ben went to the built-in wardrobe to pull out his suit. It didn't take him very long to get ready for the evening. He took a last look at his reflection and decided it would do. He waited in the living room area for Kitty, flicking through the channels on the television. One thing he liked about Kitty was that she was never much longer than he was when getting ready for any sort of event. About fifteen minutes later, a poised and pretty Kitty entered the room. "'Will I do?' she asked with a grin. "'You look beautiful,' truthfully replied Ben. He shut off the television and offered his arm. "'Ready to meet the family?' "'Absolutely,' smiled Kitty, holding on to his arm. Ben took a steady breath and escorted her out of the room. For some reason, it felt like far more of a big deal than it was. They were just friends, he reminded himself. Chapter 9 Parker felt a little nervous, which was ridiculous. He had already introduced Adriana and her family to his mother Dottie. After he had returned Adriana, her mother, and her sisters to their room, Parker had gone back to have a chat with his mother. He knew Dottie would want to go over how the introduction had gone. Dottie had been surprisingly supportive. She said she liked Adriana, and as long as his future mother-in-law was housed nearby but separately with the sisters, Dottie thought it would work out. Parker had been pleasantly surprised. It had been a gamble to have an overseas bride. More so than he originally thought it might be. He was glad Adriana seemed nice and had made an effort with Dottie. It was true his bride-to-be was young and shy, but hopefully over time she might warm up to his family. Now he was about to introduce her to everyone. His brothers, the other soon-to-be brides, his aunts, and his cousins. 
there were a lot of people who would be making Adriana's acquaintance, and Parker wasn't sure how she was going to handle it. Perhaps she would be overwhelmed by all the attention. For some reason, it made Parker feel even more protective of her. It was an odd feeling. Normally, he was all for equal rights and dated strong women who knew exactly what they wanted and had the drive to get it. Now he was forced into a bit more of a traditional role. Parker found he didn't overly mind it. Iona and Christina wouldn't be attending the dinner. All the Ramsley children had been quarreled by some staff for their own dinner and playtime afterward. Kelly's half-brother Josh, Dylan's son Caden, and Caden's friend Cece were unofficially in charge with the staff to oversee the fun. Parker had managed to convince Adriana's mother and numerous uncles that Iona and Christina would be well supervised and have fun with their soon-to-be relatives. It had not been an easy discussion, but Parker had been rewarded with smiles from the two girls when they realized they could have fun with kids near to their own age and skip all the boring adult talk. Parker hoped everything would go okay. He really didn't want to get on his future mother-in-law's bad side. Not that he would understand a word she said. However, it would put Adriana in an uncomfortable position, which Parker would rather spare her. Now Parker was respectfully leading Adriana and her mother to the reserved area in the restaurant of the hotel. The uncles had elected to have a night on the town since they were temporarily relieved of their responsibility to the females in the family. Parker supposed Adriana's mother was chaperone enough. Some of the family had already arrived. Ben and a girl Parker didn't know. Parker didn't know why he was startled. He supposed because Ben had never brought a date along to family events before. His cousin had lost some weight as well. Good for him, thought Parker. Jake and Sterling were there, talking to Gabe. It was a pity Gabe and Brittany weren't tying the knot tomorrow. Parker thought the two of them might either be made for each other or would drive each other to madness. Either way, it would have been interesting to watch their lives unfold. Unfortunately, things had not gone well with the couple, and Gabe had given his spot at the altar to Jake and Sterling. As Parker understood it, Jake and Sterling had planned to get married, but their cousin Nate's death had happened. The funeral had taken priority. Then Sterling had some issues at home with her parents' business. Finally, they were going to be wed. Parker hoped the best for them. He pulled out chairs for Adriana and her mother. He gave his own mother, Dottie, a kiss on the cheek before taking his own seat. "'Have you seen Marshall?' questioned Dottie. "'He called me to say that he would be here, but might run a little late. He had a last-minute surgery.' "'You know how these things can go,' replied Parker. "'It could be hours, depending on how things turn out.' Dottie sighed. I haven't met his bride yet. I was hoping to before the wedding. Perhaps she'll be here before Marshall is, shrugged an unconcerned Parker. He gave a distracted nod to the waiter, who placed the pre-ordered dinner in front of him. I can text him to see if he's on his way. Thank you, Dottie smiled past him to Adriana. What a lovely dress, Adriana. You look very nice this evening. Adriana blushed. She gave a tentative smile to Dottie. Thank you. You look very nice as well. Parker quickly jotted a text to Marshall, asking if he was going to make it to dinner. Hey, no phones at the table, remonstrated Max in a happy tone. That's right. No phones or other distractions, agreed Everett, taking a sip of water. No phones? whispered Kitty to Ben. Ben nodded. Something about being present in the moment. It's a family rule when we get together, there's no technology at the table. You are the reason for that rule, noted Parker to Ben. Growing up, Ben was always ignoring everyone and tapping away at some device. You still have your phone out, yet mine is firmly off and put away, Ben mildly pointed out. What is so important? wondered a frowning Gabe. I was texting Marshall to see if he was going to make it to dinner, explained Parker. Mom asked me to. Sure, blame your phone use on Aunt Dottie, dryly remarked Noah. I did ask him, admitted Dottie. Hey, has anyone met Marshall's bride yet? questioned Max. Do we know anything about her? Parker found a lot of people suddenly interested in the conversation and looking to him. I know nothing other than Marshall has known her for a few years 
and thinks she's perfect for him. He seems happy, sighed Dottie. Marshall told me I would like her. Beyond that, he said she's a surprise. Do we even know her name? wondered Everett. Nope, answered Parker. He took a deep breath. Speaking of introductions, I should introduce everyone to Adriana. She's gracefully agreed to marry me tomorrow. There were murmurs of congratulations and greetings around the room, as Parker introduced each member of the family and how they were related to him. He ignored the empty seat beside his brother. It was unfortunate the hotel staff had not changed the seating plan to reflect Brittany's absence. The topic of Brittany was tactfully ignored, as people congratulated Sterling and Jake on their impending nuptials. Parker had a glance at Gabe to see how his brother was taking the whole situation. While Gabe seemed a little quiet, he was making the effort. Parker reflected he was going to have to corner Gabe later to find out what he could do for him, perhaps hiring him back at the hospital. With Gabe not inheriting his share of the family business, it was going to make things more difficult for running the hospital chain. Marshall might just have to step up to help out as well, now that James was officially retired. Their father, James, was going to prison. Sure, it was a minimum security hospital-type facility where everyone could visit him, but essentially it was prison. James wouldn't be able to leave of his own violation. Not that James was expected to live much longer with his health. Parker wasn't certain how to feel about the whole thing. There had always been a large measure of animosity between him and his father. When he was a kid, Parker had been confused and hurt by his father's attitude. Gabe was the favored child, spending time being groomed for the position of heir. Parker was barely tolerated, with an undercurrent of constant resentment, and Marshall ignored. When he was a teenager, Parker had decided there was no way to please the old man, and did whatever he wanted, within reason of not disappointing his mother. Dottie and his brothers had been the ones whom Parker had enjoyed a good relationship with. When he found out in school he had a knack for math, organization, and science, Parker had looked over what Gabe was doing and realized he would be good at it. Then it became a point of doing just as well as Gabe in the family business, even if Parker had not been the one trained for it by their dad. Then the truth hit him. It wasn't like anyone in the family outright told him. It was all the little things Parker had discovered along the way. The snubs from Mary, the extra attention from Oscar, the fact his father had been traveling about the time Parker should have been conceived. He liked to surf, as did Garrett and Nate. People often commented on how Nate and Parker looked so much alike. They should look alike, Parker had often commented. They were cousins. Gabe and Garrett looked alike, but no one really remarked upon that fact. However, it explained perfectly the animosity James harbored toward his middle son. Parker had struggled with the idea. Then he had asked Dottie, who had tearfully confirmed it. He wasn't James's son. In a moment of weak indiscretion, after imbibing a little too much alcohol, Dottie had a one-night stand with Oscar, his uncle. Oscar, his father. Parker had come to accept this truth. He had also come to accept the fact that no one in the family told the truth out loud. It was like they could all keep pretending, as long as no one said a word about it. It was interesting how the Ramsley family had started to include some of his Uncle David's illegitimate children into the family fold, with the Colburn brothers. Yet everyone ignored Parker's roots. Did it really matter? Parker supposed it didn't. Either way, he was in the family, a part of the family business, doing work he loved, and soon what was between him and James would be a thing of the past. It wasn't like he wanted things to be this way. If Parker could open some sort of constructive dialogue, some sort of healing conversation with the man who had raised him, Parker would. However, the one time he had tried, James had leveled him with a look of pure loathing. James had hated that Parker knew. While he could forgive Dottie, James would never forgive Parker. So, Parker had stopped trying. His phone chirped a text reply. Parker pulled out his phone and checked it. Running a little late, tell the staff to send the food to my room. Sorry to disappoint Mom. 
Putting away the phone, Parker turned to Dottie. Marshall can't make it for dinner, but promises to see you tonight. Dottie tutted. Did he say anything about his bride? Sorry, no, relayed Parker. I suppose I'll just have to have faith Marshall picks someone suitable for himself, sighed Dottie. Tell Marshall his aunts Mary, Rachel, Beverly, and I are going to have tea in my suite tonight. He can come and chat with us at some point. I will, right after dinner, promised Parker. He would also give Marshall a little piece of his mind for worrying their mother. Marshall should have set her mind at ease over his choice of bride already. Would it be okay? A soft voice beside him asked. Parker pulled his thoughts away from his errant brother and turned to Adriana. He had not been paying attention to the conversation on her side, a mistake on his part. He was supposed to be taking care of her and making sure she was at ease tonight. I'm sorry I didn't quite catch that. Would what be okay? Amber eyes looked at him before she shyly looked down again. Your cousin, El, invited my mother and I to be with the woman of the family after dinner. She says it's so we can get to know each other better. I wonder if this is okay with you. Parker marveled that this was probably the longest Adriana had spoken to him. Of course it's all right. I'm happy you would like to learn more about my family. Thank you, softly replied Adriana. It's very kind of her to ask. Parker nodded. Soon enough, the meal was wrapped up, and the ladies were leaving to deal with some sort of dress emergency, according to Elle. Parker gave Adrian an encouraging smile as she glanced at him before following the group of ladies. The aunts and Dottie excused themselves to have a quiet evening together. Dottie reminded him to tell Marshall where she was as she expected her son to visit her. Parker easily agreed and quickly sent out a text to his brother. It wasn't often Parker got the opportunity to hang out with all of his cousins and brothers anymore. The men decided to talk shop in a private room off the bar. Everyone wanted updates on the current FBI investigation into their businesses, and the state of everyone's finances since many of their businesses and personal accounts had been frozen from the investigation. Parker was curious if there was any new information. He also didn't know exactly what to say about James. James had been the one to turn his brothers in to the FBI. He had come forward to clear his conscience and broker a deal for himself since he wanted to protect the hospital chain he owned. James had started this whole mess. Not that anyone besides Gabe, Parker, Marshall, and Dottie knew this. Another family secret. Parker felt like the secrets were starting to pile up. Add Garrett taking some drug from the hospital that wasn't his to take. Well, it just seemed to get murkier and murkier in this family. Parker resolved to have a private word with his cousin this weekend. So far, Garrett had been avoiding his calls. Parker wasn't going to let this go without an answer. There was no reason Garrett would need to have access to any of the medications at Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation. Worst case scenario, Garrett had a substance abuse issue and had grabbed the wrong medication in error thinking it would give him a high or relief from pain. Perhaps that was what had happened. Years ago in college, Garrett, Nate, and Parker had been surfing some dangerous waves during spring break. Parker had decided to pack it in, knowing the ocean was too extreme that day. He had been waiting on the shore for Nate and Garrett, when Nate had returned alone. It had taken them precious minutes to find Garrett, then even longer to swim out to him using their boards. Garrett had been clinging to his, in serious pain. A wave had hit hard. He had lost his balance, and his board had hit his back. It had taken nearly all Parker's energy to get Garrett to the beach with the help of Nate. Calling for help, eventually an ambulance arrived, carting the injured Garrett to a third-rate hospital. The country they were visiting had good tourism, yet had poor infrastructure. Garrett had broken his back in multiple places, as Parker recalled. A skilled surgeon did what he could to stabilize him, and soon Parker had arranged for Garrett to be medically evacuated back home to one of the family hospitals where he would get top care. Garrett had been lucky. He could still walk. He didn't have full range of movement, but over 80%. He still suffered from constant back pain and flare-ups. It was one of the reasons he had not been a pallbearer for his brother Nate. 
it would simply be too much for him. For a man who had been very athletic, it would be challenging to now live constrained. Garrett might very well have a drug problem, reflected Parker. It wasn't like he and his cousin were close anymore. Things change over time, and chronic pain could be difficult to live with. Best case scenario, someone had asked Garrett to get the needed medication. It was plausible. Garrett looked a lot like Gabe. An attending or resident could have thought that he was Gabe and asked for the meds. Unusual, but not impossible. However, there was no reason for Garrett to know the code to the dispensary. Nor did Parker know why Garrett had been in the hospital that day. If security had not noticed the video footage and alerted Parker about it, they might not have known anything about the incident at all. Parker had immediately tightened security and changed the codes at all the hospitals. This wasn't going to happen again under his watch. Parker had a look at Garrett, deliberately sitting across the table from him. Garrett seemed his usual grumpy self. He didn't appear to have any signs of drug use. He wasn't underweight. He wasn't tired-looking. His hygiene was good. Parker frowned. He knew that many people managed to lead high-functioning lives, even as addicts. There weren't always signs to be seen. Garrett looked up from his phone. His eyes met Parker's steadily. Dismissing him, Garrett turned his attention to the conversation at hand. Parker supposed he ought to be paying better attention as well. Ramsley Pharma is tight, Noah was saying. Michael and Anne have been putting some of his savings from his inheritance from our grandfather into the company. Many of our shareholders are foregoing their portion of draws this year. There'll be no dividends. Stock values are down, which is no surprise. We have had a few offers to sell certain assets at a significant loss to our competitors. The lawyers have cautioned against this because they believed the profits from such sales would simply be frozen and not allowed to be used for cash flow purposes for the company anyways. How long can your company hold out? questioned Jake. Maybe three more months, shrugged Noah. We're still profitable. We just can't access our accounts. In three months, we have a number of supplier contracts coming due and can't continue without accessing more cash. Michael is keeping up payroll and the smaller expenses. Otherwise, our workers would be walking by now. I could put in something, offered Max. Noah shook his head. Drop in the bucket. You're not rich enough. Besides, if push comes to shove, Elle and the kids might be moving in with you or Michael. With only Elle's salary, we have let the nanny go and are barely paying the bills. It's a vicious cycle. Have the FBI given any indication when they're going to wrap this investigation up? When we can gain control of our assets again? wondered Jake. Sterling has been trying to find out information for us, but, but she hasn't been able to make much progress. Nothing definite, replied a grim Everett. Bree has been trying to talk to Agent Kepler about the investigation since she and Kepler have a history. However, he is currently keeping silent. We did have word that something might happen soon, though. A source said there might be new charges. New charges? inquired Ben with a frown. Yeah, no idea what they might be, though, revealed Everett. We should know soon enough if the source is right. They indicated it would come shortly after the holidays. Good, said Dylan quietly. Good? questioned a surprised Max. Why would that be good? Dylan sighed. I'm tired of living with this over our heads. If the FBI would just charge us, we could properly fight the charges assuming we can still afford lawyers. It beats living in limbo, waiting for the worst to come. Right now, I'm happy for the reprieve, commented Jake. At least Sterling and I have a little more time. Can they even do this? inquired Henry. Is it even legal to just freeze our assets, nearly put us out of business, and not charge anyone? The lawyers are fighting it, but it's the FBI, stated Jake. They have some clout. Plus, warrants and court orders were legally obtained, and they did charge our fathers. We all just happened to be collateral damage. How is Ramsley Insurance situated? asked Henry. Not good. Jake ran a hand through his hair. We are at a negative cash flow. Everett has managed to help prop us up for payroll and day-to-day -day expenses, 
but we need to access far more money to pay out claims. We are having an underwriting loss this year, and with the weather in the South acting up, there have been issues. Normally, we could easily pull from the reserves to cover them, but this isn't a normal situation. Since we haven't found anyone willing to join our now reputation-damaged company, to take over Jake's old position as he transitioned to take Dad's spot at head of the company, I will be continuing on temporarily to help, noted Everett. As much as I would like to resign and pursue some other things, I plan on staying until we can get through this. We appreciate it, Everett. A tired Dylan spoke. Especially if the worst happens, it will be good to have someone we trust to take over, muttered Jake. If we get arrested, or can't keep up with the bills, Kelly and the kids are going to need some help, mentioned Dylan. No one is getting arrested, inserted Max. Don't patronize, spoke Dylan a little sharply. There'll be large fines which we can manage if our accounts are returned to us. Plus, someone will be hung out to dry. It might be a minimum security prison for ten years or so. It's Noah, Jake, Gabe, Garrett, and myself who are most at risk. Are they investigating you, Henry? I haven't been notified of any investigation, admitted Henry. Then you're likely in the clear, noted Dylan. Or perhaps the FBI has no jurisdiction since you were in another country. Dylan, you don't need to worry about Kelly, said Everett. Since he was sitting beside his brother, Everett put a hand on Dylan's shoulder. I will help. Dylan had a weary laugh. You should know that Josh is staying with us now. His mother went back into rehab again, and his father's working out of state. Wow, muttered Noah. Yeah, nodded Dylan. It's been an adjustment. Don't worry about it, assured Everett. I'm happy to help out. How's the hotel chain? questioned Jake, trying to change the subject so Dylan would be distracted from his fears. Agent Kepler took a tour of our offices and confiscated a bunch of our financial files, mentioned Garrett. Fortunately, I always keep an extra copy of everything. The data shows extensive money being laundered through Ramsley Hotels, which is no surprise. As you know, my father was arrested trying to leave the country. Dad was a little lax in his management skills, leaving Nate and I to manage the company most of the time and there have been an unexplained income into the company and a consistent payout to a subsidiary company of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. I had already started an audit long before the FBI became involved, and have been setting aside funds to cover whatever the consequences might be, since I became suspicious as soon as I realized Uncle David was involved. My lawyers have approached the FBI, the mayor, and the DA's office with the offer to repay the illicit funds, negotiate an acceptable fine, and an assurance of testimony against Dad. With that offer, should it be accepted and a liquidation of some of our underperforming hotels, plus the income from the Asian chain, Ramsley Hotels should survive. We won't be making a profit anytime soon, but we are salvageable. Wow, breathed Noah. You're going to testify against Uncle Oscar. Garrett and I agreed that it was likely the only way to keep the North American side of the business operating. There are thousands of staff and their families who depend on us, dryly mentioned Henry. We don't like it. In fact, I would rather do anything else than testify, but Dad was involved. We cannot get away from that fact. He was aware it was happening, even if he wasn't actively involved in the drug running. I hope with our testimony he might get a lighter sentence and Garrett can clear his own name. Addison is essentially viewed as an employee of the chain since she isn't an active member of the board. Thankfully, we believe Addison and her assets are currently safe from the investigation. Testifying against your own father is pretty cold, mentioned Noah with a grimace. Would you testify against Dad? wondered Max. I mean, I don't like the idea, but if I had evidence against him and the authorities asked, I would testify. He did what they are accusing him of. I suppose I just feel like family loyalty is important, sighed Noah. I guess if I had to, I should. But I wouldn't want to. The FBI can convict Dad without me. What about you, Michael? Would you testify if you could against Uncle David? Asked Jake. It's a bit of a rhetorical question concerning what each of us might do. Our dad is pleading guilty, so Everett, Dylan, and I won't have to testify. Everyone turned their attention to Michael, who tried to say something, then gave an irritated shrug. 
He made a motion with his hand to Max. No idea what you mean, said Max as he shook his head. Michael had lost most of his ability to communicate through speech and written language after a tumor was removed from his brain during surgery shortly before he and Anne had married, leaving him with a condition called speech aphasia. The majority of the time Max or Noah could interpret what Michael meant, however occasionally even they were at a loss. Dad put Michael wrongfully in jail. For that alone, anyone who has any information to put Dad in prison, I'm all for it. Point taken, noted Noah begrudgingly. I revise my opinion and agree with Max. How is the hospital business going? asked Ben, trying to move the subject along before anyone had any hard feelings. Are there any issues with the accounting or the FBI? Parker and Gabe shared a look before Gabe responded. Before Dad resigned, he gave a full accounting to the FBI, repaid the full amount of money laundered through RHMC, and made a plea deal for himself. After New Year's, he will be admitted to a minimum medical prison facility. Considering he has cancer, Dad does not expect to ever leave the facility. We are waiting for the courts to determine how large of a fine our company is obligated to pay, once we know that we will be able to evaluate our position better. Is Agent Kepler investigating you at all? frowned Everett. If he is, Kepler has not come out and said anything, prevaricated Gabe. Dad gave them full access to all his private accounts as well, and did his best to make sure the FBI understood Parker, Marshall, and I had nothing to do with the money laundering. Dad also agreed to testify against David, Robert, and Oscar. Everyone digested that news for a moment. Michael gave Gabe and Parker a considering look. Parker wondered if Michael was contemplating the timing of the deal. Perhaps Michael suspected James Ramsley had approached the FBI earlier than Gabe was implying. Everyone else seemed to accept the story at face value, not knowing James had been the one who had set the FBI investigation into motion. The moment was interrupted by a phone ringing. "'Who has their phone on?' groaned Everett. "'Parker, we just discussed this at supper.' "'Not me!' defended Parker, slightly indignant that Everett automatically assumed it was him since Parker was the one who had texted at dinner. I'm the guilty one. Henry pulled the offending cell phone out of his pocket, glancing at the screen. I have to take this. Getting up, Henry answered the phone and left the room. Ben leaned forward. Who needs an influx of cash soon? Personal or professional, I'm offering. Are you sure? inquired Dylan. You shouldn't have to put your business at risk for us, Ben. My business will be fine, answered Ben. I already pushed some funds around, made everything a bit more liquid in anticipation of this weekend. I can cover the Ramsley family businesses while we get things sorted out. There's no reason for any of you to go personally bankrupt or to lose the companies. Employees, suppliers, and customers are counting on us. Once you see the numbers, you might think differently, warned Jake. It could also be a few years before we could even start repaying you back. I'm not worried about it. Ben dismissed Jake's concerns. Send me the relevant paperwork and I'll make sure we stay in business. Only if you're certain about this, quietly said Noah. I hate asking for help, but we need it. The only other way is if the FBI releases their stranglehold on us, and it doesn't seem like they have any intention of doing that anytime soon. I admit... It would be a relief to have some financial breathing room, stated Dylan. If you can provide it, I would be very grateful, Ben. Ben nodded. How about I buy a round? Now that sounds like a great idea, said a grinning marshal as he entered the room, one arm slung around Henry. Guess who I found in the hall? You guys forget Henry's back and didn't invite him? Very funny, mentioned Henry with a wry smile. Hey, it's about time you showed grumbled Parker, even though he was happy to see his brother had arrived. Are you going to be late to the altar as well? The group descended into good-natured ribbing. The serious talk shelled for the rest of the night as they discussed the upcoming weddings. Chapter 10 Cora Cora found herself in Elle's hotel room, surrounded by the other Ramsley women who were discussing relationships and the upcoming nuptials. While Cora liked being invited with the group, she found it a little awkward. Despite being the first married into the family, 
Cora didn't know the rest of the members beyond her husband Nate's immediate family very well. She had met Anne a few times when Anne was still Michael's secretary and had taken a liking to her. Plus, she had gone to the previous Ramsley weddings. Beyond that, Cora had not had much interaction with the ladies beside her sister-in-law, Addison. She supposed now was her chance to remedy the situation and to get to know all the women, including the newer ones. It was a large group, reflected Cora as she surveyed the busy room. Almost a dozen women were in groups discussing various topics. Drinks and snacks had made their way in from room service. They were waiting for Kelly to come out of the washroom in her dress. Apparently there was an issue with the fit, and Kelly had hoped to wear it to the wedding tomorrow. While she had a backup dress along, it wasn't what she preferred. Of course, the women had offered to help solve the issue if they could. Cora knew she wouldn't be providing much help. She had no experience with dress alterations. Dragging her attention back to the conversation at hand, Cora noted that the group were discussing her brother-in-law, Ben. "'Are you and Ben dating?' wondered Addison as she eyed the girl Ben had brought to the wedding. "'No,' smiled Kitty. "'We've been friends for six years or so. He's great, but we aren't dating.' "'He brought you to a family event,' suggested Elle as she munched on a pastry. "'Perhaps both of you are working towards being something more? I haven't heard he was dating anyone.' Have you noticed he was interested in someone? <laughs> Not at the moment, shrugged Kitty. Ben hasn't mentioned anyone in particular. Too bad, mused Addison. Ben is my favorite brother. So there's no chemistry between the two of you? Questioned Paget. I thought I saw something when the two of you were at dinner. A bit of a spark. Chemistry is important. It's hard to see yourself in a relationship with someone unless there are sparks, noted Kitty. However, not with Ben. Sparks can be dangerous, murmured Cora. Involuntarily, she looked at the medical brace on her wrist. Sometimes, sparks could burn. It might be better to be friends that grow slowly into love. You had a love match, noted Anne with a smile. I remember your wedding. It was beautiful. It was beautiful, echoed Cora. It had been a love match on her part. Cora had been dangerously in love, and so very inexperienced. Foolish as well. I loved Nate very much. Oh, I'm sorry. A sympathetic Anne laid a hand on Cora's arm. Perhaps you don't want to speak about it, with Nate being gone so recently? It's fine. Cora gave Anne an unfelt smile. Privately, she wondered what these ladies would think if they had only known what had really happened the day Nate died. An involuntary shiver ran through her. It was best not to remember, especially the visit from Agent Kepler this afternoon. His very presence had put a pit in her stomach. Somehow, Cora had felt the guilt hard over what had happened to Nate when she really shouldn't feel any guilt at all. Nate had died. It was an accident, a heart attack. End of story. Cora wasn't going to hash out the details, especially when she had changed a few of them to protect the reputation of the Ramsley family. She had her son's future to think about, and Cora didn't want anything to mar their lives. It had been such a surprise when Agent Kepler had knocked on her hotel door. Cora had only briefly heard Nate grumbling about how the FBI agent had been poking his nose into the family business. Nate had not been amused by Kepler's intrusion, or his father Oscar's way of handling the situation. Cora had tried to avoid the subject entirely, as all it did was upset Nate. When Nate was upset, it was better not to be nearby. Now Cora wished she had listened a little more to her husband's ramblings about the FBI agent. She might have been better prepared for the encounter. Cora blindly looked out at the scenic view of the city from the window as her thoughts turned inward. Cora turned her attention from slicking down Oliver's stubborn hair to the door as she heard the quick, authoritative rap. She wasn't expecting anything from room service 
and the boys were going to meet Elle's sons before heading down to their own activities. Both of you can play video games for another ten minutes, then I'll drop you off at Elle and Noah's room to meet with the other boys. Oliver promptly left for the adjoining room, but Nick lingered, curious about who might be at the door. Go, quietly insisted Cora. Nicholas rolled his eyes before stepping through the open doorway to the adjoining room. Cora noted her son almost closed the door, leaving it open just a crack. She had little doubt he was listening on the other side. Nick, her junior protector. She wished he didn't feel the need. Cora sighed as she undid the lock and clasp, opening the door to find herself faced with a stranger. Mrs. Nathaniel Ramsley? An insincere smile graced his face as his cold blue eyes gave her a quick once-over. Cora Ramsley? Yes, hesitantly replied Cora. Can I help you? Agent Bill Kepler, the man stated, flashing her an identification badge. Federal Bureau of Investigation, I would like to ask you a few questions about your husband's death. This really isn't the time, hedged Cora. She tried to sound unassuming and failed. We're due to be at a family function soon. Besides, I've already spoken to the police. Any information you need, they would have. I would much rather talk to you personally, he insisted. I promise not to take too much of your time, if I could come in. Cora was conscious of Nick still listening. She stepped into the hall, firmly shutting the door behind her. What would you like to know? My understanding is Nathaniel died of a heart attack while running. Agent Kepler pulled out a recording device, switching it on. You don't mind if I record this for my documents? I suppose, reluctantly agreed Cora, eyeing the small device. Pulling in a bracing breath, she forced herself to meet the flat, icy stare of the man in front of her. Yes, Nate was jogging. The hospital said his heart gave out on him. Yet he was a marathon runner. There was no indication of any heart issues on his past physicals, noted Kepler. Was Mr. Ramsley aware of these health deficiencies? Should he have been running? Nate had rescheduled his last physical, responded Cora. I'm certain if he'd gone, the doctor might have known about Nate's heart. As it was, we weren't aware there was any problems with my husband's health. Was he on any medications? questioned Kepler. No, he was very healthy, replied Cora. Nate had been a health junkie. He jogged, worked out at the gym, had supplements every morning, and ate only the best of the best of everything. Except for his heart, interjected the FBI agent. I suppose, agreed Cora. Uncomfortable, she checked her watch. I'm sorry, there isn't much time. Just a few more questions. Kepler's eyes regarded her braced wrist. What happened to your hand? I fell. Cora forced herself to keep her gaze steady with Kepler's shrewd eyes as she spoke the lie. When I found Nate, I fell and fractured my wrist. If you say so. He didn't look like he believed her. You were the one to find your husband? Yes, nodded Cora. I was going to run some errands. Groceries, the dry cleaner, stopped by the flower store to send a gift to a sick friend. The boys had a dentist appointment as well. I took the car. As I was driving, I found Nate laying in the middle of the road. Did he have a pulse? asked Kepler. No, whispered Cora. A shiver ran through her. She tried not to remember. Tried not to see Nate, pale, eyes glassy and lifeless. Drawing in a bracing breath, Cora gathered her thoughts. There was an FBI agent asking her questions. She couldn't afford to mess up. I called the paramedics, but there was nothing to be done by the time they arrived. Kepler studied her face, his brows drawing down. Did you try CPR? I'm afraid I was useless, shrugged Cora, blinking back tears. It was a broken wrist, and I just couldn't seem to remember what to do. I only took first aid in class in college, which was so long ago. I wish I had paid more attention. Who were the flowers for? he asked suddenly. 
Excuse me? Cora blinked, confused. The flowers for your sick friend? Who was the friend? Kepler's voice was sharp. Um, Cora hesitated, casting around her brain for a plausible answer. No one had ever asked her who the ill friend had been before. Olivia Fellsworth. She had been unwell. Her MS was flaring up. Thankfully, it was true, and Cora had sent flowers to her a few days after the funeral, so even if the FBI agent checked that small detail, he wouldn't find anything out of the ordinary. Mrs. Ramsley, the FBI has chosen to exhume the body of Nathaniel Ramsley, spoke Kepler in a brisk tone. What? Why? A stunned Cora asked. I have obtained a warrant for an autopsy, Agent Kepler informed her. There'll be a full toxicology report done. Is there anything I should know? Cora tried to think about any reason he might do this, why the FBI would want to look further into Nate's death, and came up empty. She shook her head with disbelief. I don't believe so. Do you know who killed your husband? demanded Kepler. Astonished, Cora could barely answer. I don't know what you mean. I believe his death was a murder. Kepler took a step forward, crowding Cora, invading her personal space. No. Cora flattened herself against the door, her good hand searching for the knob behind her. It wouldn't open. She had not inserted the room key. Nate had a heart attack. It was an accident, nothing more. The autopsy will tell us otherwise. A harsh Kepler told her, who wanted Nate Ramsley dead. I think you should leave. Cora tried to gather her wits about her. He was standing far too close for her liking. You can talk to my lawyer. You mean Nate's lawyer? Kepler narrowed his eyes. One last question. Why hasn't the reading of the will happened? Excuse me? Cora blinked, trying to follow the conversation. Usually within a few weeks of the death, the will is formally read stated Kepler. Why hasn't this been done? I don't know. Suddenly, Cora wondered the same. It had been nearly a month since Nate's passing. Garrett is the executor. Perhaps you should ask him. I certainly will, nodded Kepler. He clicked a button on the recorder, shutting it off. I will also be talking to you later. Cora chose not to reply. With a satisfied look, Agent Kepler strode down the hall. Cora waited until he had rounded a corner before sagging against the door from relief that he was gone. What did he know which she didn't? Why did Kepler think Nate had been murdered? What would he do if he found out Cora had plenty of motive for wanting her husband gone? Cora became aware of a prolonged silence. The ladies were looking at her, expecting a response of some sort. Obviously, someone had commented or asked a question. A little embarrassed, she cleared her throat. My apologies. My thoughts were elsewhere. Did someone ask something of me? We were just commenting how Oliver and Nick seemed to be enjoying the weekend with their cousins. A concerned Paget tried to smooth over the moment. Yes, quickly agreed Cora with a feeling of relief. They certainly are. She really needed to pay better attention to the conversation, resolved Cora. She watched as the ladies took turns trying to fix Kelly's dress, which she had intended to wear to the wedding tomorrow. I bought it just a month ago, sighed Kelly, sliding a hand over her distended abdomen while trying to straighten the bodice of the dress with her other hand. It has these side panels that are supposed to expand. That way, I could wear it pre- or post-birth. Please tell me I haven't grown out of it already. It's a smart idea, observed Paget as she sank onto the bed to sit beside Anne. I wish I had bought dresses like that when I had Morgan and Ryder. It would be nice to be able to wear maternity clothes throughout the pregnancy rather than in stages, mentioned Elle. She gave a jerk on the fabric liner. Kelly, I really don't know what to say. There must be some trick to make this bigger. I can feel the double fabric folded in there. Please, let me have a look, asked a hesitant Adriana. She and her mother had been invited to the gathering of all the women in Elle's hotel room. They had been mostly quiet observers, 
as everyone greeted each other and struck up conversations. After a few attempts to get to know the shy Adriana, the topic had shifted from who Marshall's bride could be, then to Kelly's dress not fitting correctly. Adriana had watched as several of the women tugged on the very pregnant Kelly's dress without success. The panel wouldn't open, and it was too tight to zip up at the back. Finally, her mother had said she should try. At least, they both had sewing experience. Please do, invited Kelly warmly. Otherwise, I might need to go to the wedding in my nightgown. Adriana had an uncertain smile as she began to inspect the dress. It was easy to see that there was a panel on each side that was supposed to open and give a few extra needed inches for the expanding abdomen of expectant mothers. However, it didn't appear to be zipped, clipped, or snapped into place. Adriana frowned as her fingers explored. It was sewn. No wonder no one had been able to force it open. There weren't many stitches, but they were of good quality. Adriana asked her mother in their native tongue to grab the pair of sewing snips from their hotel room. Is something wrong? asked Kelly, looking in concern to Adriana. Nothing is wrong, I asked for... Adriana searched in her mind for the appropriate English word. Scissors? To cut the strings with. Is it sewn in? questioned Anne. That is inconvenient. What if you want to use the dress again and need the panel back to its original position? There can be snaps sewn in later, offered Adriana. It might be difficult, though, with the folds of the fabric. They didn't tell me that, frowned Kelly as she smoothed the fabric over her stomach with a wince. Are you having contractions? questioned Elle sharply. No, laughed Kelly. Just a twinge. You know how it is. Jackson is dropped and ready to start the party, but hasn't decided to arrive yet. Bentley was a week or so overdue, so I'm not worried. What did your doctor say? questioned Sterling. Proceed with the utmost caution, grinned Kelly. Mostly I'm supposed to rest whenever I can. Honestly, I don't feel like resting at all. I have an enormous amount of energy to get rid of. Lucky you said Anne a little enviously. Ever since I was pregnant with the triplets, I have zero energy. It will get better, assured Elle. Once they get past the terrible twos, you'll finally be able to get back to normal. I found it was preschool when I finally returned to some semblance of normal, a rueful Cora said. It was a delight to have part of my day back, no matter how much I love my boys. Are you all happy being moms? questioned a curious Addison. Oh, I never meant to say I don't love being a mom, quickly clarified Anne. My girls are wonderful, and Michael is such a help. I cannot imagine life without them. I love my kids, smiled Elle, and to think Noah thought we would have just two. Paget laughed. Max is trying to convince me to have one or two more. Are you going to? questioned Elle. I think Morgan and Ryder are enough trouble for us to manage, smiled Paget. While Max feeds on the chaos, we are good. Plus, I'm enjoying being back to full time on my podcast. I suppose having children does interfere with a career, noted a frowning Addison. Then again, I think it would be worth it. You don't have to worry about babies and marriage for a while, replied Cora. Are you even dating anyone? No, not at the moment. Addison gave an uncomfortable smile. I'm always busy with the hotels. It seems like I don't get much of a chance to meet anyone. Sometimes it happens when you least expect it, advised Elle. Wait for someone special. You're young yet. It will happen. Addison gave a nod and picked a piece of lint off her skirt. What about you, Adriana? wondered Paget. How do you like Parker? I understand you haven't known each other very long. Adriana paused in accepting the pair of sewing snips from her mother, who had just returned. Oh, I think very well of Parker. He's very nice to me. Cora noticed the delicate blush that happened when Adriana replied. It was obvious the young woman liked her groom. You must be very excited for tomorrow. Yes, a shy Adriana replied before concentrating on freeing the panels on Kelly's dress. Within moments, the fabric gave way, 
and Kelly was able to have the back zipped. Thank you, a happy Kelly gave Adriana a hug. You're a lifesaver. You're welcome, softly spoke Adriana. I'm glad to help. Cora sincerely hoped Parker would value his sweet bride. She was the type of girl who would either flourish under a man's attention or be diminished by it. Cora tried to ignore the feeling of dread in her stomach. Her own experience of marriage wasn't an indication of how Adriana and Parker's marriage would be. All she could do was hope for the best for the couple. Cora pulled her attention back to the conversation and tried to enjoy the evening. Chapter 11 The Morning of the Wedding Breakfast and beer, commented Everett dryly as he leaned back in one of the two armchairs the room had. Only the best before a wedding. Hey, we need to do something before we get summoned for the ceremony, noted Jake as he checked in the mirror to see if his bow tie was straight. I hate these things. At least I get a tie, Everett pulled at the fabric, loosening it a little. Still looking forward to the event? Absolutely, Jake grinned. Sterling and I are happy Gabe is giving us his spot. We were just about to go to a courthouse and get it done, considering every time we try to get married, something gets in the way. Better you than me, responded Everett. The Ramsley men had gathered together after breakfast in Noah's room to spend some time before they were required in the hotel's ballroom for the wedding ceremony. Noah had come up with the idea last night. Joking, the family could either calm any of the grooms' cold feet or help them flee, depending on the mood of the moment. Plus, it would give everyone something to do without getting in the way of the ladies. Getting married is great, expounded Max on one of his favorite subjects. Doesn't Bree make you think of marriage and kids? Slow down. Everett put up his hands in mock surrender. Some of us like to take our time rather than jumping into things so quickly. No offense, Dylan. None taken, Dylan easily replied. Besides, my impromptu wedding has worked out. Kelly and I are happy. Glad to hear that, grinned Max. You can't take credit for it. They met on their own, warned Marshall lightheartedly. He gave good advice, admitted Dylan. I guess Max gets a little credit. Ha! See? gloated Max as he handed out a couple of beers. Uh, guys? Noah walked out of the bathroom, holding up a box. This was on the counter. What is it? Ben asked as he straightened a couple of knickknacks on the top of the dresser before leaning against it. A pregnancy kit? Noah looked at the box. It's empty. Should we be saying congratulations? Max half-joked. Not to me. Noah tossed the empty box to Ben, who dropped it onto the bed like a hot potato. Elle and I are not having any more kids. Accidents happen, Max pointed out. Not with us, Noah said confidently. I had the snip a couple years back. Nothing to worry about now. Then whose is it? wondered Jake. And more importantly, was it positive or negative? Could be any one of the girls, replied Noah. They were all here last night talking about some sort of wedding crisis. I had to hide at the bar for a while until they finally left. Maybe it's Sterling's. Max grinned as he popped the cap off a beer, then handed the bottle to Jake. Maybe it's Patchett's, Jake responded dryly. I would be okay with that, easily said Max. I've been trying to convince Patchett to go for one or two more, but she isn't budging yet. Smart woman. Noah rolled his eyes, like the world needs more Mini Maxes running around. Maybe it will be a Mini Michael, teased Max. Michael sprawled on the bed, moved his arm from over his eyes to give Max a dirty look, holding up three fingers. Noah smirked. I think Anne would kill you. I remember Elle being extremely unhappy when she found out she was pregnant again, and the second set of twins were just about walking. She threw a vase at me. She threw a vase at you? A surprised Ben echoed as Everett laughed. Why do you think he got fixed? Jake noted wryly as he lounged in a chair. Most men don't have surgery on their precious parts by choice. Better not laugh, Everett, unless you're certain it's not Bree. It's not Bree, 
Everett said confidently. How do you know? Jake raised an eyebrow. Things happen. Not if I'm not getting any. Everett shrugged. We're not quite at that, that stage yet. No sex? Jake was a little surprised by his brother. Bree and I are negotiating, Everett responded glibly. We're still new and are not ready to find anything much. It seems appropriate that we wait. So it's not L or Bree, pondered Max. Ben frowned as a thought occurred to him. You don't know that anyone is pregnant. You haven't checked the stick. It could be negative. True. Max sat down his beer and headed for the washroom. You do know that some woman peed on that stick, right? Noah snickered from behind him. I'm not going to touch it, Max said in disgust as he came out of the washroom with the garbage bin. He grabbed a coffee stir stick and began sifting through the garbage. There it is. I just need to turn it around to see the results. Grab another coffee stick. Use them like chopsticks, Everett advised. He will bungle it. Noah ribbed Max. Marshall should do it. He's the surgeon. Barely. Marshall responded with just a touch of lament. I only do a couple of morning surgeries a week now. Dad has me buried in paperwork and management duties for years. Besides, I'm resigning. You're what? Questioned a surprised Henry. Resigning, repeated Marshall lightly. I have one more week of privileges at Mercy. Not that I plan on using them, as I'll be on a honeymoon. Why would you resign? Questioned Jake. You love your job. I do, agreed Marshall. However, we'll be living in her home country. You're moving? A stunned Noah stated. I thought the whole point of the marriages were to gain your inheritance. Does resigning and moving negate that? I'm not marrying her for my inheritance, clarified Marshall. We're getting married because we want to. So, since I'll no longer be a doctor, I think this is a job for Max, since he's already fishing around in the garbage for the test. Thanks muttered Max as he tried to get the stick to turn without getting it lost in the rest of the trash in the small garbage bin. Appreciate the support. Hey, it's not my girl. Marshall smiled happily as he loosened his tie. That is all I need to know. Just who is your girl? Ben asked curiously as everyone's head swiveled to watch Marshall, interested in what he might say next about his intended. He shrugged easily. You will all meet her at the wedding. She's a figment of his imagination, Parker drawled. He and Gabe weren't surprised by the news, as Marshall had already discussed it with them. While Parker had tried to talk Marshall out of the idea of giving up his position and inheritance, Marshall had not budged. How many hotels has your bride caught you renting? Marshall glibly shot back at Parker. She and all her cousins and cousins' cousins? Parker shuddered. I don't even want to think about it. I never realized I was marrying her entire family when I started this gig. Take my advice. No mail-order bride services. Those matchmakers have no clue about what they're doing. It's positive. Someone is having a baby, announced Max, holding the pregnancy test aloft with his coffee sticks. All the men paused, looking at each other and wondering exactly who was about to be a father. I bet we could figure out who it is, mused Max, tossing the tests and sticks into the trash can. No one knows who was in the room last night. We can narrow down the list of possibilities from there. Do you not listen? Noah leaned against a wall, folding his arms over his chest. I said I saw the room was full of ladies, and I retreated to the bar. Smart move, Parker toasted Noah with his beer. Thank you. Noah acknowledged with a nod. Surely you saw some of them, Max cajoled him. We can figure this out. Ben sighed. You know what Max is like when there's a mystery to solve. They are my favorite, grinned Max. Fine. Noah rolled his eyes. Paget, L, Kelly. Kelly doesn't really count, remarked Everett Riley. Everyone knows she is pregnant. When is she going to pop again? Technically, she's overdue, sighed Dylan as he sipped a beer. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to stop her from doing anything she wants to. She will be fine, 
Kelly's a nurse. She knows what she's doing, Max said without concern. Who is that girl who came with you, Ben? Her name is Kitty, answered Ben. Kitty? Noah sighed, trying to think. Sterling, Bree, Olga. Her name isn't Olga, piped up Parker, annoyed at the nickname the guys kept giving his wife to be. It's Adriana. Whatever, continued Noah, ticking them off his fingers. Addison might have been there. Not Addison, Ben inserted into the conversation. Why not? questioned Parker. She's just not, shrugged Ben. If she were seeing someone, she would let me know. Henry shook his head. Addison wouldn't tell any of us if she was involved with anyone. She would be worried we would all be interrogating the poor guy. Addison is married to the job, just as she should be, inserted aboard Garrett as he scrolled through emails on his phone, only half listening to the conversation. So, basically, all the girls were here, concluded Max. Oh, and Anne. Noah nodded with certainty and a touch of malice. Anne was here. I'm not sure who else might have been in the room. I think Michael is about to throw up. Marshall murmured with an eye on his cousin. Three kids nearly a year old will do that to you. Noah agreed readily as Michael ran a hand over his face then shook his head negative. You don't think Anne is pregnant? Michael shook his head again. Absolutely certain? Noah needled a little, amused to see his older brother out of sorts. Michael ignored him. What? You should be a dad again. Experience the joy of another little screamer. One seven-year-old and triplet toddlers really are not enough. You could have one more, Noah teased with glee. Or maybe another set of multiples. Michael abruptly got up, leaving the room. That is a worried man, Marshall mentioned wryly as he tipped a beer to his lips. Then Anne is our front runner, nodded Max. I'm still putting money on Paget said Jake. How much money? Max raised an eyebrow. Anyone in? A thousand on Jake's girlfriend. Garrett pulled out his wallet. A thousand? That is chump change you are about to lose, sucker, Jake told his cousin. What about Bethany Searson? asked Ben suddenly. What about her? Noah returned. Was she with them last night? She and Drew are engaged, shrugged Ben. Maybe it's her. Bethany is now on the list. Max grabbed a pen and a napkin, writing down names and bets. No, she isn't, interrupted Jake. She and Drew are waiting. How do you know that? asked Noah. Sterling and Bethany talk. Jake took a swig of his beer. I overhear things I really don't care to know. Maybe it's Ben's girlfriend, teased Marshall. Kitty isn't my girlfriend, muttered Ben looking a little green at the idea of a pregnant kitty. She is a friend. There's a difference. I'm putting money on Anne, Noah interjected. The way Michael left, he's concerned it might be her. Wait. Everett put up his hands as an idea came to him. Your bad boy half-brother has a girl. What's this, the shrink's name again? Holly, nodded Max. She should go on the list. Oh boy, muttered Ben to himself. It had better not be Kitty. This is going to be great, grinned Max. Place your bets, gentlemen. Be quick about it, noted Everett as a timer went off on his watch. All those not a groom are due in the ballroom within five minutes. Have fun. Dylan put his beer down. I'm going to help wrangle some of my kids and Kelly to the ballroom. I had better get going, too, sighed Noah. Elle will appreciate the help. Within moments, Max was putting a list of names and numbers in his inner suit pocket as the guys exited the room. Chapter 12 The Wedding Adriana Adriana gave Sterling a shy smile before looking at her own reflection in the mirror. She was wearing the dress which had been picked out yesterday. It was rose color with lace over the satin. While the bodice was opaque, the lace came to her collarbone with a scalloped edge and continued down her arms. It was beautiful. It made her skin look creamy rather than deathly pale, like her uncle's choice of dress had done. 
Her mother had quibbled a little over the lace showing her skin underneath. But a few words of encouragement from Parker's mother, Dottie, had solved that. Considering what some other brides were trying on dresses which showed nearly all their cleavage, it had not taken much to convince Adriana's mother this dress was far better. Adriana wasn't a vain person. How could she be when she was not chosen by any of the men in her community? However, in this dress, with her hair having been tortured during the night in curlers, she felt that she measured up at least a little. She looked pretty, she decided. Of course, Sterling looked beautiful like a bride should. She had a gauzy white gown which looked like it belonged on a Greek statue. Her blonde hair was swept up in an elaborate style bun, and her makeup was perfect. Adriana didn't wear makeup. It was considered vanity in her culture. So were high heeled shoes, bare skin, and a few other things that she had noticed seemed to be the norm here. Adriana felt like life might be very different here in America. Then again, perhaps she could overlook a few things. She wanted to fit in and have Parker be happy with her. You look beautiful reassured Sterling as she came to stand beside Adriana. She touched up her lip gloss. Adriana felt Sterling looked beautiful as a bride. It was true Adriana looked pretty, but Sterling surely outshone her. It made her feel a little like a girl playing dress-up again. Yet she was no longer a girl. She was a bride today. You're the one who looks beautiful. Thank you warmly replied Sterling. Thank you as well for sharing the day with me. I know it was supposed to be Brittany and Gabe getting married. I feel awful for them since they're having problems and hope that they can come to some sort of reconciliation soon. However, I'm so very grateful Jake and I can get married. We've been trying to tie the knot for over a month, but it seems like something is always getting in the way. Adriana wasn't certain what she was supposed to say in response to that. She didn't know who Gabe and Brittany were. Adriana supposed she might have met them at dinner last night. There had been so many people, she simply couldn't remember everyone. She looked around the room for inspiration and stumbled across the fact that there were three mirrors. Is there not supposed to be another bride? Is she late? Sterling had a surprised look. You're right. Marshall is getting married today as well. No one seems to know much about her. I wonder where she is. Adriana had a nervous glance at the clock on the wall. The ceremony will start soon. I do hope she makes it, frowned a concerned Sterling. Jake said Marshall was boasting about how wonderful she is and how he was looking forward to being married to her. There was a knock on the door. Sterling and Adriana exchanged a startled look before the door slowly opened. Is this the correct room? A breathless woman asked. She was wearing a white ball gown with a frothy tulle skirt and a sweetheart neckline. She brushed her dark hair out of her way and grinned happily. The Ramsley wedding. Yes, smiled Sterling in welcome. You must be Marshall's bride. I must say, we've all been quite curious about you. My name is Jasmine. She came forward, shaking hands with Sterling with one hand while her other hand held a pair of white sneakers. I was so worried I was going to be late. Sterling, I'm marrying Jake, Sterling gestured to Adriana. This is Parker's bride, Adriana. Nice to meet you, said Adriana as she carefully shook Jasmine's hand. This woman would be her brother-in-law's wife. They would be sisters in essence. Adriana hoped she would like Jasmine. You as well replied a smiling Jasmine. Oh, I am so excited. I finally get to meet all the people Marshall has been talking about for the past three years. Three years? A surprise Sterling echoed. Oh, yes, giggled Jasmine. He and I have been friends for nearly three years now. Well, we're glad we get to share the day with you, graciously said Sterling. Jasmine plopped down on a chaise, battling the tool of her gown out of the way. Thank goodness I have time to put on my shoes. I thought if I was too late, I might have to go down the aisle in bare feet. The traffic was a nightmare, 
and I admit I was running behind schedule with my last surgery before leaving the hospital. I thought my cousin Priya was going to go ballistic when we almost missed the flight at the airport. There was another knock on the door. An attendant stepped into the room. It's time, ladies. Adriana swallowed down the sudden butterflies in her stomach. She took a deep breath. This was what she wanted. Parker was more than she had hoped for. She could only hope to be worthy of him. Jasmine quickly double-knotted the laces on her second sneaker before standing with a grin. Let's get married! Sterling smiled and handed each of them their bouquets from the side table. Congratulations! Adriana tried to smile back and hoped she wasn't shaking too noticeably from nerves. Since Parker was the oldest of the three, she was supposed to go first down the aisle. Adriana fervently wished Jasmine or Sterling had been selected to go first. Somehow, it would have been easier to follow one of the other women. What if she were to stumble or do something wrong? Trying to breathe evenly, she followed the attendant who had the bride's paws outside a curtained area. Adriana could hear beautiful instrumental music coming from behind the curtain. There would be people there, guests, her family, the grooms, the pastor, all waiting for them to enter. Adriana blinked back black dots and wished she had eaten more for breakfast, even though she had been too nervous to eat more than a half a slice of toast with her tea. Suddenly, the curtain was drawn back enough for her to enter. People were staring at her. There was a sea of faces and formal wear. The flowers were nearly overpowering in their fragrances, or perhaps there were too many perfumes all at once. The chandeliers and sconces shone in opulence. The thick carpet sunk under her first tentative step. Adriana nearly panicked before she caught sight of Parker at the front of the aisle. He gave her a small nod, looking serious and handsome in his wedding finery. Drawing in a breath she had not realized she needed, Adria focused on him, stepping forward. One foot in front of the other, she was going towards her future. Then suddenly she was there standing in front of the man she was going to marry. Parker held out his hand and she took it, touching him for the first time. His hand was warm and slightly rough. She was surprised he had calluses. Adriana had only seen him in suits and had been told he was an important man in managing a hospital chain. It didn't seem like the type of job where hard labor was required. Adriana supposed there would be lots of little surprises in her future. Parker led her to their place at the front. He bent long enough to whisper in her ear, You look lovely. Adriana blushed, pleased by the compliment. She was also pleased he kept hold of her hand, even as the other brides took their places with their grooms. She drew courage from the contact. The preacher cleared his throat. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here to witness the vows between Parker and Adriana, Marshall and Jasmine, Jake and Sterling. Marriage is a commitment between two individuals to show love, compassion, respect, and perseverance through the good and the bad. Adriana let the words wash over her. Before she knew it, she and Parker were facing each other. A young boy, one of his cousin's sons, had given Parker a ring, which he was placing on her finger while repeating the words from the preacher, I, Parker, take thee, Adriana. Then it was her turn. With shaking fingers, Adriana took the proffered ring from the boy, holding it ready to slip onto Parker's left hand. She softly repeated, I, Adriana, take thee, Parker. Then the vows were said, and the rings were on. Adriana and Parker patiently watched the other couples take their turns through the ritual. Grooms, you may now kiss your brides, the pastor informed them. Suddenly feeling nervous, Adriana looked down at the floor. While she had expected a kiss, this was to be her first. Somehow it had a special significance. She was now a married woman. Her breath hitched as Parker gently cupped her face, then brushed his lips over hers. He straightened, drawing her arm through his. It was a good kiss, she decided. Everything she could expect in front of an audience of wedding guests. Modest, yet lovely. She would cherish it. 
all three couples signed the necessary marriage license documents. Then Parker led her down the aisle and to the appointed place where the couples were to greet their guests and accept congratulations. Adriana clasped tightly to Parker's arm. She wasn't certain of the rules, if she was supposed to participate in the handshakes. With her culture, it wouldn't even be a question. No woman would dare touch a man she wasn't directly related or married to. Yet smiles and nods seemed to suffice, as Parker shook hands, and everyone was in a pleased mood over the day's events. Adriana was rather happy as well. She could admit to herself she had worried Parker would cancel the wedding. She had even had an anxious dream last night he had deemed her too imperfect and sent her back home. Her heart had been skipping all morning, undecided between dread her dream might come true and joy it all seemed to be happening. Now she was a wife. She need not worry about going back home with her uncles and cousins. Her life was now here, beside Parker. They were to have some pictures taken with the photographer. Parker put a hand to her back as they followed Jake with Sterling and Marshall with Jasmine to where the photographer directed them. Yes, Adriana reflected, this was more than she had ever hoped for. Addison Addison had a quick look around the hall to be certain no one else was there. A cleaning lady was going in and out of a room, getting supplies from her cart. Addison pretended to look at her phone while she waited for the woman to go back inside the suite. It was risky to meet up like this when the entire hotel was crawling with her family. Addison knew she was asking for trouble, but she had been unable to go without for the entire weekend. At least she had insisted on waiting until after the wedding. She could disappear for perhaps an hour, while the photos were being taken and return, no one the wiser. Once the cleaning lady went inside one of the rooms, Addison quickly wrapped her knuckles on a door. Putting her phone away, she had another discreet look around to make sure no one would see her. The door opened. Not waiting for an answer, Addison stepped inside the suite, shutting the door behind her. The man in front of her leaned forward, locking it. He brushed a strand of hair out of her face, before cupping her face in both palms with a sigh. We cannot keep doing this. Agreed, whispered Addison. I mean it, Ads. He leaned his forehead against hers. The sneaking around, meeting up in hotels, I need it to stop. This isn't any sort of life for either of us. I know I agreed to this. I know I said I could handle it just to have any peace you were willing to give me, but I can't continue the way we are. I understand, murmured Addison, as she raised her hands to smooth out his linen shirt. It's not fair to either of us. His thumb trailed over her lower lip. I want to be able to take you to dinner. I want to be able to hold hands with you as we walk down the street together. I want to be able to kiss you in public. He will consider it a betrayal warned Addison as she began unbuttoning his shirt. I don't care, he muttered as he kissed her temple. You don't know him as I do. Fear crept into her voice. I will protect you, he vowed as he drew back a little, looking into her eyes. Reaching behind his neck, he undid the long gold chain, slipping off three rings. Taking her left hand, he slipped on the engagement and wedding ring. I made a promise the day we were married. I'm worried about you, she confessed. What he will do to you when he finds out? That I love you? That we're married? He questioned wryly as he put on his own ring. If we go public, there would be little he could do. At most he can sue us for breach of non-competition. He won't sue, she admonished softly. He prefers his revenge hands-on. He paused as a thought occurred to him. Assessing her, he asked carefully, Are you going to leave me? No, she bit her lip, confessing. I thought about it a few times. How if I did, I could protect you. I'm not asking you to protect me, he mildly admonished. I can't leave you, she smiled tremulously. I don't want to leave you. Good, he sighed in relief, leaning forward to kiss her. Please don't ever think about leaving me again. You are my world, Ads. 
She had a nervous laugh. Your world is about to expand. He nibbled along her jawline. How so? I'm pregnant, breathed Addison. He stilled. You, you're... We're going to have a baby, softly spoke Addison. I did the test last night. You're a dad. A dad. He spoke the words with wonder. Pulling back and searching her face, he smiled. That makes you a mom. She nodded happily. Then we definitely cannot continue doing this, he firmly told her. I'm not meeting our son or daughter in hotel rooms on the weekends. No, agreed Addison. I'm not asking you to. Just give me a little more time. I need to figure out how to do damage control. Soon, he warned. She nodded. Soon. With a swift and sure motion, he picked her up, heading for the bed as she gave a laugh of joy. FBI Agent Bill Kepler Freeze the frame, requested Agent Kepler of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The picture was grainy, the man wearing sunglasses and a baseball cap. It was going to be difficult, but not impossible, to get an ID on the guy. Kepler had the distinct feeling he had seen this man before. He handed the security guard a business card. Cut a copy of the picture and email it to this address. You said the man paid cash for the room? Yes, sir. The security guard nodded. I checked the records at the front desk. It was cash from Mr. Jones. No first name. I thought all the guests were required to put a credit card on file as a guarantee for any damages caused, observed Kepler. Prepaid visa with a $10,000 limit, explained the man. This probably isn't the first time he's gone anonymous at a hotel, whoever he is. What room is it again? questioned Kepler. Four hundred and thirty-eight, replied the security guard. Kepler made a quick note on his notepad. That's not her room. Correct, the guy agreed. She's obviously having an affair with some dude. Kepler's cold eyes turned to the man beside him. The Ramsleys own the hotel you're working at. Specifically, her family does. I would be very careful what you say about them. The security guard nervously cleared his throat. Yes, sir. I'm done here for now. Kepler straightened. If you see anything suspicious, call me. Agent Kepler didn't wait for a response. He headed out of the hotel's security office. Pulling his cell phone out, he called in to the bureau. Have you got the information for me? Really, Bill? You've barely given me time to look through the data you gave me, reprimanded the voice on the line. I need to know. Things have changed, as you can understand. A terse Kepler replied to the agent he had given the research job to. Have you told the widow yet? The researcher asked. Soon enough, bit off Kepler. He didn't like it when people involved themselves in his cases. Or worse, tried to tell him what to do. Any connection on the Pakui family? None. The family is clean. It looks like Mr. Parker Ramsley is sponsoring his new bride's immediate family into the country. The male relatives will be returning home today. They all have return tickets with the local airline, noted the researcher. Why are you researching them anyways? I thought James Ramsley was going to prison for his part in the scheme on the condition his kids were granted immunity. Always cover your bases, Kepler said before he ended the call. Making his way toward the elevator, Kepler spied Marshall and Parker Ramsley walking away from their brother Gabriel. Gabe had been the one not to get married today. He watched as Gabe leaned against a column, looking at the pretty courtyard. Room 438 could wait, decided Kepler. It might be more expedient to catch the lovers in the act, but he suspected the man wasn't going anywhere just yet. He had reserved the entire weekend, just like the rest of the Ramsleys. Ignoring the open elevator, Kepler went to stand beside Gabe. It's a beautiful view, Kepler opened the conversation with, not really meaning it, even if it's all covered in snow. Kepler could feel Gabe turn his gaze toward him, even as Kepler continued to look out the window. 
What do you want? What a way to greet me. Kepler turned icy blue eyes to Gabe. You skipped right over all the formalities. I'm fine, thank you. How are you? You don't strike me as the formalities type. Gabe narrowed his eyes. I think you'd much rather get to the point. True. Kepler had a small smile. He enjoyed getting under people's skins. Passports. Excuse me? asked Gabe, a little confused by the sudden change in direction of the conversation. Tomorrow morning, I want the groom's passports, stated Kepler, idly picking at a piece of non-existent lint from his sleeve. He didn't actually need Marshall or Parker's passports. However, with the latest development in the case, he wasn't going to let any opportunities go to waste. The courts were about to issue the warrants for the passports, and whatever else he decided to seize. All Kepler had to do was be patient, and set the bait for a little trap. You're kidding, frowned Gabe. They're about to go on their honeymoons. This is harassment. No. Kepler had a satisfied smile, his eyes still hard. It's a court order, one that will be issued early tomorrow morning. In fact, I would like everyone in the entire Ramsley family to have their passports ready and in hand so I can obtain them. This way, no one gets any ideas about fleeing the country before my investigation is concluded. I figure if you give them a heads up, it will be easier to collect them in the morning. If anyone has any ideas to make a break for it, they should think twice. The resort is being watched by some of the Bureau's finest. This is ridiculous. Gabe shook his head in disbelief. Why now? Why this weekend, at the wedding? You could have easily done this at any time, but you chose tomorrow morning. You're not going to intimidate us this way, Kepler. Says the man who recently resigned from his position. Shrugged Kepler unconcerned. Finding a little difficult in the hot seat of the family business lately? I resigned for personal reasons, scowled Gabe. Whatever you say. Kepler looked Gabe over, seeing far more than what Gabe would have liked. Just get the passports available tomorrow morning. I would hate to embarrass the family by having this leak out to the press if anyone decides not to cooperate. I am going to find out who your supervisor is and inform them you were harassing us, Gabe advised him. By all means, Mr. Ramsley. Kepler didn't even blink at the threat. Have a nice day. He walked away, entirely satisfied with the conversation. Kepler even whistled a jaunty little tune for effect. He was certain it would get under Gabriel Ramsley's skin. Chapter 13 Gabe Irritated after his conversation with Kepler, Gabe went to join the others at the late wedding luncheon. Finding his seat, Gabe listened to the conversation around him. This was his family. This was supposed to be one of the happiest moments in his life. Today was his wedding day. Yet it still wasn't. Brittany was missing from the chair at his side. An empty seat stood as a reminder of what he had lost. Not that he was giving up. He had plans to do whatever it took to win Brittany back. All sorts of grand gestures to convince her to take a second chance at love with him. He had spent the better part of the past few days soaking blisters and making lists. He could admit it, if only to himself. Gabe wanted Brittany to love him. He wanted her back in his life forever. Gabe had messed up. He had pushed her away for years when he could have been happy with Brittany. He had let ego and pride get in the way. Gabe had behaved stupidly. Now she had pushed him away and he wasn't certain he could undo the damage. It left him with a hollow feeling, one he wasn't used to and didn't like. He had not made his father's ultimatum. Gabe had failed to get married by the appointed hour today, and so his inheritance, his job, and his condo were gone. Somehow it paled in comparison to not having Brittany around, nagging him, feeding him, and just generally being there, making all those lists she was famous for. He missed her. Dragging his thoughts away from Britt, Gabe surveyed his family, who seemed to be having a good time. 
There was an empty chair beside Marshall as well, but his brother didn't seem to be worried at all. Marshall was relaxed, chatting and smiling with the group. "'Hey, Marshall, where is your bride?' asked Everett with some amusement. "'Is she hiding from you?' "'She's getting ready with her family,' Marshall responded patiently. "'If you would all enjoy your lunch, you will experience the second wedding with her traditions.' Two weddings?' asked Aunt Mary in surprise. "'The first wasn't enough?' "'We're honoring her traditions as well,' smiled Marshall. "'It just seems a little odd,' persisted Dottie. "'They should be here. Adriana's family is.' Gabe glanced over to see a pained Parker trying to make out what one of Adriana's uncles was saying. Parker looked confused, no doubt by the heavy accent the man had. Parker's thin bride sat beside him, poking at something on her plate with the wrong fork. Next to the Bramsley family, Adriana's family looked underdressed. However, they seemed to appreciate the food and beverages. One of them stood to make a long and rambling toast in their native language. Parker was in for an interesting life, Gabe reflected. Whether his brother's temperament could handle it, Gabe didn't know. He could also see his Aunt Mary puckering her lips in distaste at the display. While the uptight Mary had married the laid-back Oscar Ramsley, she herself was a stickler for propriety and standards. Mom, gently admonished Marshall, they've ordered trays in their rooms for lunch. I guess it's supposed to take hours to get ready, but they're managing on a much smaller time frame to accommodate us. I offered to help, but was turned down. My bride has it all under control. I'm happy for you, Dottie hastened to assure him. I worried a little bit about Parker, but after having a chat with the lovely girl he's chosen, all my fears were laid to rest. Adriana will do nicely. I'm sure Parker will be pleased to hear it, Gabe said a little dryly. He had some doubts about the whole thing, but Parker could make his own decisions regarding his mail-ordered bride. Gabe, are you certain Brittany won't be coming? Dottie tentatively asked as she gave Gabe a hopeful look. I do like the girl, and she comes from good family. Gabe swallowed down his own unhappiness with the situation, understanding his mother was disappointed as well. Brittany is a wonderful person. I'm hoping to change her mind, but it's not going to happen today. It's okay, dear. Dottie patted his hand wistfully. It was nice of you to give one of the other couples a chance to marry today. Gabe nodded. Is Dad going to be at the send-off tomorrow? James had made an appearance at the wedding, but had been unable to continue attending due to his health. He pleaded fatigue and went home. Gabe hated to disappoint his father, but there was little he could do. He needs to rest up, but your father assured me he would be there. Dottie smiled fondly. The man cannot seem to sleep anywhere but his own bed. Plus, he gets so tired these days. We thought it best for him to skip tonight and breakfast tomorrow. He'll be here to see everyone off. That's good, murmured Gabe. Both he and his mother ignored the fact that James was due to report to prison, albeit a minimum security one, soon after the weekend. The late lunch was finally wrapping up. He decided he needed a little fresh air. Being around so many happy people was excruciating at the moment. Not that Gabe would ever want to take away from their joy. It was just maddening he and Brittany weren't sharing it. Excusing himself, Gabe made his way through the lobby, down the stone steps, and out into the street. It was cold, and he wished he had brought his jacket, but dinner had been less formal and he had taken it off, setting it on the back of his chair. Gabe breathed in the crisp winter air. It was quiet for the city. Construction had blocked off this road and everyone had to go around it. Other than the doorman, Gabe had the street to himself. He dragged in a deep breath and looked over to see the sun starting to set between the buildings. She wasn't coming. He had lost his job. He had very little savings. All he had was a flimsy list of ideas to try to win her heart. There was a gaping hole in his life. If Gabe were honest with himself, the hole was where Britt should be. He had been so concerned with keeping himself safe, he had lost something precious. A hollow feeling permeated his chest. Maybe he was in love with her. 
Would that be called irony? Britt had been loved with him all this time, had perhaps fallen out of love with him, and now finally Gabe could admit that he loved her to himself. He loved her. The thought brought only misery, not of the risk he had left himself open to, but the regret what might have been if he had only tried. He was going to try even harder now. The question was, would Britt respond, or would she do as he had done all these years by ignoring him? "'Everything okay?' asked Max as he approached. Max had been smart enough to keep his jacket, Parker saw. "'I saw you talking to our not-so-favorite FBI agent earlier. Who?' Gabe dragged his thoughts away from his failed relationship with Brittany. "'Oh, right. Kepler wants all of our passports by tomorrow morning before the family breakfast.' Max frowned. "'Seriously? I doubt many of us brought our passports. Why would he want them?' "'Something about how there was a new break in the investigation and none of us are to leave the country,' sighed Gabe. "'That guy really does take the cake.' Max shook his head. "'Maybe Bree can talk sense into him. She seems to be friends with Kepler somehow. I wonder why he would tell us he wants our passports in advance.' "'I think he told me so he could see who tries to flee,' snorted Gabe, as he kicked a rock on the pavement." The guy's playing games. I vote we don't even tell anyone he wants the passports. Do you think someone might make a run for it? A surprised Max asked. He looked at Gabe in concern. Do you know something about it? Gabe sighed. I hope not. We did have a break-in at one of our labs in the hospital. Parker's been dealing with the investigation. It might have been Garrett. Why would you think that? Max wondered in concern. There was video evidence, admitted Gabe. It was grainy, but Parker says it was him. A drug was taken. I cannot understand why Garrett would go through such trouble to steal a cardioplegia concoction. What is the drug used for? Do you think Garrett has an addiction? Max lowered his voice to ensure the nearby doorman didn't overhear their conversation. That's the thing. It's not a drug which gets anyone high, explained Gabe. It's a chemical agent which contains potassium ion. We use it in an operating room to stop the heart during heart surgeries. Has anyone spoken to Garrett about this yet? Maybe it wasn't him, ventured a hopeful Max. It's Garrett. He got a key card and a code somehow. Parker is going to talk to him since he's now the head of the Ramsley HMC, shrugged Gabe. Hopefully it was just some big misunderstanding. We are trying to keep it quiet within the family for now. Maybe Garrett has a reasonable explanation, responded Max. Maybe, murmured Gabe with some doubt. There was no reason Garrett should be taking anything from one of the family hospitals. However, Gabe didn't think his cousin was up to any good. A woman caught his eye. There was a brunette walking at the cross street. Gabe's eyes followed her, but in his heart he knew she wasn't Brittany. How are you holding up? quietly asked Max, revealing the real reason he had followed Gabe outside. You know, losing your position with Ramsley HMC and not marrying Brittany? I can get another job, shrugged Gabe. As for Brit, I can only hope our relationship isn't beyond repair. Gabe the mighty has fallen. Max gave a low whistle. I wasn't sure I would ever see the day. I'm going to win her back, murmured Gabe ignoring Max's jibe. I recommend groveling, a sympathetic Max advised. Flowers can help, too. Or candy. Really, anything she likes is a good start. Promise things, but not if you don't plan to deliver on them. Did I mention groveling sometimes works? Somehow, Gabe didn't think it would be easy. He wasn't charming like Max, and Brittany had been pretty clear in voicing she wanted to be left alone. Do you mind going back inside? I would like a few minutes alone to think. Sure thing, but if you need more advice, just call. Max nodded agreeably. He gave Gabe a pat on the shoulder before returning to the hotel. It was just Gabe and the doorman again. A couple of pigeons cooed nearby. Gabe sighed, feeling the weight of the entire world settling on his shoulders. How long he stood there contemplating the sunset, Gabe didn't know. A movement caught the corner of his eye, 
and he looked as a car pulled up at the construction barriers at the end of the street. Squinting against the sunlight, Gabe could see someone in a tux exit the vehicle, holding the door open for a woman in a blue-colored dress. Someone who was late to the wedding weekend. Or trying to crash it, Gabe surmised. Then again, maybe he was being cynical. It was a big hotel. There could be other weddings happening. Then the woman in the blue dress put a couple of bouquets in the man's hands. She turned and helped a dark-haired woman who was wearing a white dress out of the car. The blue dress woman fussed over her hair, took back the bouquets, handing one to the woman in white. The trio started walking toward the hotel. Gabe's heart skipped a beat as he recognized Brittany. He stood frozen, watching as she and Tara approached. It seemed almost unbearable to breathe. Gabe had been looking for Brittany all day, trying to spot her in the crowd, and there she was, coming towards him. He nearly worried that his mind was playing a trick on him. Brit? He managed to croak in disbelief. Hope started to rise within him. Brittany stopped within a dozen feet of him. A tremulous smile graced her lips, uncertainty in her eyes. I saw the house. It's beautiful. Gabe had spent the better part of the past week making sure renovations and decorating the house they had bought together was done to perfection. He had hoped the gesture might make Brittany realize he was serious about being with her and wanted a future together. Brittany, Gabe, and the baby she so much wanted. I compromised on the shower. Gabe cleared his throat, feeling nervous. Did you like the yard? I like the yard the best, replied Brittany, especially the treehouse. Gabe had an uncertain smile. I thought you would like the pantry the best. The pantry was a surprise, nodded Brittany. You had to reduce your office. It was worth it, Gabe stated firmly. If it made you happy, then it was definitely worth it. Brittany pleaded her dress with her fingers. That's why I'm here. The pantry? questioned Gabe. No, Brittany had a little laugh. You compromised to make me happy. The shower and the pantry were proof. Then there was the backyard. I met Tom. He told me all about the hard work you and he did to make the backyard happen. The ornamental tree is crooked, muttered Gabe. No matter which way I try to angle it, it's always crooked. I'm sorry it wasn't done professionally. I'm sure a landscaping company could have done a better job, but I couldn't get anyone on short notice after the company I had was double booked. I love it more because you did it, confessed Brittany. I love you more because you proved you can be an equal part of this relationship. You made the house a home for us. It gives me hope that you'll keep trying and be half the equation of us. That is all I want, Gabe said truthfully. I know I don't deserve any more chances from you, but if you want to try again, Brittany, I would like to try again too. Whatever you want, I'm willing to be part of it as long as it's with you. Do you still want to get married? she asked hopefully. Gabe walked forward, drawn to her. He cupped his hands to her cheeks and bent down to give her a searing kiss. When he broke it off, Brittany smiled at him with delight. Is that a yes? You have got to stop proposing to me. We're going to do this right this time. Gabe took Brittany's hands in his own and knelt on one knee. Brittany Helena Crawford, I have made a mess of our entire relationship. Ever since I've known you, I have dismissed you, and I didn't appreciate you for who you were. I was wrong. You knew exactly how things should be between us, and I just wouldn't listen. I'm sorry for putting you in that position, for hurting you, and for making you wait so long for us. I'm going to change. I have changed. From now on, you are the most important person in my world. I promise to do whatever I can to make you happy. You were right. We do belong together. Gabe gave her hands a squeeze and took a deep breath to try to overcome the small pit of anxiety in his stomach. He was ready for this confession, Gabe realized. He was ready to risk everything as long as it was with her. Brit, I love you. Will you marry me? A joyful Brittany nodded, as happy tears formed in her eyes. Grinning, Gabe stood, sweeping Brittany off her feet and into his arms, twirling around on the street. 
Chapter 14 Marshall Marshall was tapping his foot at the front of the ballroom. Not because he was impatient, more so because he was happy as he had probably ever been. Even happier than when he was in an operating room. He needed to drive out some of his excess energy. He was waiting to get married for the second time today. Jasmine's cousin Priya had grabbed him after the luncheon, telling him his outfit was in his room. Marshall had been pleasantly surprised to find a pair of very comfortable cotton pants and tunic. They were dark blue with some interesting patterns of blue and silver embroidery on them. Blue was definitely his color, Marshall decided. It brought out his eyes. He understood from Priya that Jasmine was to wear a lighter shade of blue with dark embroidery, which was to match his hue of blue. It was coordinated. All he had to do was follow Jasmine's lead on everything. They had discussed particulars over one of their many video chats. They had also fleshed out what his position in her life would be. The good news was Marshall would have more to do than just look pretty and be her confidant. While he and Jasmine would never see the inside of an operating room again as doctors, they had the opportunity to do a number of great things. There were charity organizations which would love to have them, especially him, work with them to help people. Helping people is what Marshall enjoyed doing the most. His pro bono work and his advocating for charity assistance through Ramsley Hospital and Medical Corporation had been one of the reasons he had kept his seat on the board at the expense of his practicing medicine. Marshall was actually trading up in careers, he thought with joy. Plus, he was marrying his best friend. Today couldn't get any better in his opinion. Then he saw the back doors open. Widening his already big smile, Marshall expected Priya to enter, followed by Jasmine. His smile dimmed as he watched in surprise as a couple he didn't know entered the ballroom. They looked around for available seats as hotel staff came forward to ensure they were in the right room. Following them came Gabe and Brittany. They were holding hands. Brittany had a white dress on, lacy and a little over knee length. She was also holding a bouquet of light blue flowers. Marshall grinned at his brother, and the hotel staff quickly found seats for the extra guests. It looked like Brittany and Gabe were back together, reflected Marshall. He didn't know what had convinced her to try again, but Marshall was glad for his brother. Perhaps Gabe wouldn't lose out on his inheritance either if they got married this afternoon. Today was just getting better and better. Priya came first, spreading even more flowers out of her basket on the already petal-strewn path down the aisle. While Jasmine's father remained at home, her mother, an aunt, and some cousins had flown in to witness the two ceremonies. Now they were also in traditional dress, seated with the guests. Then Jasmine came through the door, and Marshall's world fell away to just her. She was perfect, with bare feet like him, white cotton pants, a pale blue tunic with darker embroidery, a gauzy overlay sort of long sweater thing, and a lacy veil clipped to her hair. Marshall smiled, then remembered from their chats this was supposed to be a somber affair. He quickly wiped the grin from his mouth, standing up straight and trying to tamp down his outward display of joy. This was being recorded, and streamed for posterity for Jasmine's people, soon to be his adopted country and people as well. Marshall wanted to make them proud. Coming to stand beside him, Jasmine and he faced the officiant, there was some talking in his native language and lighting of an incense candle. Marshall did his best to hold in a sneeze as he solemnly listened to the words which he didn't understand. Jasmine had given him the basics of what the ceremony said, and it really was beautiful, even if the translation couldn't capture it all. Marshall enjoyed the cadence of the language, and once again vowed he was going to learn it. Soon enough they had gone through all the motions, and were presented to the guests who clapped politely. Since Marshall and Jasmine had already done the receiving line previously, they didn't feel the need to do it a second time. Marshall offered his arm to Jasmine, and they walked down the aisle. With a wink at Jasmine, Marshall stopped at the last row of guests. He held a hand out to Brittany. 
Brittany, I would like to introduce my wife, Jasmine. Jasmine, this is Brittany. How do you do? asked Jasmine, a smile playing on her lips. Marshall had cupped her up to date on Gabe's troubles with Brittany. Pleased to meet you, responded Brittany. Gabe raised an eyebrow, knowing that his brother had an ulterior motive. Can we help you, Marshall? I was wondering how things are going between the two of you. Marshall was perhaps too casual with his tone, knowing that everyone was paying attention to the interchange between the two couples. Everyone is here. It's a lovely day. Perhaps you would like to take advantage of the venue. Marshall has no manners, inserted Jasmine. She patted her husband on the arm. You should not be putting them on the spot like this. It's not kind. I just want them to be happy like I am, protested Marshall. Why should Gabe and Britt miss this opportunity? We're not missing it, Riley noted Gabe. We were going to wait for you to be finished and discuss with the appropriate persons if and when we could get married this weekend. Perhaps tomorrow. The officiant is right there, pointed out Marshall. It could happen right now. Jasmine dissolved into giggles. I do apologize for him. He is pushy, replied Gabe to Jasmine. I hope you can handle him. Oh, I think I'll do just fine, she smiled up at Marshall. She is totally in charge, agreed Marshall, giving her a smile, before returning his attention to Gabe and Brittany. So? If you would just give us a moment, perhaps we could arrange something, responded Brittany, trying to hold back a smile. I think my mom already is, inserted Gabe as he saw Dottie talking to the officiant, who had done the triple wedding earlier in the day. He took Brittany's hand in his. Are you ready to get married? Yes, Brittany gave him a smile. Are you? Any second thoughts? No second thoughts. Gabe gave her hand a squeeze. Marshall beamed. Then I suggest we switch places. Give me a moment to see if it's even possible. Gabe let go of Brittany's hand, rising. He moved forward along the aisle to join Dottie and the pastor. This is really happening, breathed Brittany. Tara put an arm around her. If he messes up, Reg and I will deal with him for you. He isn't going to mess up, interjected Marshall. He spent the last week on my couch pining for Brittany. Gabe is in deep and has finally realized it. He still has no people skills, so he'll have to be a little lenient with him. But I know Gabe is in it for the long term. He loves Brittany. I love him, Brittany said simply. I'm ready to start the rest of our lives together. Gabe talked to Dylan's oldest son, Caden, for a moment, giving him a room key before the boy jogged out of the ballroom on an errand. Can I escort you up the aisle? asked Marshall to distract Brittany. He wondered what Gabe had forgotten that he needed to send Caden out to get. Marshall, giggled Jasmine, perhaps Brittany has someone else in mind. I will have that honor, thank you, stated Reg firmly. Gabe continued to discuss with the pastor until Caden came swiftly into the ballroom. Caden gave Gabe the keycard back, along with the jeweler's box. If everyone would please remain seated, we will witness the nuptials of Gabriel Ramsley to Brittany Crawford, the officiant announced at the front of the room as he took the box from Gabe. Congratulations. You're a beautiful bride, said Jasmine as Brittany, Tara, and Reg vacated their seats. Thank you. You look lovely as well, replied Brittany as Tara fussed over her. Marshall and Jasmine sat in the vacant seats as the music started from the small orchestra. Soon enough, bridesmaid Tara was headed up the aisle. I honestly don't believe this day can get better, remarked Marshall in quiet satisfaction to Jasmine as they watched Reg escort Brittany to Gabe. It has been pretty remarkable, agreed Jasmine. Marshall wrapped an arm around her shoulders, and Jasmine comfortably leaned on him as they watched his brother be wed to Brittany, who was absolutely glowing. Marshall reflected the weekend was almost perfect. They were surrounded by friends and family. All the weddings had gone off without a hitch. Gabe might even be able to keep his job and inheritance. Marshall couldn't recall if their father's ultimatum expired exactly at a specific hour, or at the end of the day. If it was the end of the day, Gabe and Parker could both continue at Ramsley Medical. 
Even if it wasn't, Parker would continue the family legacy. Perhaps he would hire Gabe back. Marshall was sure that it wouldn't be against James's rules. Marshall idly wondered what they might be like as fathers. He had every confidence that he and Jasmine would be okay as parents. Gabe would likely be a nervous wreck at first until he got the hang of it. Too bad Marshall wouldn't be nearby to tease him about it. Parker would likely hire a nanny. It was a little sad in Marshall's opinion. Hopefully his brother would prove him wrong. The only thing Marshall wasn't so happy with was the fact his future kids wouldn't grow up with their cousins like he had. Marshall had loved getting together with his cousins for birthdays, holidays, and general mayhem. It had been great since they were all boys except for Addison. Poor Addison had hung around with their moms while the boys roamed in a pack having adventures. Marshall hoped his kids would have adventures, even if they were destined to be royalty. In his humble opinion, all kids should have the opportunity to explore and have fun. Marshall had a look around the room. Here the Ramsleys all were, probably not to gather all together until next year again as a family. Aunts, brothers, cousins, and now their children. It made him feel nostalgic for a moment. Are you okay? questioned Jasmine softly. Great, managed Marshall, quickly blinking. He came to his feet, a hand out to help Jasmine stand, as everyone stood politely for Brittany and Gabe, the latest bride and groom, as they came down the aisle. Jasmine and he followed the general flow of people as they came forward to congratulate Brittany and Gabe. You should be standing right beside us, mentioned Gabe wryly as he shook his brother's hand. Gabe doesn't like to be the center of attention, observed Brittany, her free arm hooked through her husband's as she shook Jasmine's proffered hand. We already did this in the morning, blissfully smiled Marshall. It would seem a little redundant. Thanks, muttered Gabe. Marshall just grinned. He and Jasmine made the rounds, socializing with everyone. It really was the first time Marshall could introduce her to all his family, since they had been so busy with the weddings. As he had predicted, Jasmine and Dottie got on very well, chatting amicably and learning more about one another. He spotted some of the other guys gathered around and wandered over. You what? questioned Drew, frowning at the group of guys. We found a positive pregnancy test, explained Noah. We are trying to find out who might be a dad, mentioned Max. We may have taken a few bets as to who we think it might be. If you want in on the action, we can write you down. You do realize that you're speaking to my brother, the cop, about gambling, right? Drawled an amused Molson. It's more about the mystery than the money, defended Max. We just want to see if we can figure out who it is before there is an announcement. Beth isn't pregnant, dryly noted Drew. You can take her off the list. We heard through the grapevine you two were waiting, so no one's bet on Bethany anyways, shrugged Max. Drew turned to Molson. How is it that they know more about my business than I know about my business? The wonders of being part of our family, grinned Marshall. Plus the girls talk, then they tell us. Then you already know there ain't no point in having Holly on the list, observed Molson. She and I are still in the new dating mode. Really? mused Drew. We're not rushing things, noted Molson. When are you getting married again? Married? asked Marshall with curiosity. It was the first time he had heard about it. In May, sighed Drew. Are you getting cold feet? questioned Noah at Drew's noted lack of enthusiasm. No. Bethany's mother has become involved in the wedding planning, grimly stated Drew. She thinks we're doing things far too bougie simple, whatever that means. It means cheap, clarified Molson. It means what we can afford, noted Drew. Plus, it's what Beth wants. You could take advantage of the weekend. Grab the pastor before he leaves, offered Marshall. Family's all here. You just need to get Bethany's family. No thanks. Everything is set for May. Drew turned down their offer. Suit yourself shrugged Max. Or you could get on the betting and we might win some cash to help with that wedding. How much is the buy-in? questioned Molson with amusement. 
A grand, shrugged Noah. A thousand dollars, asked Drew in disbelief. That's about half my rent. You pay two grand for that apartment? wondered Max. Really? How much is your salary? queried Marshall. Not enough, said Drew. Look, it's too steep for me. You guys enjoy the mystery. You're a detective, mentioned Max. You could help us out by helping us figure out who is pregnant. No, Drew shook his head. Not happening. What about you? Marshall asked Molson. Are you in? No, I'll leave it to you guys to figure out, declared Molson. I prefer to use the cash to eat, have power, heat, you know, useful stuff. Speaking of eating, Max peered over the crowd. I think the private dining room has opened up. Finally, I'm starved, replied Noah. I'm going to find Elle and enjoy whatever they have planned for food tonight. Noah and Max wandered away as Bethany came to Drew's side. Where is Holly? wondered Molson as he looked around the room. She and Kitty went to the ladies' room a moment. They'll meet us at the dining area, said Bethany as she came to the group. Drew automatically put an arm around her, pulling her to his side. It was a lovely wedding, Marshall. Thank you. I'm glad you could come, stated Marshall, before happily excusing himself to go and find his bride. Chapter 15 Kitty I can't believe he's here, whispered a horrified Kitty as she came to a complete stop, causing Holly to accidentally bump into her. They were returning from the ladies' room to join everyone for dinner when Kitty spotted someone in the dining area before the Ramsleys' private dining room. Who? Holly whispered back, grabbing Kitty's shoulder to keep her balance. My ex-boyfriend, murmured Kitty. Her stomach bottomed out as Tristan got out of his chair at the dining table, going on one knee and opening a ring box. The woman he was proposing to pressed her hands to her mouth in surprise. Oh, dear, breathed Holly. Maybe we should walk away. No. Kitty evaluated her feelings as the woman nodded, smiling ear to ear as Tristan slipped the ring onto her finger. I want to see this. It could have been her. No, it would never have been her, Kitty corrected herself. Tristan had no intention of proposing to her. He had strung her along for six years without any intentions. Kitty had let him. Her friends were right. He didn't love her. Did she love him? Kitty had told herself so many times over the relationship that she did, almost like a mantra, willing it to be true. If that was the case, then she probably didn't love him. Tristan and the mystery woman kissed, all happiness and bliss. People nearby politely applauded the couple. Kitty felt relief. It was truly over now. Was that normal? To be relieved when someone else moved on? If that was the case, had she loved him at all? I really think we should go, murmured Holly, taking Kitty by the arm. Come on, I'll buy you a drink. Kitty let Holly lead her to the bar. You're a psychiatrist, right? Yes, concurred Holly as she carefully sat on a bar stool, careful of her dress. Kitty perched on the stool beside her. Why am I so dumb? I wasted six years on him. I gave him every opportunity to pick me. I ignored the signs he was cheating on me. I made up every excuse to my friends to allow for his behavior. What is wrong with me? How long ago did you break up with him? Questioned Holly. She smiled at the bartender. Something fruity. Surprise me. He broke up with me a little over three weeks ago, admitted Kitty. He even asked me if I thought she would like the ring. Oh, dear, grimaced Holly. Get my friend here something, too. My girlfriends kept telling me he wasn't right for me, moaned Kitty. I just don't know why I didn't see it before. Holly cocked her head to the side as she looked at Kitty. What is an irritating habit that he has, besides the cheating? He picks his teeth after every meal with a toothpick, shuddered Kitty. Even snacks. Who does that? One year I got him toothpicks for Christmas as a joke. He sincerely appreciated it. Good. Now, every time you see him, I want you to think toothpicks, advised Holly, 
just toothpicks. You will never go back to him. It's that easy? A doubtful kitty said. Not really. It's a mind trick, clarified Holly. The idea is to give your rational mind a moment to think of all the other reasons you should not be with this person should they ever ask you again, and associate those reasons with the toothpick habit. You will learn to loathe toothpicks altogether. It usually works. He's getting married. I don't think he's going to ask me to be his girlfriend again, remarked Kitty. Holly had a laugh. That spoiled man-boy over there is going to find out marriage isn't as easy as he'd been led to believe. When he starts hitting those first bumps in the matrimonial road, he's going to look for someone familiar who soothes his ego. He will come running back to you, asking you to be his girl, promising he will leave his wife for you and find every excuse in the book not to. He will groom you to be the other woman. He's been doing that all along, from the sounds of it. I've seen his kind many times. That was blunt, blinked Kitty. She took a delicate cocktail straw and sipped the drink the bartender put down in front of her. I'm being your friend, not your psychiatrist, dryly spoke Holly. If I were your doctor, I would have to lead you gently and politely through the whole process, while charging you hundreds of dollars an hour. I'll take the friendship over the bill. Thank you, noted Kitty. I thought you would, smiled Holly. Now your mother and father, what's up with them? They divorced when I was around eight, shrugged Kitty. He had some other girl knocked up who was half his age. There it is, declared Holly. Subconsciously, you blame your mom for not keeping your dad happy so he would stay in your family unit. I don't even like my dad, frowned Kitty. I mean, maybe he would have stayed and been a better person if she had not... Oh, my word, you're totally right. I have been blaming Mom. Which is why you're willing to do anything to keep a relationship going, even if it means you are the proverbial doormat, concluded Holly. She flagged down the bartender. Another round, please. Kitty realized her drink was empty. How do I fix it? You realize you are just as important as the other person in the relationship, and your needs should be met as well, commented Holly. Something which is super easy to say, but hard to do. Especially after you've already gotten yourself into the habit of giving and not receiving. Kitty sighed dejectedly. Am I doomed to repeat the mistake? I mean, now I'm out of the relationship, I can see the whole thing was just wrong. Yet when he lavished me with attention, I would get sucked back in. Hence the thinking about toothpicks so you won't get sucked back in. Holly thought about Kitty's question as she munched on a pretzel stick from a bowl. What you need is a person who will put you first. A kind, nice guy, who has the same relationship issues you do. Then both of you can spend your lives trying to make each other happy. My friend Maya thinks I should date Ben, laughed Kitty. Why not? questioned a curious Holly. Ben is a classic case of a man who would literally do anything for the woman in his life. He is solid relationship material. The only risk is that he'll find someone who will abuse that good quality. We're just friends, sobered Kitty. There isn't any spark. You have thought about him, a satisfied Holly took another sip from her straw. Do tell. Kitty shrugged with forced nonchalance. I did a little experiment, to see if Ben might be interested in me. I gave him every opportunity to make a move, and he didn't. Ben isn't a player. He doesn't make moves, gently chided Holly. I talked to him, and he was very nice, polite, and shy. His family overshadows him. Ben is used to letting other people make the moves in his personal life. He is passive. Kitty frowned. Ben isn't shy. Maybe not in business or around his friends, allowed Holly. What did you do for your experiment? I asked him to do up the back of my dress, admitted Kitty. Most guys would get at least a little frisky doing up the zipper when it's a strapless. Plus, we slow danced afterward. How did he make you feel? pressed Holly. Safe, comfortable, sighed Kitty. Like he always does. Hmm. Holly munched on another pretzel. How did you want him to make you feel? I don't know, muttered Kitty as she stirred her drink. Excited, nervous, the whole butterflies in the abdomen thing? The way Tristan makes you feel, said a knowing Holly. Well, yeah, shrugged Kitty. 
Ben isn't Tristan. Holly pointed out. He won't make you feel the same way, which is probably a good thing. Kitty had a sigh, thinking over the many differences between the two men. Have the two of you ever kissed? wondered Holly. No. If we did, it could ruin the whole relationship, explained Kitty. I value Ben as my friend. The last thing I want is to hurt him. A kiss is a surefire indicator of if there'll be any spark or not, murmured Holly. Have you thought of him and you in bed together? What, like sex? Kitty blushed red. No! Why not? asked Holly with a grin. Believe me, I have often thought about my boyfriend and I in that situation, almost to the point where I'm ready to tell him to forget my five-year plan and get married early. You and your boyfriend aren't... Kitty trailed off. Nope. Holly released a pent-up breath. Molson and I have enjoyed a lot together, but we haven't yet had sex. He has this idea we should be at least engaged first. It's funny, because I think everyone would never guess how old-fashioned he really is. I adored it at the beginning of the relationship. Now I'm frustrated to the point of being ready to seduce him. Your boyfriend is the doctor with the tattoos, clarified Kitty. Holly nodded. Yet we're not talking about me. We are supposed to be talking about you. You need to kiss Ben and do a little imagining before you decide to set him aside as no spark. Even without spark, people can have great relationships if they both have the same goals. Why would anyone want to be married without any chemistry? frowned Kitty. How old are you, if you don't mind me asking? Holly finished her drink. Twenty-four? Kitty gave Holly a suspicious look. Don't tell me I'm too young to understand. Just kiss the guy, advised Holly. You'll probably knock his socks off. Hopefully, he'll knock your socks off too. If not, then just blame it on the booze. Are you used to drinking this much? Kitty eyed Holly. No, I was kind of keeping pace with you. Holly frowned. I'm probably going to regret it. Kitty laughed. Maybe we should find your boyfriend, or at least other women in the Ramsley group. Holly turned to view the crowd. She was surprised as she watched Molson come towards them. Speaking of him, he's right here. You say you're looking for me? drawled the tattooed doctor as he leaned on the bar beside Holly. Molson, meet Kitty. Holly introduced them. Kitty came with Ben. Nice to meet you nodded Molson before he looked at the three empty glasses in front of Holly. You drink all those? I must have. Holly looked at the empty glasses in slight awe. I may have been a bad influence, noted Kitty. We were talking about relationships. Heavy stuff, agreed Molson with a nod. I think we should revisit the five-year plan and move up the timeline, Holly told him, putting a hand on his arm. If sober you agrees, then we can discuss it, grinned Molson. I'm not drunk, an indignant Holly said. Three beverages, Molson pointed at the empties. We drank through straws, warned Kitty. I'm pretty sure it's kicking in for her. She isn't a drinker, is she? Nope, confirmed Molson as he grabbed a pretzel from the bowl, munching on it. She is usually full-on sober. Holly leaned forward, whispering something in his ear, which caused Molson to choke on the dry pretzel. He coughed badly, and Kitty offered him her drink. He swallowed with a grimace, asking hoarsely, What is this? Kitty shrugged. Something the bartender gave us? How about it? sweetly asked Holly. I think your dad would skin me alive, wheezed Molson. He handed Kitty back her drink. Drew is going to be one unhappy man tonight. Why? frowned Holly. Why would your brother be unhappy? I'm giving you to Bethany until the buzz wears off, Molson decided. A man has only so much willpower. You're being a spoil sport, judged Holly. She ran a hand down his arm. Okay, nice to meet you, Kitty, said Molson as he helped Holly stand. It's time to find my soon-to-be sister-in-law to take care of my girlfriend. Kitty ordered one last drink, watching the crowd. She thought of Molson and Holly, who obviously had chemistry. 
Molson also respected his girlfriend. Any other guy would probably just have taken Holly up to the hotel room. Kitty frowned. Molson was a gentleman. So was Ben. Maybe that was why she had not gotten a reaction. Not because Ben wasn't interested, but because he had been raised to be respectful and not go over certain boundaries. Maybe all the Ramsleys were gentlemen. Sipping her drink, Kitty thought over what Holly had said. Ben was a husky guy. He made Kitty feel tiny in comparison. Yet he wasn't exactly fat. He had lost weight. Kitty had meant what she said about him looking sharp in his suit. Ben was a handsome man. She closed her eyes and let her imagination run for a moment. Her breath caught in her throat as she thought about, Hey, would you like another drink? The bartender asked. Kitty flushed red and blinked in embarrassment. She put her empty drink on the bar. No, thank you. She showed him her room key so he could put the tab on the room's bill. Getting up from the stool, she waited until the room righted itself. Okay. Four drinks through a straw had not been a great idea. Leaving the restaurant, she went for the elevator. Tapping the button, Kitty waited for it to arrive. Kitty, a voice said in surprise. Kitty glanced over to see Tristan beside her, waiting for the elevator as well. Toothpicks, she reminded herself. How have you been? asked Tristan. I wasn't expecting you to be here. I'm here for a wedding. Kitty pressed the button to call the elevator again. Mercifully, the doors opened. He followed her onto the elevator. Drat! You know, I feel bad about the way things were left between us began Tristan, eyeing her. Kitty didn't feel bad. Finally, she felt free. It was an interesting experience. Kitty loved it. Seeing Tristan propose had been like the last piece of the puzzle to shed her previous attachment to him. She hit the button for her floor number and hoped he would leave her alone if she ignored him. You mean a lot to me. Tristan pressed another button, deliberately crowding her. We should have said a proper goodbye. We still can if you'd like. I could come to your room. Kitty gaped at him as the elevator started to move. You just proposed two minutes ago to your fiancé, and now you're trying to get sex out of me? Hey, we were good together, smiled Tristan, as he put an arm on the wall of the elevator, effectively blocking her in the corner. He pushed a strand of hair out of her face. We can be good one last time. No, stated Kitty in a firm voice. You have a fiancé. I also have a hotel maid who is willing to do a menage a trois, if you're up for it, he murmured. You're a slime ball, gasped Kitty. Heedless, the elevator had come to a stop and the doors were open. The biggest, slimiest slime ball there ever was. You're so slimy, this elevator cannot hold all your slime. You're disgusting. Is that a no? wondered Tristan, a little confused. Absolutely no, exclaimed Kitty. She ducked underneath his arm, escaping the elevator. Come on, complained Tristan as he followed her. Don't be mad. My parents are making me marry her. I've always loved you, Kitty. You know I would marry you in a heartbeat, but I cannot go against my parents. They would cut me off without a dime. It's their fault we cannot be together. Toothpicks! growled Kitty as she continued down the hallway. What? A confused Tristan asked. I don't understand. You don't need to understand, muttered Kitty. She came to Ben's room and knocked on the door. Kitty hoped he was there. If she went to her own room and Tristan followed her in, she couldn't be responsible for what she did to him. Go away. Hey, is that any way to talk to the love of your life? Surely you're not still mad, are you? Tristan questioned. Listen, I regret breaking up with you. I thought it would be the right thing to do with having to propose. Maybe we don't have to be apart. Are you asking me to be your mistress? Aghast, Kitty wondered. Three weeks ago, she might have thought about the offer. She might have fallen for the idea of keeping him and hoping he would eventually choose her instead. Had she really been so dumb? Kitty could hear the door open behind her. 
Is it really so bad of an idea? responded Tristan. We could still be together, and my parents would still give me the money. All we have to do is wait for them to die so I can divorce my wife. Then you and I can get married. The stuff that comes out of your mouth, muttered Ben in the doorway of the hotel room. How had she been so desperate as to put up with this guy? Kitty looked at her former boyfriend in amazement. Think about it, Kitty, insisted Tristan. You know you want me. Okay, I'm interfering. Ben took Kitty by the arm, pulling her into the room. Goodbye, Tristan. He shut the door, locking it, before looking at Kitty. Please tell me you're not tempted to go back to him. Kitty shuddered, remembering how blasé Tristan had been about having a threesome. No. You have to know he isn't any good for you, insisted Ben. You deserve better than him, Kit. Please, don't go back to him. I'm not going back to him, responded Kitty. She wasn't. She finally had her eyes wide open in regards to Tristan for once. Too bad it hadn't happened years sooner. He's a piece of trash, continued Ben. What he just said about waiting for his parents to die? They're not that old. He doesn't really care about you. If he did, he wouldn't be offering to make you his mistress. I know. Kitty felt like Ben wasn't really listening to her. For some reason, you keep going back to him. It has to stop, said Ben. He really needed to stop talking about Tristan, decided Kitty. Maybe it was the drinks which gave her an extra boost of courage. Maybe it was the pep talk Holly had given her. Either way, it was time to see once and for all if there was any spark. Kitty turned her back to Ben. Undo me, please. Are you avoiding talking about this? questioned Ben as he automatically unhooked, then unzipped the dress. I'm not avoiding anything. You talked, and I agreed with you. Kitty dropped the dress, heading to Ben's dresser to grab one of his t-shirts. Taking off her heels, she put the tee on. It was so much more comfortable than the corseted dress she had been wearing. She turned back to Ben. He was red and staring at the ceiling. She had bikinis with the same amount of material as the bra and undies she was wearing. He had seen her in them when they had gone to the beach with their friends. It wasn't that shocking. Kitty eyed him. Sit on the bed. Excuse me? Ben let himself have a quick look at her, noting she was covered. You're too tall, complained Kitty. Sit. I'm not sure you agreed with me, mentioned Ben as he sat on the edge of the bed. What are you going to do tomorrow when you have had time to think about Tristan's offer? You have a bad habit of going back to him. I'm not going back to him, Kitty assured Ben. Tristan has toothpicks. Ben frowned. Have you been drinking? Only a little, confessed Kitty. Holly helped me. I see, said Ben, looking confused. She gave me some really great advice, mentioned Kitty putting her hands on his shoulders. Holly is so smart. I think you've had more than just a little to drink, concluded Ben with a frown. Doesn't matter, a confident Kitty replied. I want to see if you have spark. Spark? echoed a puzzled Ben. All it takes is one spark to light a forest fire, murmured Kitty. She threaded her hands through his hair, leaning down and placing her lips on his. Ben didn't respond at first. For a moment, Kitty wondered if he was going to. Just as she was about to start feeling a little silly for kissing him, he kissed her back. It was enough to make her weak in the knees. This was more than a spark. She suspected if they continued long enough, there could be an inferno. That was about the moment rational thought left her fuzzy brain. She didn't know how long they kissed. Suddenly, Ben was standing up, pulling her hands away from him. You should, um... Ben cleared his throat. You should have some water and sleep off the alcohol. Confusion swamped Kitty. Didn't he feel the spark? Her entire body was on fire. Come on. Ben took her by the hand, leading her to the kitchenette. He filled up a glass of water, handing it to her. Drink up and then bed for you. Kitty took the glass thinking over the past few minutes as she drank the water. Surely he had felt the spark. 
unless he didn't. Had she ruined a perfectly good friendship? Kitty couldn't imagine not being friends with Ben. He was such a large piece of her life. Ben took the glass from her, setting it down. He went to the bed, turning down the covers as Kitty trailed in his wake. Ben? whispered Kitty. Yeah? Ben straightened to look down at her. Kitty swallowed over the lump in her throat. We're still friends, right? We are always friends, he assured her. Somehow, the words both relieved her and made her miserable. She crawled into the bed and let Ben tuck her in like she was an errant child. Perhaps she was, Kitty ruefully reflected. Chapter 16 Anne and Michael I just got off the phone, and Fenley says the triplets are doing well. Anne mentioned as she slipped off her shoes with a sigh. Aubrey's over the sniffles, and Isabella has been fever-free for two days now. Emma is still perfectly fine. I suppose she just had the best immune system out of the three. Amy had a great day with Cece, and is going to sleep with the other kids. Apparently they've built forts. Kelly assures me it's all supervised with the hotel staff. I feel guilty for not helping, especially now that Kelly looks like she's ready to drop that baby at any moment. Michael nodded absently as he tossed his suit jacket over a chair. We are in a lovely hotel for a few days away. Anne sighed as she pulled the pins from her hair and sat on the bed. Is it bad that all I want to do is sleep? Michael sat on the bed beside her. He put a hand to her forehead. Anne rolled her eyes and gently pushed his hand away. I'm fine. Amy and I got sick and recovered first, remember? Michael gave her an unconvinced look. What? She raised an eyebrow, knowing he had something more on his mind. Pausing a moment in uncertainty, Michael took a deep breath and got up. Grabbing his suit jacket, he pulled a scrap of cardboard out of the pocket and raised an eyebrow of his own. Frowning, Anne got up to look at the shiny packaging. Gasping, she looked at him in horror. No, absolutely not! Michael shot her a relieved look. It's not that I don't love our girls, began Anne. I just don't think we can cope with another after the triplets. Where did you even find that? With a motion of his hand, Michael answered her. Noah? Anne was a little confused. I thought he and Elle couldn't have any more kids. Michael nodded patiently, waiting for her to understand. If it's not Els, Anne thought as she spoke, it has to be someone who was in their room last night, when all of us were there altering Kelly's dress. Obviously it's not Kelly. She's ready to have a baby any moment. I'm surprised Dylan even allowed her to travel. She's days overdue. Seeing Michael's slightly alarmed look, Anne laughed. Kelly says she carried Bentley for two extra weeks, and this baby's small, so there's nothing to worry about. Anne leaned her head on Michael's shoulder, and he wrapped an arm around her. She thought for a moment before asking, Did you want to try again, for a boy? Michael shook his head. No. Anne had a smile at his rusty voice. It was rare that her husband talked with his speech aphasia. It was even more rare when he did say something he managed to have the right words. I know we said the triplets would be the last pregnancy. I just want you to be happy. And if you did want to try one last time, no. Michael put a finger against her lips and with a few hand gestures reminded her of how unhappy and unwell Anne had been during her last pregnancy. No more, agreed Anne as she leaned against him. Michael pulled her closer and pressed a kiss to her hair. She sighed wearily. We are getting old. He had a huff of laughter. You know they're going to be running soon, warned Anne. Three of them, running, going through the terrible twos, and eventually turning into teenagers. Oh dear, what were we thinking, having children so late in life? I'm going to reach retirement age by the time the triplets are in college, and here I'm being silly and offering to go through it all again. I blame the lack of sleep. Michael nodded in agreement and stifled a yawn. Maybe if they just slept through the night instead of waking each other up, sighed Anne, her eyes dragging close. She didn't know how much time had passed. Her head drooping when suddenly she jerked awake. 
Patting Michael on the chest, she woke him up as well. My dress, would you undo the zipper for me? She turned, and Michael obediently unzipped the offending garment. We were both just sleeping while sitting upright. Anne shook her head. Maybe we should get a nanny. Michael gave her a surprised look as he undid his cufflinks. I know what I said before, huffed Anne as she made her way to the washroom to change into more comfortable nightwear. However, now Amy's in school full time. It's three against two, which isn't fair. I think the triplets are winning. Michael let her continue listing reasons for and against the idea as he changed into comfortable sweatpants and a tee. He unwrapped his watch from his hand, setting it on the bedside table beside his cell phone. Turning back the covers, he switched the lights off except for one table lamp. Anne sighed, returning to the room. Once we have a full night of sleep, we can figure this out. We shouldn't make decisions when we're exhausted. Both of them climbed into the bed. Michael shut off the light as Anne cuddled up to him. Five minutes later, Anne reached over him to turn on the bedside lamp. Maybe we should call Fenley again, just to make sure the babies are okay. Or we could make a quick drive home. We could be back before tomorrow's activities. Michael gave her a slightly exasperated look. I know what I agreed to, grumbled Anne. I know I said I wanted a night away, and I knew I would worry about the babies, but I wanted to stay overnight for the weekend. I know Fenley promised to take the best care of them with her sister, and we'll see them Monday for Christmas. However, I'm not rational where our children are concerned. Michael pointed to his watch, noting the time. Fine, pouted Anne. She shut off the light before laying her head on his chest again. Anne sighed in the dark. With a grimace, Michael tapped Anne on the shoulder so she would look at him. He reached over to the bedside table and switched on the lamp. Raising a finger, he grabbed his cell phone and put it in her hands. I will take that compromise, decided Anne as she dialed Fen Lee again to check on their girls. Michael gave her a kiss on the temple and settled in for what was bound to be a long chat with their housekeeper. Cora Cora jerked awake, the pounding of her heart beating in her ears. Lying as still as she could on the bed, she let her quickened breathing slow before carefully reaching out beside her. No one was there. Closing her eyes in relief, Cora relaxed. It was just a bad dream. She had woken from the nightmare. It would be okay. Hunger gnawed at her. Really? Cora looked at the clock on the bedstand. It's the middle of the night, and you want a snack. Rolling her eyes, she turned on the light and got out of bed. Finding the hotel robe, she wrapped it around her, tightening the belt over her burgeoning belly. Absently rubbing her abdomen, Cora peeked through the door into the adjoining room. Nick and Oliver were fast asleep. Oliver had one arm hanging over the side of the bed. Pulling the door so there was only a small gap, Cora looked at the time again. It was too late to call room service. She sighed as she remembered there was nothing much in the mini-fridge. Perhaps a couple of juice boxes were in there. Her sons had already devoured what extra snacks she had brought along. Grabbing her purse and careful of the brace on her wrist, Cora found some change out of her wallet. She didn't want to jar the bone and set it to throbbing again. When all else fails, try the vending machines, Cora thought with some satisfaction as she counted the coins. Tucking the room keycard and change into her robe pocket, Cora gently closed the door after her. Which side of the hall was the vending machine on? Guessing, Cora turned left and headed down the corridor. She rubbed her protesting stomach. Yes, yes, I will get you fed. Really, this baby was demanding. Then again, it had been ten years since Oliver and twelve since Nick. Maybe she just didn't remember what it was like to be pregnant. Cora had no idea what she was going to name her third son. This time, the decision was all hers. Nate wasn't here to tell her. Nate was gone. Cora took a deep, steadying breath. First the food, then the sleep. The name would come when it was time. She had three months to figure it out. Coming to the end of the hall, Cora found Henry standing at the vending machine. He was wearing socks, sweatpants, and a t-shirt. 
there is no coffee, murmured Henry. Not in the lobby and not in the halls. What about the coffee maker in your room? questioned Cora, raising an eyebrow. Broken, answered Henry. Where are you up? Ice cream, preferably pecan chocolate caramel cluster. Cora tipped her head to the side. Since there is none to be found, I have chosen to substitute chips or candy bars. We should just go raid the kitchen, mused Henry. We're not in a house, chided Cora. We're at a hotel. A hotel owned by my family, mentioned Henry. I'm raiding the kitchen. Are you coming with me? There may be ice cream. Cora eyed the vending machine. None of the options looked impressive, and she was truly craving ice cream. Impulsively, she made a decision. I'm in, but if we get caught, I will blame you. Deal, agreed Henry. They made their way to the elevators. Why do you need coffee in the middle of the night? wondered Cora. One would think it would be counterintuitive. I just had an overseas meeting. Henry touched the button, which would lead them to the lobby. I thought I would finish up some paperwork. My sleep schedule is still messed up. Probably from all the coffee, murmured Cora. Funny, remarked Henry, not taking any offense at her little verbal jab. They got off at the lobby, and Henry led her toward the back end of the hotel. I know it's really none of my business, began Cora before hesitating. Henry pressed a code into the buttons at the security door. Opening it, he allowed Cora to precede him. What would you like to know? How long are you staying? she asked curiously. Henry had come home for Nate's funeral. She was surprised he had not gone back overseas where he managed a chain of Ramsley hotels. Indefinitely, answered Henry, shutting the door behind them. I'm transferring the last of my duties to my managers in Asia tonight, hence the need for coffee. You're home for good, then? Cora wasn't certain how to feel about it. She hadn't expected Henry to return permanently. Cora supposed it was a good thing. He had been away for years, since a little after she and his brother Nate had married. Henry had come home for different occasions and regularly spoke by video call to her sons on a weekly basis, playing games over the computer with them and Ben, but it wasn't the same. Henry had been missing from their lives for a long time. I think we're violating a few health codes, casually mentioned Henry as he opened a fridge in the spotless kitchen. Cora found a couple of stools, putting them near the butcher's block island. Henry was deliberately not saying something. She knew this by the sudden change in subject and the set of his shoulders. She knew so much about him, and yet not as much as she used to. Cora supposed everyone should be allowed their secrets. She had her own share of them, her conscience reminded her. Henry had been friends with her in college. She had been a couple of grades younger. They had shared a class and done some group projects together. Eventually, they had shared a lot of time together as friends. Finding out Cora had no family, Henry had invited her home for Thanksgiving. She had met charming, witty Nate Ramsley, who had dazzled her. Popular Nate, who lavished attention on her. Cora had been swept away in what seemed like a fairy tale. A little over a year later, and she had wed her prince. She had the family she always wanted. Cora belonged to someone. She had thought she would be happy. Henry pulled out a container of ice cream, setting it on the butcher's block. It's not pecan chocolate caramel cluster. What is it? Cora found a pair of spoons and a couple of bowls. She offered Henry a spoon, which he took. Rocky Road. Henry peeled off the lid, ladling out a good portion in the bowls. We always have some on hand for the kids. It will work, decided Cora, as she sat down on the stool. She dipped her spoon into the ice cream, then closed her eyes as she tasted it. This is good. Henry put the larger container back in the freezer, before starting a pot of coffee. He sat down on the stool beside her, reaching out with the spoon and trying the ice cream. Not bad. It was hitting the spot, Cora decided. She licked her spoon, then went for another dip in the bowl. This is exactly what I was looking for. They ate in companionable silence until Henry broke it. How were the boys doing? The ice cream turned sour in her mouth. 
Cora managed to eat what was left on her spoon before setting it down. Nick is angry. Oliver's emotions range depending on the day. He has nightmares sometimes. I've decided to take them to counseling. Cora neglected to mention she had nightmares, too. Nate running in the street. Nate stumbling, falling, and not breathing. The pain in her broken wrist. Nate angry and... Breathe, Cora ordered herself. She pulled her thoughts back into order and listened to what Henry was saying. A good idea. If you'd like, I can spend some time with the boys, offered Henry. I expect I'll be available more often now. Nate had died a little less than a month ago. If anything, Henry should have more work to do now the siblings had to cover Nate's job as well as their own. If he were coming back home full time, would he still be helping Garrett and Addison with the family business? I expect the boys would like to be able to see you regularly in person rather than over a screen. How are you going to have more time, though? Henry hesitated before confiding. I'm retiring. Retiring? frowned Cora. He wasn't that much older than her. You're not old enough to retire. Says who? remarked Henry, as he had another spoonful of ice cream. I don't know, huffed Cora. Everyone? I've decided to retire, shrugged Henry, not meeting her eyes. Why? softly asked Cora. She waited in silence for an answer. Raising two boys, she had found that just waiting out an uncomfortable silence would often yield results in getting answers. Cora had a lot of patience. Too much, sometimes. Henry sighed. I have yet to tell the family, but my health isn't very good. I have another appointment with a heart specialist next week. Nate had died of a heart attack. Breathe, Cora told herself. Just breathe. Henry saw her distress. He took her hand in his, giving it a reassuring squeeze. I'm retiring, because even if things go well with treatments, the doctors have told me I need less stress. I guess I'll just need a hobby of some sort. Is it genetic? she wondered. It's possible, but unlikely. Aloud, Henry. You should have the boys checked at their next doctor appointments. You're going to be okay, though. Fear crept into her voice. Now she was worried about her sons, Ben and Addison. Not Garrett, though. As far as Cora was concerned, Garrett could deal with whatever came his way. Yet what if one of the others also had the same condition Henry did? I'm doing everything I can to make sure I come through this, he told her. It didn't answer the question. Cora swallowed thickly. Boy or a girl, softly questioned Henry. Cora looked at him in confusion. Henry gestured to her abdomen, where she had placed her other hand protectively over. Her hand had smoothed down the fabric of her robe, showing the evidence. There really was no hiding the pregnancy anymore. It was growing too big, despite the loose blouses she tended to wear. He's a boy. Why haven't you told anyone? He gently asked. I suppose I just wanted to keep it to myself a little longer, admitted Cora. Do the boys know? wondered Henry. Cora nodded. Yes, they're looking forward to having a little brother. Good, responded Henry with a nod. I'm glad you have this reminder of Nate. This baby wasn't a reminder of Nate. It was Nate who had wanted to. Breathe. Cora tried not to choke as she inhaled. She tried to breathe evenly and failed. Tried to control her thoughts. Nate was gone. Now if only his ghost would stop haunting her. Cora? questioned Henry, sensing her change of mood. Cora's mind brought forward unwelcome images of the last argument she had with Nate. Him yelling at her to take care of the problem or he would. Nate advancing on her with that look in his eyes. Blindly, Cora yanked her hand out of Henry's, standing and accidentally upsetting the stool so it fell on its side to the floor. Cora, what is wrong? Concerned Henry asked her, rising to his feet. I need to check on Nick and Oliver, lied Cora in a trembling voice, her mind in a panicking swirl. I will walk you to their room, said Henry. No, it's not necessary, managed Cora. Just breathe. In and out. Henry didn't know. It wasn't his fault. 
I think it is necessary, he insisted. Henry touched her elbow, and Cora flinched. Cora? She turned away, to flee toward the door, but nearly tripped over the fallen stool. Henry grabbed her in time to prevent her fall, pulling her into his arms. A gasping sob escaped her. Cora held herself rigid, her fingers grasping the fabric of his shirt even as she twisted and pushed away. It's okay, Cora. Henry spoke in a low, gentle tone. He held her, one hand along her back, the other along the nape of her neck. It's okay. I promise you're safe. Safe. Cora tried to concentrate on the word. She was safe with Henry. The tears came. Cora sagged against Henry as she cried. He simply held her until all her tears were spent. Cora drew in a watery breath. She was safe. Cora kept her eyes closed, reveling in the sensation of being simply held and okay. Do you want to talk about what just happened? asked Henry after a while, his quiet voice near her ear. No, whispered Cora. Cora, I think we should talk, gently insisted Henry. It's just the hormones, she lied. Please forget about it. It's embarrassing. Henry hesitated, yet reluctantly respected her decision. Okay. Can we stay like this for a little while longer? she asked, listening to his steady breathing. As long as you need, promised Henry. She was safe with Henry, Cora reminded herself as she relaxed against him. She had always been safe with him. It was something Cora wished she had realized so many years ago. Safety and friendship were something to be prized over charm and dazzle. I missed you. I'm right here now, he responded, slowly rubbing her back in a comforting circle. Where are you staying? The words popped out before she realized she had spoken. Here at the hotel, revealed Henry. It works for now. The short-term rental market is a little crazy, and I'm not sure if I want to buy real estate when I might have to go across the country for treatment. Cora hesitated. You can stay with me. The boys would love to have you, and we have a guest room available. Cora, you don't have to offer to let me stay with you, noted Henry. I appreciate it, but I don't want to impose. You wouldn't be imposing, asserted Cora. Now that she thought about it, having Henry stay was a bad idea. What if she had another episode? Yet she couldn't renege on the offer now she had made it. Besides, Henry needed someone to look after him, especially with his health. She had the feeling it was worse than what he was letting on. And you cook better than I do. Henry had a laugh. I make breakfast. That's all I can cook. I can't boil an egg, joshed Cora in an unsteady voice, wiping her eyes and pulling away from him. If you agree to make breakfast on a semi-regular basis, you can have the guest room rent-free. Generous offer, smiled Henry. I won't take no for an answer, declared Cora firmly. She would just have to be careful around him. She had been careful around Nate all these years. Cora could manage Henry. Henry and Nate were nothing like each other. Plus, Nick and Oliver would like to have Henry around. He was their second favorite person besides Ben. Okay, agreed Henry, temporarily. If I stay too long, make sure you kick me out. I can do that, nodded Cora. She had a deep breath and let out a startled, oh. What is it? asked Henry in concern. Are you okay? It's the baby. Cora laid a hand on her abdomen. The baby was small, and she didn't look as far along as she was. The doctor had expressed concern about it, yet despite the baby's size, he seemed healthy according to the scan she had undergone this past month. It was a relief. Cora had a smile, then grabbed Henry's hand, pressing it against the side of her tummy. He's kicking. He thinks he's going to be a soccer star or something. Wow. Henry paused, waiting. A moment later, he was rewarded. I can feel him. That's some kick. Cora grinned. I'm so happy. Happy he's healthy and loved. Those are the two most important things, agreed Henry. They are, echoed Cora, as sadness enveloped her and the moment was lost. She cleared her throat and picked up their bowls, putting them in the sink. We should get back to our rooms. I need to check on the boys. Okay, Henry agreed. 
He righted the stool, going ahead of Cora to get the door open for her. Since they were on the same floor, Henry walked with her, careful to give Cora her space, but keeping an eye on her. Once they made it to their floor, he didn't suggest he walk her to her room, but bid her good night at the elevator. Cora was grateful for his restraint. She gave him a weary smile and walked away. Once in her rooms, she checked through the connecting door on Nick and Oliver, who were still sleeping, oblivious to everything around them. Cora settled the blanket over Oliver, before returning to her own bed, to spend the rest of the night in a sleepless state. Chapter 17 Sunday, the day of Christmas Eve Dylan Kelly's dress and slip were still laying on the hotel bed. Dylan frowned as he looked at his watch. Time was steadily ticking by, and they were due in the ballroom for a Sunday morning church service with the rest of the family. Caden? Yeah? Caden's voice came from the other room, through the half-open door. Is everyone dressed and ready? asked Dylan, checking to see if his tie was straight in the mirror. Yes, we're watching television and waiting for you, replied Caden. We are going to be late, muttered Dylan, eyeing the dress on the bed. Approaching the bathroom door, Dylan knocked on it. Kelly, we need to get going soon. I don't think we are going to church today. Kelly's voice was shaky. Opening the door, Dylan found a pale Kelly sitting on the edge of the tub in her nightgown, holding on to her distended stomach with one hand. Kel? I'm fine. Kelly gave a brave smile that didn't reach her eyes. I might be in labor. For a moment... Dylan froze. He dragged in a breath and reminded himself he and Kelly had figured out a plan. All he had to do was stick to it and not panic. Okay, I'll grab the bag and let Josh know. Car or ambulance? Car, chose Kelly as she grimaced and rubbed her abdomen. And grab the hotel robe. It'll be warm enough with the weather. I don't want my coat. Plus, I need my shoes. Dylan hurried to grab the robe and shoes. Setting the robe across Kelly's thigh and the shoes on the ground, Dylan gave her a quick kiss. You work on the robe, I will tell Josh. Do not attempt the shoes. We don't want a repeat of last time. Last time was funny. Kelly had a half smile at the memory. Yes, but not now. Dylan gave her hand a squeeze before going to the connecting room where the boys and Cece were watching television. Josh, you're in charge. You all need to shut off the television and go down to service. If anyone asks, your mom is having the baby. Really? Awesome! Can we come to the hospital? Yes, I wouldn't call it awesome. No, absolutely not. You're all better off here at the hotel. Dylan answered their questions. I will call once Jackson is born. Until then, order room service, play with the other kids, obey Josh, and if we're not back by tonight, go to bed no more than an hour after bedtime. Cool, grinned Avery. And no gorging on junk, added Dylan hastily. I'm going to go help your mom. Congratulations, Mr. Ramsley, beamed Cece. Thanks, nodded Dylan before retreating back to Kelly. As he left the room, he could already hear Josh telling the kids to shut off the television and grab their suit jackets. Thank goodness for the 16-year-old. Kelly's brother would keep the boys in line. Not that Dylan was worried about Caden or Cece, but Avery and Bentley could be a handful at times. Okay, everything is settled. Dylan crouched down in front of the now-robed Kelly to help her into her shoes. All we need to do is get to the hospital. Dylan, whispered Kelly. Yes? He stopped tying a shoelace, his stomach bottoming out at her pained expression. I revised my earlier plan, winced Kelly. I think the ambulance might be a better call. This baby's coming faster than Bentley did. Okay? Dylan tried to keep the worry out of his voice and failed. I'll call them. They can come to the room. That way you won't even have to move. Good idea, nodded a relieved Kelly. Just how long have you been having contractions? Wondered Dylan as he used his cell phone to call emergency services. I didn't want to wake you, confessed Kelly. They could have been the false contractions like last time. How long, how far apart, questioned a concerned Dylan. Since midnight? shrugged Kelly. I don't have a watch, and I left my cell phone in the nightstand, so I'm not timing them. Kelly, groaned Dylan. We talked about the cell phone and how you should always have it on you. We did, but you were sleeping so nicely, explained Kelly. I thought the contractions might go away. 
I was really hoping Jackson would be a Christmas baby. Yes, yes, we need an ambulance. Dylan was distracted by the phone as emergency services came on the line. My wife is having our baby. Kelly sucked in a breath, doubling over for a particularly nasty contraction. They might want to hurry. Dylan relayed the instructions as he began timing Kelly's pains. Where are Dylan and Kelly? wondered Max as he looked around the private room of the restaurant. It was after service, and everyone had gathered for coffee, tea, and a light luncheon. Don't know, frowned Jake. Would have thought they would be here. Dylan's usually bugging us to come to church. It's not like him to miss it. The kids were here, mentioned Sterling. I know I saw them. Then they must be around somewhere, suggested Paget. Or maybe Kelly wasn't feeling well and decided to skip service. They have gone to the hospital, inserted Anne as she stirred her tea. I overheard Cece and Amy talking. Apparently, Jackson has decided to join the Ramsley family. Do you think he'll be a Christmas baby? asked a delighted Max. For Kelly's sake, I hope he comes today on Christmas Eve, Paget said dryly as she selected a bagel. Is that Kepler? questioned Jake as he tried to look around a waiter. What is he doing here? Max sighed. He wants our passports. What? A shock Sterling asked in disbelief. He can't do that. People are going on their honeymoons. That's what he told Gabe, shrugged Max. If I could have everyone's attention, announced Kepler from the front of the room. He taped a paper to the wall. I have a court order. You can all take pictures of it to send to your lawyers. It states that I can confiscate your passports. I expect all of you to meet me in Ballroom C in exactly twenty minutes to surrender your passports. Anyone who decides to withhold theirs will face legal action. Good day. As Kepler strode from the room, Jake abruptly stood, going straight for the paper taped to the wall. Pulling it free, he began to peruse the document. Is Kepler really able to take our passports? questioned Sterling as she came beside her husband. According to this document, he can. Bit off Jake. He shook his head. The good news is, you and I are planning on staying in country anyways. Bad news is, I'm pretty certain Gabe, Parker, and Marshall had all planned out-of-country trips. Not the best news of the day, grimaced Marshall as Jake handed the document to him. He gave it a brief look over before handing it to the next Ramsley waiting to have a look at the court order. Seems to have put a damper on the weekend. No kidding, sighed Sterling. Kepler has impeccable timing. Guess we had better find our passports. Jake put an arm around Sterling. It didn't take long for the room to empty, as everyone went to gather the requested passports. Twenty minutes later, most had gathered inside Ballroom C, where the FBI agent was impatiently waiting. This is ridiculous, groused Parker, as he reluctantly handed over his passport to Kepler. I have travel plans. It's a court order, curtly replied Kepler as he accepted the government identification. I'm sure you can afford to reschedule the honeymoon. When are you going to stop harassing us, Kepler? questioned Jake as he gave up his passport. Is it even possible for you to take our passports when you haven't charged any of us with a crime yet? Again, court order, repeated Kepler. I'm going to talk to my lawyer about this, threatened Jake. If you have a complaint to make, you can write it down for me, and I will make certain it gets to the appropriate person, murmured Kepler as he stared down Jake. Next. Henry put a hand on Jake's shoulder, hoping to de-escalate his cousin's temper. He is just doing his job. Speaking of his job, has he made any headway in his investigation, or are we just going to have our accounts frozen until all our businesses fold? Question an unamused Noah with an edge to his voice. Kepler took Henry's passport and ignored Noah. Michael, your passport? Wait a minute, inserted Max, defending his brother. Michael has been cleared. He's no longer any part of your investigation. Michael frowned at Kepler as Anne slipped her arm through his, leaning close to him. That isn't entirely true. While he has been cleared of any drug trafficking charges, 
It is yet to be determined if he had any knowledge or involvement in laundering the proceeds of the drug trafficking. A satisfied Kepler stated, I still want his passport. Really, Bill? Tutted an annoyed Bree. Is it truly necessary? Yes, replied Kepler, as he took his cell phone out of his pocket and noted a message. He returned the phone to his suit pocket and looked at the Ramsley family. This isn't just about the investigation of money laundering and drug smuggling. As of two days ago, murder has been added to the list of crimes the Ramsleys are involved in. Murder? questioned Everett in surprise. David Ramsley has died in hospital after being transferred there from prison, announced Kepler. The autopsy results have indicated it's a homicide. What? He is kidding, right? Uncle David was murdered? I thought he just went to the hospital for a heart issue. Voices murmured over one another as they took in the news. You didn't notify Mom, noted Noah with a glare at the FBI agent. She would have told us. She isn't his widow, pointed out Kepler. Technically, David was already legally married before he illegally wed your mother, Rachel. Now, I'm in charge of finding David's murderer. I will be questioning you and your brothers, including all of David's sons. Where is Molson Colburn, anyways? Molson had nothing to do with David, defended Drew. He has barely even seen the guy. Yet he went to great lengths to defy his father and get him arrested, mused Kepler. Molson must really hate David. A lot of people hate David, responded Drew. As law enforcement, you and I both understand hate does not make someone a killer. Molson is a doctor. He helps people. If you would do your job properly, you would already know that. Do his job? scoffed Noah. Agent Kepler does not have a clue how to properly do his job. That's why he keeps targeting innocent people. Kepler flushed red in anger, his icy blue eyes blazing. He was about to reply when a passport was waved in front of him. I think Kepler knows exactly what he is about, a grim Gabe said as he gave Kepler his passport. I think he's just waiting for the wrong person to make a move, then he'll pounce like a cat. You didn't tell them I wanted their passports, noted Kepler as he took the government identification and put it with the rest he was accumulating. Gabe shrugged. I don't play head games. However, I wish you luck with yours if you manage to catch the guilty persons. Perhaps you'd like to say something which might further the investigation? An intrigued Kepler asked. I have nothing to tell you, answered Gabe. He turned away, walking toward Garrett as Michael handed over his and Anne's passports to the FBI agent. Gabe brushed shoulders with Garrett, stopping. In a low voice, he murmured, if you ever step foot in one of Parker's hospitals again, I will send the security footage of you stealing drugs to Kepler. I look a lot like you, Gabe, pointed out Garrett in a soft voice, entirely unconcerned. Are you sure you want to give him the video? Kepler might think you're outing yourself. I'm covering for you this time because you are family, warned Gabe. Next time, I won't. I will remember it, murmured Garrett, looking at Gabe with irritated eyes. Perhaps you might ask if I had a valid reason for my behavior. Don't worry, it won't happen again. See that it doesn't, remarked Gabe before returning to Brittany's side and wrapping an arm around her. Should we give your cousins our condolences on the death of their father? wondered Brittany. Not exactly sure. It's not like he was a great father to them muttered Gabe. He frowned as the door opened to the conference room. This room is for the Ramsley family only, a peeved Kepler conveyed as a man entered, closing the door behind himself. You need to leave. Chapter 18 Lincoln Waters What is Lincoln Waters doing here? snarled Garrett. He isn't even allowed on the property. I need everyone to remain calm, stated Lincoln, raising his hands to get their attention. I'm conducting an investigation, an irritated Kepler told him. Whatever you need to say to the Ramsleys can wait for a more appropriate time. If everyone remains calm, then some of you will live, 
promised Lincoln, as he lifted the side of his ill-fitting blazer so everyone could see the bomb strapped to a vest which covered his white linen shirt. Be quiet and listen carefully. There were gasps around the room. Mr. Waters, you don't want to do this. A deceptively calm Kepler spoke. You and I can go into the hall to discuss this. Or better yet, you can let these people go and have our conversation right here. No. Lincoln shook his head. Everyone needs to be here. If one person leaves this room without my permission, I blow us all to bits. What do you want, Mr. Waters? Questioned Kepler, holding his hands up so Lincoln could see he had nothing in them. I'm sure we can come to some sort of resolution. I want you to obey instructions and take a step back, warned Lincoln. Kepler took a small step back. See, I did what you said. You're in control of the situation, Mr. Waters. Tell us how to help you. Everyone needs to calm down, said Lincoln, his hands moving in agitation as he spoke. Just be quiet. Ladies, to the back of the room. No one near the exits. Everyone in the room shuffled to do as he had instructed. Do you have any demands? questioned Kepler. I can get the FBI on the phone in a moment and let them know that you're willing to negotiate despite the bomb strapped to you. Shut up, growled Lincoln. He took a deep breath to try to calm down. Someone get Agent Kepler under control before I have to do something about him. Max and Drew both stepped forward, pulling Kepler back toward the group. Kepler turned to face them, whispering, we need to find a way to get him to talk. He's talking just fine, said Drew with a wary eye on Lincoln. Who is he? Lincoln Waters, supplied Henry. He's in direct competition with the hotel industry to the Ramsley Hotel chain. The last time I saw him was during Nate's funeral, and he seemed friendly enough. I have no idea what he's doing here, or what he thinks he is doing. I want... Everyone to give up their cell phones. Lincoln pulled a bag out of the ill-fitting blazer's pocket. Dylan Ramsley can collect your cell phones. If anyone decides to be a hero and keep their phone, they're not going to make it out of this room. Kepler was about to speak again, but Henry put a restraining hand on his arm. Dylan is at the hospital with Kelly. She's having the baby, explained a calm Henry as he stepped forward from the group. He held out a hand. If you give me the bag, I will collect the phones for you. Lincoln hesitated a moment. His eyes darted around the room before shoving the bag at Henry. Okay, okay, you can collect them. Henry nodded. Thanks, Lincoln. You thanked him? whispered a confused Noah to Henry as his phone was confiscated. It's a good thing. Build a rapport with him, encouraged Drew. Maybe you can reach him. I'll try, grimly promised Henry, as he took Drew's phone, placing it in the bag. He continued to move around the room. Mr. Waters, we are cooperating with you, interrupted Kepler. As a gesture of goodwill, you could let one of the hostages go. There's no need to set that bomb off. Are you trying to get us all killed? hissed Drew as Kepler dropped his phone into the sack. Negotiations 101, started Kepler before he was interrupted. Bree Henson, she can leave, decided Lincoln, his eyes darting around the room. So can any unmarried woman who gives up their phone. I don't want to leave, protested Bree, holding on to Everett's arm. Bree, warned Everett. He whispered something in her ear. Now go. Take Kitty with you. Ben took Kitty's hand, pulling her over to Bree. Ben? A wide-eyed Kitty looked back at him, as Bree took her by the arm, dragging her towards the doors. Not you. You must stay. Lincoln pointed to Cora, who abruptly stopped, looking at Lincoln like a deer caught in the headlights. You married a Ramsley. You stay. Come here, Cora. Anne put an arm around Cora, drawing her towards the back of the room. Drew, 
Bethany had made her way through the crowd, coming to take his hand. Listen to me. Drew brought her closer, whispering in her ear. Go to the front desk. Have them call the police. Have them evacuate the building. I love you. She nodded and took a deep breath before heading for the doors. Mr. Waters, surely there is something we can do to come to a resolution, began Kepler before he was stopped by Lincoln. Agent Kepler, if you interrupt me again, you won't get out of this room alive, warned Lincoln. Do you have all the phones yet? Here are the phones, Lincoln. Henry held out the bag. I collected all of them, just as you asked. Fine. Henry grabbed the bag, tossing it onto the floor beside him. Now what? A cautious Henry asked. Everyone signs the paper, said Lincoln as he pulled a folded sheet of paper out of the other pocket of the blazer. Take that paper and make sure everyone signs it. What is it? asked Jake. It doesn't matter what it is, just sign it, ordered Lincoln. It's okay, coached Henry as he held out his hand. Just give me the paper and I'll get this done for you. Lincoln handed over the paper, and Henry began rotating amongst the group. It looks like the last page on a contract, frowned Noah. Contracts are not legal when signed under duress, noted Jake as he scrawled something illegible across the paper. It will be thrown out of any court. While the group murmured complaints, Drew pulled Kepler closer, taking advantage of the distraction. Any experience with bombs? questioned Drew in a quiet voice. None, muttered the FBI agent. What about you? Two months with the bomb squad, grimly replied Drew. Two months, repeated Kepler, shooting Drew an inquiring look. Long enough to realize I wasn't really grasping the basics, and I didn't want to lose my fingers or worse, revealed Drew. Are we saying our most experienced person in this room with explosives is Max Ramsley? An incredulous Kepler asked. Yep sighed Drew. I will wait for the experts to arrive, decided Kepler. The hostage negotiator and bomb squad will be on their way. Do you think they're going to get here on time? inserted Max from behind them. As long as we let Waters think he is in control of the situation, we have time, answered an irritated Kepler. No one makes any sudden moves. He isn't in control, a grim Drew observed. He's sweating, trembling, and his voice is shaking. I would be too if I had a bomb strapped to me, noted Max dryly, as he watched Lincoln wipe his forehead on his sleeve. If he isn't in control, then who is? Kepler narrowed his eyes as he studied Lincoln. Is that an earpiece or a hearing aid? An earpiece, decided Drew with a frown. Someone is feeding him what to say. If that's the case, he might just be as much of a hostage as we are, commented Max. How do you negotiate in this situation? We don't, warned Kepler. If our hypothesis is true, the real perpetrator is removed from the situation and their life isn't on the line. They intend to remain anonymous. In all likelihood, they'll complete their mission. If I could block the wireless signal, can you guys disable the bomb? softly questioned Ben as he stepped up to join the small group of men. Waters has a detonator in his hand, a wry Kepler pointed out. It's a fake, asserted Ben. There's no wireless signal coming from it and no cord. The entire thing is controlled from a cell phone, which is located under his right arm. How did you know where the cell phone is? wondered Drew. I saw it when he lifted his blazer to show the room the bomb, shrugged Ben. You're absolutely certain there's no signal from the detonator? Max tried to get a better look at Lincoln, but Drew put a restraining hand on his shoulder. Positive, said Ben. There's a signal from the phone, though. How do you know? wondered Drew as he glanced at Lincoln, trying to see the hidden phone without looking too suspicious. I have an app that I wrote to look for wireless signals which I can piggyback on for coding if necessary. There is only one wireless signal coming from him. I saw the cell phone. Therefore, the cell phone is the only thing that is sending or receiving signals, observed Ben. It's on a two-second lapse, which means we basically have two seconds to interfere if the real bomber presses the code in his cell phone and hits send. 
Piggyback for coding? Max raised an eyebrow. Ben winced. Probably better you don't know much about it. Especially when it's in a gray area for legalities, warned Kepler. Hey, ever since the incident, I have behaved, defended Ben. I'm squeaky clean. The last thing I need is the FBI, CIA, NSA, or whatever amalgamation of letters deciding my fate. The incident? Question drew to Max. Max shrugged. No idea. I want to know more, though. Irrelevant to our current situation, decided Kepler. Can you block the wireless signal? For a short period of time, Ben carefully showed them his phone, keeping it out of line of the sight of Lincoln. I can jam all the signals in a small grid area, about a 30-foot radius. The problem is my phone doesn't have enough juice to keep it up for long. Keeping your phone was risky, admonished Max. What if he had seen you and blown us up like he threatened to? It was a calculated risk. Plus, I have two phones on hand, so I only gave up one of them. Then, if Henry is questioned, he doesn't have to lie, admitted Ben. I was hoping to hack Water's phone but it would take too long. Jamming the signal is the best I can do on short notice. I'm willing to bet Waters doesn't want to be in this situation any more than we do, inserted Drew, eyeing a nervous Lincoln. I think there's another guy behind all this, and Waters is a pawn. If we can intercept the signal, he will likely help us. It's a risk, murmured Kepler. How long can you intercept the signal? A couple of minutes, answered Ben. He paused with a grimace. Maybe. It's going to drain the battery quickly. There's a serious flaw with this plan, noted Kepler. Just one? asked Drew in disbelief. Two minutes isn't enough time to get a member of the bomb squad on the phone and defuse it, especially if there's any booby traps, explained Kepler. All cell phone signals will be jammed, said Ben. We won't be able to phone anyone within a 30 to 50 feet radius of my phone. No internet, no signals at all. What if we let it blow up? mused Max. Excuse me? frowned Drew. I know you're not the smartest guy, but I think that's the opposite of what we're trying to accomplish here. Ben jams the signal. That gives us two minutes to get Waters out of the bomb vest without anyone dying and dispose of it somewhere safe, suggested Max. Like maybe a dumpster outside the hotel? Something that would contain most of the blast, which would minimize the damage. Provided we know where the nearest dumpster is, and depending on the explosive load, sighed Drew. It might work. All of the Ramsley hotels are set up essentially the same way, advised Ben thoughtfully. There's a housekeeping door off the back alley, which we would be able to access. It's going to be a sprint, but we should be able to make it. If Waters cooperates... If we can get him to the dumpster on time, if we get the vest off, and if we can do it before Ben's phone runs out of battery. Grimace, Kepler. There are too many variables. We don't know for certain if he's acting on his own or with guidance. It's all speculation which could get people killed. What other choice do we have? Questioned Max. We can wait for the experienced professionals to show up, rather than trying to die heroes, said a slightly sarcastic Kepler. I put in a call to the FBI, said the word bomb before giving my phone to Henry. The bomb squad will be here soon with a hostage negotiator. We follow protocol and wait. GPS tracking on your phone, remarked Ben. That's how they know to come here. And I'm on assignment here at the hotel, dryly noted Kepler. What if he isn't working on his own? What if he's being told what to do by someone? Asked Max. I've met Lincoln a few times. He doesn't seem like the type to suddenly strap on a bomb and threaten people. Desperate people do desperate things, muttered Drew as he studied Lincoln. If he's acting on his own, I think he will negotiate. If he isn't acting on his own? Question, Ben. Then negotiating won't do any good, muttered Kepler. However, it's not for us to decide. We wait for the professionals. What if the professionals take too long? mused Ben. He stiffened as the door to the room opened and Addison entered. Oh, no. I found my passport. Addison trailed off as she took in the situation, stopping in surprise when she spotted Lincoln Waters wearing a vest of explosives. Link? He stared at her and swallowed hard. 
His face lost all color. You're not supposed to be here. Addison swayed a little, and Henry came forward, reaching out to steady her. I don't understand. Her voice cracked a little as she looked at Lincoln in confusion. Go stand with Cora at the back of the room, a quiet Henry told her, taking her by the shoulders to tug her toward the others. You will be safer there. This isn't supposed to happen, breathed Lincoln in horror as he stared at Addison. You said she wouldn't be here. You promised she would survive if I did this. He isn't working alone, a grim Drew stated. Or he's suffering a mental episode and is off his meds, muttered an unconvinced Kepler. We should wait. While he argues with the man behind all of this who is deciding whether or not to push the button? An alarmed Max questioned. I can't do this, a shaking Lincoln exclaimed, pulling out the earpiece and letting it fall to the floor. Cut the signal, Ben, growled Drew as he spotted the screen of the cell phone trapped to Lincoln light up. Drew searched forward toward Lincoln. Now! Okay, a slightly panicked Ben pressed buttons on his phone. I got it! Everyone to the back of the room, yelled Kepler to the group of Ramsleys. Someone make sure everyone stays here out of danger while we deal with the situation. You need to keep up! Max grabbed Ben's arm dragging him along with him as they chased after Drew, who was muscling Lincoln out of the door. "'Which way are we going?' demanded Drew. "'Left!' sputtered Ben as he raced along, chasing Max. "'At the end of the hall, take a left for the stairs and head down.' "'Get running, Waters!' ordered Drew as he pulled the man along. "'We're going to get that vest off, but you need to help us.' "'How?' gasped Lincoln as he ran with them. "'I'll do anything. Please get it off.' Do you remember what happened? questioned Drew. This crazy guy with a gun came into my hotel room and put this bomb on me. He told me to follow the directions or Addison would die, responded Lincoln. Stairs, pointed Ben. They burst through the doors, barreling down the stairs. Can you remember how he hooked up the bomb? asked Drew. Was there a specific wire he put together, a clip? I don't know, responded Lincoln as he stumbled on a step before writing himself. The guy made me close my eyes. I had a black sack over my head while he put it on me. This way. Ben pushed through the exit doors as Max pulled the fire alarm. Just in case, spoke Max as he followed them outside. In case what? A worried Lincoln questioned. In case I blow up. It's a possibility. Drew didn't sugarcoat the situation. Oh. A panicked Lincoln continued to run with the group toward the end of the alleyway. Would someone mind telling my wife this wasn't my idea, that I would be there for our future if I could? It's not over yet, advised Max. Here, gasped Ben as they made it to a trio of dumpsters. He flipped open a lid. This one's unlocked. Let me see the vest. Drew pulled the ill-fitting blazer jacket off Lincoln with the man's help, tossing it to the ground as he began tracing wires with his fingertips. Looks a little more complicated than what I use for blasting, murmured Max as he inspected the vest as well. How much time do we have, Ben? At this rate, 35 seconds, maybe 40? Ben eyed his phone. If we pull the cell phone on his vest, would that stop it from blowing up? It's the phone which is going to send the signal to the wires. It could be set to automatically explode if we remove it, muttered Drew. Look here, there's only two wires running at this point. If we can cut the vest, we might have enough room to slip it over waters without having to cut any wires. You have a knife? questioned Kepler as he caught up to them. Ben looked at his phone. Thirty seconds. I have one. Max pulled out a folding blade out of his pocket. Always useful on the construction site. Or at a hotel for the weekend? noted Kepler. I must have put it in my pocket by habit. Shrugged Max as he carefully cut the fabric of the vest trying not to cut Lincoln or the bomb itself. Wait, cautioned Drew. He slipped a hand between Lincoln's torso and the vest, feeling. With a grimace, he slipped his hand back out. Hidden wires. Now what? asked Max. Give me the knife and back away, advised Drew. What? an alarmed Ben asked. All of you, except for bomb guy here, go as far as you can. Put your hands over your head and crouch down facing away from us, 
ordered Drew. Oh, no, breathed Lincoln, closing his eyes and muttering a prayer. He weaved on his feet for a moment. Drew grabbed him by the vest and gave him an abrupt shake. Stay on your feet. A shocked Lincoln nodded and took a deep breath. We should have waited for the bomb squad, grimly said Kepler as he backed away. I'm not letting you do this, a grim Max told Drew. Beth will love me if I have fingers or not. Your wife loves her pretty boy husband, so you should stay handsome and whole. Drew tried to make light of the situation as he took the knife out of Max's hand. Plus, you have two kids. Drew, protested Max to his half-brother. Fifteen seconds, maybe, stated Ben. I can't promise more time. I'm down to three percent battery. Get out of here, warned Drew, as he firmly grasped the knife and clasp which was holding the vest together. Ten. Ben began counting down, laying the phone on the ground and quickly backing away. A helpless Max retreated with Ben. Taking a deep breath, Drew cut. Then he cut again, severing the clasp and a couple more inches of vest. He slashed at the other side, hoping to give Lincoln enough room to wriggle out of the vest. I don't think you have any longer, declared Ben. Phone is going to shut down any second. Help me get it off, Drew ordered Lincoln, who hastily complied. Grabbing the vest, Drew threw it into the dumpster. Turning, he hustled the shaking Lincoln away from the dumpster. Run! Max pulled Ben along by an arm, racing down the alley. They stopped near the doors where they had exited the building earlier. How big of a load do you think the explosives have? Asked Drew as he looked back at the now distant dumpster. We should be safe at this distance, estimated Max. I guess the phone had more juice than I thought, a surprised Ben stated. Thank you, breathed Lincoln, before he crouched down, putting his head in his hands. Thank you. Ben and Drew flinched as the dumpster exploded, the plastic lid and trash flying into the air. I love a good explosion, grinned Max, as the trash burned, some lighter pieces falling slowly through the sky. You're crazy, a grim Drew looked at Max. I always suspected, but this confirms it. You love me anyways, warmly declared Max. You have to. We're brothers. Half-brothers, clarified Drew. That still makes us family, a happy Max informed him. All of the Ramsleys are insane, muttered Kepler as he watched the carnage. Chapter 19 Drew The group of men watched the burning trash for a moment longer, before Drew crouched in front of Lincoln. What do you remember about the guy who put the bomb on you? I don't know, sighed Lincoln. He wiped his eyes. He had one of those black masks which covered his face. He kept waving a gun at me. Then I was told to close my eyes and extend my arms. The next thing I knew, he put the bomb vest on me. He assured me if I would follow directions, Addison would be okay. Why are you so worried about my sister's welfare? A curious Ben asked. Lincoln had an unamused chuckle. With a trembling hand, he pulled out a necklace from under his sweat-soaked shirt. On it were two wedding rings and an engagement ring. I married your sister a little over a year ago. She wanted to keep it quiet, and I agreed to. What? A shocked Ben looked at the rings. Why? She was worried about what her brothers might do when they found out their main competitor had married their sister. Sighed Lincoln. If you hadn't noticed, Garrett's not the friendliest person. Nor was Nate. Honestly? Addison is afraid of them. She was adamant they not know for fear of what they might do. She could have told me, frowned Ben. You're her little brother, explained Lincoln. She tries to protect you. I don't need protecting, asserted Ben. He put a hand down to help Lincoln to his feet. Welcome to the family, I guess. Thanks, nodded Lincoln, rising. Drew straightened as well. This is one messed-up bunch of people. Maybe, shrugged Max, 
I kind of like most of it. Sorry about your dad, mentioned Drew. He was your dad, too, noted Max. Drew shook his head. Not really. He was barely around. David split before Molson was born. This is nice and all, but I need some answers, interrupted Kepler. He shook his head as he watched the dumpster fire. I have two murders, a continuing drug and money laundering scheme, and now I can add an attempted bombing to the list. Two murders? questioned Drew with a frown. Nathaniel Ramsley clarified Kepler. I'm having the body exhumed and an autopsy done. I expect his death may also have been a homicide like David's. Who would want to kill Nate? frowned Max. I noticed you didn't protest that someone might want to kill your father, a dry Kepler said. Dad wasn't exactly the nicest guy around. I'm sure he had enemies, responded Max. Nate was an okay guy, a little overcompetitive, but most people liked him. Lincoln had a bitter laugh. I don't think you knew your cousin very well. Care to clarify? demanded Kepler, his icy eyes focusing on the man. Nate and I had words more than once, sighed Lincoln. He hated me. He had me banned with a no-trespass order. Nate went so far as to threaten my life. He might pour on the charm for those he felt would give him something, be useful to him, but to everyone else he was a complete nightmare. I don't recall anything like that, grimaced Max. He liked you. Nate would do whatever he needed to do to stay in good graces of people he could use to his own advantage. He had an image to maintain, responded Lincoln. For anyone he deemed inferior, they got to see his true nature. Was there security footage at the hospital? Frowned Drew as he thought about what Kepler had revealed about David being murdered. You should be able to get footage of whoever administered the drug to David. It was wiped clean, a disgruntled Kepler replied. Security says they're on the bathroom break, so they didn't see anything. All the staff were interviewed with no leads. Then it's probably someone on staff with access to David, noted Drew. Was the security directly guarding David in his hospital room? Federal inmates usually have escorts. He did have an escort said Kepler shortly, one who states only doctors and nurses went in and out of the room. Look, I don't need you trying to analyze my case. Are you certain the security videos have been swiped? asked Ben. Sometimes there are hidden backup files on the drive that maintain the records. I am certain the technical team sent by the FBI is competent enough to handle checking through the hospital security systems, bit off Kepler. Hey, it might help if you worked with us, interjected Max. I'm sure the family would cooperate if you were a touch less abrasive. We all want this to be over and to go back to our regular lives. I'm an FBI agent, declared Kepler. I'm paid to investigate, not hold hands. It was just a suggestion. Max trailed off at the unamused look Kepler gave him. Hey, I didn't like Dad, but I fully support you finding who killed him. Good. A terse Kepler grabbed his cell phone out, ready to take notes. Where were you between the hours of seven and eleven on Friday evening? Here at the hotel. Max began detailing his day to Kepler. I'm going to take waters to the paramedics to get checked out, Drew told Kepler. I would prefer he remain here until I've interviewed him, an irritated Kepler told Drew. It's just below freezing. The guy is soaked through. Drew didn't back down. You can interview him later. Fine, stated Kepler tersely. However, I want all the Ramsleys and Mr. Waters to remain on site until I can interview everyone. I will let them know, muttered Drew as he, Ben, and Lincoln began walking toward the fire trucks and ambulance which were situated outside the hotel entrance. Are you sure you want to join our family? questioned Ben. We're not exactly at our best lately. Or ever, murmured Drew. I love her, shrugged Lincoln. I'm not going anywhere. Hey, Ben frowned. Why did Nate have a no trespass order against you? Future sales infringement, Lincoln explained, breaking it down so they would understand. Basically, I was accused of scoping out the Ramsley Hotels, 
and the ideas the company had for the future and supposedly using the information for my own competing company to reduce future income for the Ramsley brand. I was caught coming and going from multiple Ramsley hotels and brought to court. Needless to say, I lost, and a no-trespass order was issued. You were scoping out our hotels? asked Ben. No, sighed Lincoln. I was courting Addison on the sly. To get back to the subject at hand, interrupted Drew, the guy who put the bomb on you. You said you didn't see his face. How tall was he? Wait. A little shorter than me, maybe by an inch, said Lincoln as he thought. Not overweight. Did you see the color of his eyes? questioned Drew. Or his skin at all? He was white, replied Lincoln. I don't know about his eyes. Brown? Don't guess. Only say what you're certain of, advised Drew as they came around the building. Fire trucks, police, and an ambulance were making their way into the parking lot. Tell me from the beginning what happened. Lincoln stopped walking and ran a hand over his face. I was in the hotel room. I had ordered room service. There was a knock on the door, and I didn't even look through the people. I just assumed it was lunch. The guy wore black. He had a black ski mask on. He shoved his way into the room. He had a gun. He told me to close my eyes and then put the sack over my head. I was told to extend my arms, and the next thing I knew, he put the bomb vest on me. He told me that if I obeyed instructions, Addison would live. Then he pulled the sack off my head. I was given a list of things that had to be done. He told me to memorize it as he put the earpiece on me. Then I had to repeat the list to him a few times as I put on the blazer. I was told to be in the conference room in exactly 20 minutes, go through the actions on the list, and listen to the voice on the earpiece should anything go sideways. Did he take the list with him? asked Drew. Yeah, he did, nodded Lincoln. Brown. His eyes were brown now that I think about it. Okay, that's good, encouraged Drew. Now, what about his voice? Did he sound like anyone you know? Lincoln paused as he thought about it. He blew out a frustrated sigh. He had a voice thing, some sort of electronic thing that distorted his voice. I feel like there was something there, underneath the electronic voice, that I might know who it is. I just can't quite grasp it. Okay, keep thinking on that, and if it comes to you, let me know replied Drew as he took Lincoln by the arm, leading him to the ambulance. Was he wearing gloves? Leather ones, nodded Lincoln. What was your room number? asked Ben. There are cameras in the halls. We will have video surveillance footage of this guy. 438, supplied Lincoln. Great, I'm going to talk to security, stated Ben before leaving them. Drew left Lincoln with the ambulance crew and advised a uniform of what had taken place. He had just finished giving his statement when he caught sight of Bethany coming towards him. Drew! Bethany launched herself into Drew's arms. She hugged him tightly. Drew held her, breathing in a deep breath, enjoying the scent and feel of her in his arms. We are all okay. No one was hurt. I promise we even have all our fingers and toes. She gave him a half-hearted slap on the arm and had a watery sigh. That isn't funny. Okay. Drew hugged her a little closer. No more jokes. When the explosion happened, a teary Bethany recounted her fear. I was so worried. I was worried, too, admitted Drew softly. But we did okay. I can also promise you I have no intention of ever going near a bomb again. Good. Bethany wiped her eyes with one hand, still clinging to him. "'Has anyone seen Molson or Holly?' questioned Drew, frowning as he looked over the expanding crowd. He would have expected his younger brother to be making snappy remarks about the firemen and police on sight. "'Not since he left Holly with me last night,' mentioned Bethany. "'Holly went to get some clothing from her room and was supposed to meet up with us for breakfast. Then we were interrupted by Agent Kepler.' I suppose she and Molson might have met up to talk about last night. Drew felt unsettled. He had the feeling something was very wrong with his brother. He had learned a long time ago to trust his intuition. I think we should go check on them. The fire alarm is still going off, 
Bethany reminded him. Holly and Molson might just be around the side of the building. Most of the workers and guests of the hotel were crowded together. Drew took Bethany by the hand, leading her through the crowd, looking for his errant brother. He didn't find him. Hey, have you seen a guy with a lot of neck tattoos? Drew asked yet another police officer who shrugged at him. I'm starting to worry, admitted Bethany as she scanned the crowd. Maybe they didn't come out of the building? Perhaps we should check their rooms. There was a fire alarm. A frustrated Drew growled. Even Molson has enough sense to evacuate when an alarm goes off. We should check anyways, insisted Bethany. The fire alarm has been shut off. No one has given the all-clear to go back inside, pointed out Drew. You're a policeman? Bethany raised an eyebrow. Flash your badge. You should stay outside, decided Drew. I'm coming with you, argued Bethany. Beth? sighed Drew as he took both her hands. We don't know what sort of damage the bomb may have done to the building. It looked like it was contained in the dumpster, but I'm not an engineer so I'm not about to take any risk with you. Some madman just tried to blow us all up, countered Bethany. Wouldn't it be safer for me to be right beside you? Fair point, reluctantly allowed Drew. He wrapped an arm around her waist, and they both made their way through the crowd to the lobby of the hotel. Showing his badge, Drew bypassed the firefighters and police. Taking the stairs, Drew led Bethany down the hotel hallway. Wait here a moment, softly stated Drew, as they approached the correct room number. The door was ajar, and he slowly approached it, looking for any movement in the room. Drew halted as he came to the open doorway of Holly's room. His foot rested on a paper, with a multitude of other papers strewn about the floor, bed, and every available surface. Molson was sitting on the floor in the middle of the room, he had a shadeless lamp in one hand, holding a medical film up to it. Molson lowered both items, shoulders slumping. Molson? queried Bethany uncertainly, as she peered around Drew at the mess in the room. Drew gingerly picked his way forward, trying to avoid most of the paperwork. Crouching down next to his brother, he carefully turned off the lamp and gestured to the scan. What is it? Tay Sachs disease, Molson woodenly replied. Patient is three years of age, late diagnosis, treatment standard, and ineffective. I'm not sure I understand, frowned Drew. Why do you have a medical file here? Where is Holly? questioned Bethany. Molson dragged in a breath. Gone. Gone where? asked Bethany as she pushed some of the paperwork out of the way so she could walk into the room. He took her, stated Molson as he stared into space. Tremblay took her and left me the medical file. It's for Isla Marie Tremblay. I'm guessing that is Tremblay's daughter. There was a note attached. It said, save her, save them both. And there was a photo, too. Holly was kidnapped, asked an alarmed Drew. Molson took a Polaroid out of his dress shirt pocket, handing it to Drew without a word. Taken in the hotel room, it showed a lifeless-looking Holly on the bed, with duct tape binding her feet, hands, and mouth. Drew grabbed Molson by the shoulder. You should have called me. How long has she been gone? We can look at the hotel's video surveillance, find out what vehicle they used. We can get her back. You think... The king of the local gangs can't pull off a simple kidnapping and not get away with it? Retorted Molson. Tremblay's not stupid, and he don't make mistakes. The police ain't going to find Holly. Drew set his jaw. I'm still going to make the effort. Abruptly, he got to his feet. Where are you going? Asked a worried Bethany. To talk to hotel security. A terse Drew replied as he exited the room. Bethany carefully cleared some of the papers away from beside Molson, before gently sitting down on the plush carpet. Tell me more about this girl. Elsa? Isla. Clearing his throat, Molson took a deep breath. She has a rare genetic disease. It's bad. There's no cure. 
Her doctors are giving her maybe three to four months to live. Tremblay gave you her file because he thinks you can make a difference, noted an encouraging Bethany. You're smart, Molson. What do you see that the other doctors may have missed? Nothing, shrugged Molson. These docs are top-notch. One of them is a bit of a legend. They all agree the patient isn't going to get better. I don't know why Tremblay put this on me. It's not my specialty. I know the bare basics of that part of the medical field. It doesn't make any sense. I'm just a resident. There has to be a reason why he gave this to you, Bethany assured him. You're smart. If anyone can figure it out, it's you. Drew will do everything he can to find Holly. Between the two of you, I know she'll be okay. I'm not so certain, replied Molson as he put his head in his hands. I'm supposed to protect her. I knew Tremblay was going to ask a return on his favor. I was supposed to make sure it didn't touch Holly, and now she's gone. He took her, and I don't know where she is. She has to be scared, and I totally failed her. Molson Colburn, you look at me right now. Bethany glowered at Molson. She waited for him to look at her with pain-filled eyes before she continued. You are a brilliant doctor. There's something the other doctors have missed. Something Tremblay knew you can do that the others can't. You need to figure it out. Holly is depending on you. There is no one else. You're not going to fail her. You're going to figure this out. Molson took a deep breath and nodded. Okay. All right, I'm going to look over the patient file again. Good, affirmed Bethany agreed. Whatever you need, coffee, food, anything I can do, you let me know. Chapter 20 A Few Hours Earlier Henry Everyone to the back of the room, yelled Kepler to the group of Ramsleys in the conference room. Someone make sure everyone stays out of danger while we deal with the situation. You need to keep up. Max grabbed Ben's arm, dragging him along with him as they chased after Drew, who was muscling Lincoln out the door. Which way are we going? demanded Drew from the hallway. Left, sputtered Ben as he ran along, chasing Max out the door. Everyone stared at the slowly closing doors in shocked silence. What just happened? whispered Addison as she clutched onto Cora. Henry went forward to the hall, just in time to see Kepler make the turn to race down the stairs. He faced back to the room. Everyone out. Go right and to the end of the hall, down the stairs and exit. Make your way to the front of the building, exit the lobby to the front drive. You heard him? Garrett came forward, grabbing the bag of phones and handing it to Noah. Let's go, people. We're evacuating the building. Henry propped open the conference room door as people began to stream out. We have to make sure everyone gets out, Garrett told Henry. Follow the family down and find a staff member with a radio, advised Henry. Hopefully we can keep this low-key and not have a panic. I'll take the left wing. That's where the bomb went, frowned Garrett could be dangerous. I will see the guests on the left side of the hotel, stated Henry, as he ignored Garrett's comment. Just get everyone out. Garrett nodded and began herding the group toward the stairs on the right. Henry, where are you going? questioned Jake. It's all good. Keep going, Henry said over his shoulder as he made his way down the hall. Suddenly, the fire alarm went off, a loud trilling bell filling the hotel. So much for being low-key, muttered Henry as he began banging on doors with a fist. Evacuate the building! A few doors later, Henry met with one of the hotel maids. He stopped her as she made for the elevator. Use the stairs. I need your radio. I'm sorry, she said as she handed over the handheld radio, which had been clipped to her apron. I just started last week. I'm not sure what to do. Henry made a mental note to go over orientation procedures again with the managers. It's okay. Just take the stairs to the first floor, go to the lobby, and exit outside to where a crowd is gathering. Tell anyone you see to come with you, okay? She nodded and went for the stairs. Henry turned on the radio before tapping the elevator buttons to call the cars to the floor. I need all staff to do sweeps to ensure the building is fully evacuated. Top floors down. This isn't a drill. We're doing a full evacuation of the hotel. 
Announce the elevators are out of order. Service elevators only for disabled or elderly guests. The doors opened to an empty elevator. Henry pulled out a key, inserting it into the control box and entering a code to disable the elevator. Going across the hall, he did the same to the other elevator. What's happening? questioned a guest as they came out of their room in a robe. You need to evacuate, replied Henry. Is there anyone in the room with you? No, he frowned. If this is some sort of drill, I'm not happy. Your life is in danger, responded Henry. Please exit the building as quickly and as calmly as you can. Use the stairs. Are you serious? The guest wondered with growing alarm. Yes, confirmed Henry, as he knocked on another door. Evacuate the building. Henry continued along the floor, until he was relieved by hotel staff doing a sweep of the rooms. He listened to the radio as announcements were made as to the status of the sweeps. Fifth floor clean, fourth floor clean, kitchen clean. Henry took the stairs, making his way to the office when he heard the explosion. It was loud. Maybe it was his imagination, but he thought he felt the building shake. Henry paused on the steps, one hand firmly grasping the railing, the other outstretched to keep his balance as he listened for any sound of the building crumbling, or any other telltale noise which would alert him if there was a problem. Silence. There was nothing. Just him, alone in the stairwell. Hurrying, Henry made it to the main floor, heading directly for the office. Did anyone hear that? A voice on the radio questioned with a tinge of fear. All staff, if your sweeps are clear, get out of the building, advised Henry with a steady, calm voice into his radio. He didn't need anyone panicking. Any damage to the building or casualties, report immediately. Garrett, do you have an update? Police, ambulance, and fire have arrived, replied Garrett. I'm herding all guests to the evacuation area. Nearly running now. Henry turned into the main lobby office. Have we printed out the list of employees and guests? The computers are down, one of the employees stated in frustration. I only have a partial list. Out, decided Henry. The safety of the staff and guests were paramount. He had no idea if there had been structural damage from the bomb blast. All of you out right now. Not waiting to hear the staff's answer, he turned and went to the security office. He stopped in shock at the black screens as security member was trying to check cables. What is going on? Why are the screens blank? I don't know. They went off about fifteen minutes before the fire alarm went off, explained the harried man as he continued to push at the wires. I checked the breakers, and I'm checking the connections now, yet nothing appears to be loose. I tried calling Ben to troubleshoot, but his phone keeps going to voicemail. Of course it did reasoned and out of breath Henry. All their phones were in a bag with Noah right now. He doesn't have his phone on him. Do you think it could be a cyber attack? Have we been hacked? questioned the security man. Is it related to the fire alarm? You need to evacuate, decided Henry. Forget about the video feed. We can't tell if the floors are completely clear without the video confirmation, the man said. It's protocol. Not today. Henry grabbed the man's arm to pull him away from the computers. Get out. Make sure the front desk is evacuated on your way. With a reluctant look at the blank monitors, the man nodded and left. Henry had a last look at the black screens and absently rubbed at his heart. His chest was feeling tight. In his opinion, it wasn't a coincidence that this had happened at the same time a bomb threat had occurred. He frowned as he double-checked the breakers, the power buttons, then cables. Can anyone help me? A voice called out. Hello? Henry frowned as he went to the outer office, then to the lobby office. There was a young teenage boy at the front desk, wearing a wet tee, swim trunks, and flip-flops. The hotel has been evacuated. You should be outside with everyone else. Are you looking for your parents? No, I need some help, insisted the teen. We were at the pool. My friend hurt her knee coming out. The rest of the kids went with my Uncle Josh, and I was going to help her get to the lobby, but she really is hurt. Where is the pool staff? questioned Henry as he followed the boy. I guess they helped the rest of the kids get out? shrugged the teen. My name is Caden, by the way. Caden Ramsley. You must be Dylan's son, 
stated Henry in some surprise. "'You're one of the Ramsleys, too,' surmised Caden. "'You look like one of us.' "'I'm Henry, your father's cousin,' he introduced himself. "'Saw you at the wedding, but didn't make the connection.' Caden shrugged. "'Most adults are too busy to see kids, unless they're their own.' "'I thought your father and Kelly were at the hospital,' frowned Henry as they went down the stairs. "'They are,' grinned Caden. "'I'm getting a baby brother. "'Dad said to stay here with Josh. "'He told us he would phone once Jackson was born.' "'Kelly and Dylan are missing all the excitement,' "'mentioned a tear-stained-faced girl, "'approximately the same age as Caden. "'She was sitting at the bottom of the steps, "'wearing a one-piece bathing suit and a towel. "'Even from this angle, "'Henry could see her knee was swollen "'and looked like the kneecap might be displaced. "'I'm Cece.' "'Henry,' he introduced himself. These two kids were both going to freeze outside dressed as they were. Henry took off his long-sleeved dress shirt. He had a tee underneath, so it wasn't an imposition. Here, it's going to be cold outside. Thanks. The girl slipped the shirt over her head and wrapped the towel around her shoulders again. I can't move very well. It's really painful. We tried the stairs with the two of us, but nearly fell, explained Caden. It was unsafe for us to keep trying by ourselves, so I went for help. "'Probably a good idea,' murmured Henry as he eyed the steps. There was a service elevator, but it was on the other side of the floor. The stairs were the closest way to the front lobby. A bomb had gone off. Henry had no idea if the building was safe. The last thing he wanted was for Dylan's kid and friend to be harmed. Worst-case scenario was part of the building would collapse and bring down the rest of the building with it. Best case... Somehow the bomb had not impacted anything. Henry's life had definitely been on a worst-case scenario track lately. Okay, we're going to help you stand, Cece, decided Henry. Caden and I will help steady you as you hop up the steps. Hopping really jars my knee, whispered Cece as she bravely took their hands. I almost passed out when my foot hit a step. That's why Caden went for help. We need to carry her somehow, responded Caden. His doctor had told him not to lift more than 15 pounds. After a brief hesitation, Henry nodded grimly. Here, if you grab my arm like this, we can cradle under the thighs, then we put our other hands around her back like this, and Cece can grab our shoulders. It will be like a chair. Cece is going to be backwards going up the stairs, and we take it one step at a time. Understand? Caden nodded and the three arranged themselves until Cece was sitting on one set of their forearms and leaning against the other set. She wrapped an arm around each of their shoulders. Biting her lip, she nodded. I think this will work. First your left foot, then my right. Henry tried to count out the steps to get Caden into a less awkward rhythm of moving up the stairs. Halfway, he started to feel the strain of it, beginning to run low on breath. Instead of talking, he concentrated on breathing and not dropping Cece. We made it, grinned Caden as they topped the stairs, heading for the lobby. Cece whimpered. That's great. Henry grunted and wished he weren't so ridiculously out of shape. He used to run, swim, and play all sorts of sports. There were trophies regulated to the basement of his parents' house, which had his name on them. It hit home how he was barely able to hold up his half of a 13- or 14-year-old girl. Ambulance, managed Henry as they passed through the foyer and out of the automatic doors. The wind had picked up, and he could see a number of people wrapped in foil blankets the staff had been handing out as part of the evacuation process. There's one right there. Caden veered towards it. It took a moment for Henry's feet to follow, and Cece grabbed them both tightly almost panicking over the fact they could have dropped her. "'Hey, can we get some help?' asked Caden as they approached the MTs. Fortunately, the ambulance appeared empty, and the paramedics immediately came forward. They pulled out the gurney. Henry and Caden carefully deposited Cece on it. Henry leaned back against the ambulance, concentrating on just breathing as he listened to Caden's chatter to the paramedics. The boy wasn't even out of breath. Cece looked pale and in pain as they began to prod her knee. Henry closed his eyes for a moment, trying to find his equilibrium back. His heart was going a mile a minute. He felt clammy and shaky. You all right? 
someone asked. Henry snapped his eyes open. Fine. Are you sure? One of the paramedics was looking at him suspiciously. He was as fine as he could possibly be under the circumstances. Not that he was going to tell the EMT that. A movement caught his eye. Ignoring the paramedic, Henry quickly walked after his brother. Ben! Oh, hey, greeted Ben. I was just about to go inside to try to review the footage from the security cameras. We might be able to find out who was behind this. Computers are down, advised Henry. I think it could be related to what's been happening. Henry didn't want to say the word bomb in front of anyone. Better not to have the crowd panic even further. Are you okay? You look a little out of breath and pale, frowned Ben as he studied Henry. I was helping to bring someone to an ambulance. It's all good, lied Henry. He changed the subject. Maybe you can find out what is happening with the computers. I'll try, promised Ben as they approached the entryway. They both had to show identification before the police would let them enter. Does this mean a security video sweep couldn't be implemented? Correct, sighed Henry as they entered the security office. We don't have complete confirmation the hotel is evacuated. Do you know if there was any damage from the explosion? Ben began examining the computers. Not any that I could see. Most of the blast was contained in a dumpster. A dumpster? echoed Henry as he began double-checking the cables again. Is Waters okay? Yeah, Drew managed to cut the vest off of him in time, mentioned Ben. He was pretty shaken up. Ben paused, thinking. Henry looked up from pushing a loose cable into a receptacle. What is it? Lincoln Waters is married to Addison, quietly announced Ben. What? An astounded Henry stared at Ben in shock. When? She never said anything. For a while now, shrugged Ben. I'm not certain. She never told anyone as far as I know. Why? Why would Addison keep something like that a secret? Wondered Henry, still amazed at the news. I don't think Ads wanted Garrett and Nate to know about it, quietly stated Ben. Why? frowned Henry. You remember what they're like, reluctantly replied Ben. Yes, but people get older, responded a confused Henry. They grow up and become better people. Nate got married and had a family. Garrett and he were responsible for the business. They matured. Honestly, I think they just got better at hiding who they really are, revealed Ben with a grimace. You were older than them. They didn't bother you as much. As for Ads and I, we were fair game most of the time for their bullying. I still can't believe Ads works for Garrett. Henry hesitated. Are you sure you're not letting the past color your present judgment? Henry, Lincoln Waters just told Drew, Max, and I that Ads is afraid of Garrett and Nate, explained a patient Ben, which is why she never told anyone she was married to Lincoln. You've been away for a long time. You only know what everyone's been choosing to tell you about what is happening here. Well, I'm back, a troubled Henry mulled over Ben's words. For how long? asked Ben. It was a good question, one Henry struggled with, not because he intended to retire and stay in America, but because he honestly didn't know the answer on a whole different level. See? huffed Ben as he managed to get the computers to turn on. Soon enough you will go back to work, and we have to deal with what is happening here. I had no idea you felt that way, softly stated Henry. Ben shrugged. He frowned as he watched the screen try to restart. I looked up to you, you know. Video conferencing isn't the same as being in someone's life. It's been difficult without you being here. It might be more difficult in just a few months, thought Henry a little fatalistically. I'm sorry. Yeah, well, maybe I should have said something, too admitted Ben. He frowned at the computer screens. I'm going to write on a diagnostic on this. It should have run through the startup program by now, right? Questioned Henry as Ben grabbed a laptop from a cupboard and plugged it in. It's in a loop, stated Ben as he began to run through a program on the laptop. That's weird. What is? asked Henry as he came to stand beside Ben. Are the computers working at the front desk? Ben pulled the connection on the laptop. No, they're down as well, 
indicated Henry. We only have a partial list of staff and guests printed. Someone was in our system, muttered Ben as he looked through the script on the laptop. We've been hacked, surmised Henry. This isn't a coincidence. The timing is too good. Our bomber gets away without anyone seeing him because our security system is down. How? How did you get through my firewalls? whispered Ben as he typed. Give me a signature so I can figure out who you are. Hey, anyone back there? A voice asked from the front desk area. Henry gave Ben a surprised look as Ben called out. Come on back, Drew. Did you find the security footage? questioned Drew as he entered the room. I need to find some tape on a specific room. There has been a kidnapping. We've been hacked, repeated Henry, gesturing to the screens. Right now we don't know if we have any data remaining on the system. Did you just say someone's been kidnapped? Dr. Holly Urshman. She was kidnapped by a local gang this morning. Drew looked at his watch, although it's getting closer to noon. Do the landlines work? You're kidding me, huffed Ben as he stared at the computer. Henry paused in picking up a nearby phone to find out if there was a dial tone. What is it? Someone did this from inside the office, extrapolated Ben. They uploaded the code within the system. Whoever our bomber is, he had access to this room. The code itself would have been brought in by our bomber. Put on a USB stick, insert it, and upload. Unless it was the kidnappers, grimaced Drew. But that doesn't seem like Tremblay's style. We have a dial tone, mentioned Henry to Drew. Can you fix it, Ben? Will we be able to retrieve the security footage? It's wiping the systems. Ben shook his head as he searched through the data. If I had been here within the first ten minutes, maybe I could have stopped the virus. It's sophisticated. I bet it left most of the operating systems running until the last minute while it did the destruction in the background. I'm going to talk to the police outside. They need to know she is missing, said Drew. If I find anything out, I'll give the main line a call. Extension 247 for security, replied Henry. It will ring directly here. Drew nodded, then left them in the room. Then, the laptop screen is starting to flicker, noted Henry. Virus is eating at the laptop programs, said Ben as he typed furiously. I'm going to figure out who did this. All I need is a few more seconds to find a signature code. Henry pulled out a chair and had a seat. There was little he could do at this point. Checking his watch, he noted his heartbeat was elevated and his hand was still shaking. Henry pulled out the radio. Garrett? Static burst through. Yeah. It's probably going to be a while. Considering the weather, we should see about getting guests situated someplace warm, mentioned Henry. I already started taking groups across the street, replied Garrett. And yes, I'm well aware it's Waters Hotel, but guest comfort comes first. We need to speak in person about Waters later. Henry didn't want to broadcast their personal family business over the radio where employees could listen in. Agreed, stated Garrett. Any updates? Henry glanced up as Ben pulled the plug on the laptop and dumped the offending piece of equipment into a trash can. Nothing good. Update in person when you're available. Later, Garrett responded. Henry lowered his radio and watched Ben lean against the wall with his arms folded as he frowned, lost in thought. Did you find out anything? We're going to need all new equipment. I can get it done today, but I need my phone back from Noah, grimaced Ben. We might have everything back online by late tonight. The problem is, I can't retrieve any of our data. Even my backups were compromised. Then there's no footage of our bomber, surmised Henry. None, agreed Ben. There might be a way depending on what the hacker did with the information. You mean our guest information could be at risk? Henry sucked in a breath. Ramsley Hotels had never had a data breach before. No stated Ben firmly. Everything is encoded. It would take someone at my level or better to figure out the key and break the coding, or they would have to purchase a specially built program to do it for them. Henry watched his brother. What are you saying? Ben pulled himself out of his thoughts and looked at Henry. I think I know who hacked us. Really? 
Does that help us any? questioned Henry. If I'm right, I might be able to get our data back, mentioned Ben. At what cost? wondered Henry. Cost doesn't matter if we can find out who is behind this, decided Ben. I'm getting my phone and I'm going to get started on acquiring the necessary equipment so we can get back into business. I suppose I should coordinate with emergency services and find out when we can return everyone to the hotel, said Henry. He didn't want to think about how many egos were going to have to be soothed when guests were allowed to return. There would have to be a number of refunds and promises made to make everyone happy. Today was going to be costly for business. It was going to be a long day. Henry's musings were interrupted as Ben pulled out a couple of thick jackets out of the security room's closet. He handed Henry one of the extra coats they kept on hand with the Ramsley logo on it. It's cold outside, Ben stated unnecessarily. Thanks. Henry got to his feet and took the coat. As he was putting it on, Henry noticed that Ben hesitated. Ben glanced at Henry. Do you understand, woman? Henry thought back to the kitchen with Cora when she had been so upset, triggered by something, how her mood had changed so swiftly. No. If you ever figure them out, let me know. I'd like some lessons. Maybe we should ask Max, suggested a suddenly gloomy Ben. Having girl troubles? questioned Henry. Usually Ben didn't confide in him when it came to women. Henry had supposed Ben talked to one of their other siblings about dating advice rather than him. It made sense when he was halfway around the world for the past fourteen or so years. Maybe, muttered Ben, I have no idea. That is a tough position, allowed Henry. He decided to pry a little further into his brother's life. Is it that girl Kitty, the one you brought with you? Yup, frowned Ben. We are just friends. Then what is the problem? wondered Henry. She kissed me. Revealed Ben with a sigh. Do you like her? asked Henry. Kind of, muttered Ben. Henry might have been away for a while, but he wasn't fooled by his youngest brother's forced nonchalance. Ben had feelings for the girl. Maybe she likes you. Or maybe she likes the rambling money, shrugged Ben as if it didn't concern him. How long have you been friends with her? questioned Henry. Has she ever given you any indication the money was her motive for your friendship? No, reluctant replied Ben. However, she was chasing this other guy basically because she kept thinking he could afford the lifestyle she wanted. Now it seems like she's given him up when she kisses me. I don't really know your net worth, but I assume you're doing okay, ventured Henry. If you weren't, you know we always have a position open for you with the family business. Ben had a self-depreciating laugh as he recalled Henry had a call during the end of the family meeting where Ben had offered to help defray the family's current financial burden. Henry, you couldn't pay me enough. Literally. I make more than the entire hotel chain does each year, let alone the Ramsley salaries and shares. The Ramsley hotel business cannot afford me. Just matching my income would bankrupt the family. Even if you combine all assets from all four Ramsley businesses, you can't match my annual income. Wow, frowned a surprised Henry. I had no idea you were doing so well. Yeah, I'm a success story, sighed an unhappy Ben. Now I'm wondering if Kitty knows. She didn't before, wondered Henry. Nope. Ben shook his head. She thought I was working for a company which sometimes has me test products. While we do testing on a regular basis for a fee, a lot of those products were inventions from my own company. Basically, she thinks I make a decent paycheck, but didn't know I'm getting closer to competing with Musk every year. From Tesla? A slightly shocked Henry asked. The one and only, muttered Ben. I'm at the point where I employ a team full-time to vet and give my money away into charities. If Kitty knows, I feel like it would change the way she thinks about me. If she has you in the friend zone, don't you want her to think of you differently since you have feelings for her? Pointed out Henry. Well, yeah, but not because I have money, remarked an unsatisfied Ben. I want her to like me, which is lame. It's not lame, quietly Henry assured Ben. 
If you're thinking long-term relationships, then friendship and honesty are the best hope of keeping one going. Or determination, quipped Ben, like Mom. Mom and Dad are not really a great example of relationships, answered Henry, thinking of their parents. Mary was staunchly keeping up the marriage, while Oscar was far more lax. Now Oscar was in prison, and Mary was resolutely pretending everything would be fine. He grimaced. I'm not exactly the best person to give advice, either. If it's not too personal to ask, Ben paused. Why haven't you gotten married or had a serious relationship? I don't think I really remember you dating much. I don't date. Henry hesitated, then decided to be honest. The girl I loved married someone else. I had a hard time getting over it. I'm still not sure I have. Is that part of why you accepted the position running the hotels in Asia? A thoughtful Ben questioned. Part of it, agreed Henry. Ben, I know you have some doubts about Kitty. Maybe the best thing you can do is talk to her about them. Take a leap of faith, it might just work out. Or else someday you'll be at her wedding watching her marry some other guy. You had to watch your girl get married? Ben looked at his brother with some concern. Front row seat, sighed Henry. It had just about ripped his heart out. Maybe there was something to this broken-hearted syndrome thing. His own heart wasn't doing so well lately. Henry's team of doctors thought it was a minor miracle he was still functioning, considering the condition he was in. Talk to Kitty. It's the only way to know for certain what she's thinking. Hopefully it all works out. Henry gave Ben a pat on the back. He hoped Ben would take his advice and talk to the girl. Following him out of the office... Henry steeled himself for the afternoon ahead. Chapter 21 Kepler It was chaos. Guests were everywhere. Ambulances lined the drive. Staff were trying to hand out foil blankets to guard against the cold air. Kepler frowned as he watched another group of firefighters enter the hotel. At his direction, the police had cordoned off the ballroom and the dumpster area. Interviews were taking place of all the Ramsley family members. Kepler had finished talking with Lincoln Waters. He had gotten Waters' key for his hotel room and planned on having a thorough look before turning it over to the forensics team. He let Lincoln go, promising to be in contact for any further questions when Addison Ramsley had approached. After a momentary pause... The couple tearfully embraced, leaving no doubt as to who Addison had been seeing in the hotel earlier. Apparently, their secret marriage was now out for everyone to know. Why the secrecy? Kepler understood Addison's aversion to telling Nate. There were hospital records of how the man had treated his own wife during their marriage, even though charges had never been laid. Had Nate threatened his sister as well? Even so, Nate had been dead for over a month. Surely Addison could have told her family without fear of repercussions. Then there was Garrett. Waters had said Addison was afraid of him as well. Waters couldn't, or wouldn't, expand on why his wife was afraid of her two brothers. There was nothing in Garrett's history to show any concern about him. No criminal record, no records of abusing others, nothing at all. Kepler frowned. He would need to talk to Addison later to understand her fear of Garrett Ramsley. There was something here, Kepler knew. He had seen Gabe whispering furiously to Garrett while he had been confiscating passports earlier today. There was something happening under the surface of Garrett. Kepler would pry further into his life to see what he could find. His phone buzzed. Kepler put it to his ear. Kepler. I managed to track down Henry Ramsley, a voice said in his ear. It was one of the many police officers Kepler had delegated to. Kepler couldn't even remember the man's name. They had a cyber breach. Someone hacked the system and erased everything. Benjamin Ramsley is trying to get new equipment in because the other equipment is compromised. Kepler bit back the urge to swear. It was too neat, in his opinion. It wasn't a coincidence the footage of the bomber was missing. If they manage to recover the footage, I want to be the first to know. Understood, the police officer stated before Kepler hung up on him. 
Bill? came a familiar voice from behind him. Kepler forced a pleasant expression to his face. Deputy Director Epps, how good to see you. Epps shook Kepler's proffered hand. He had his usual entourage of FBI lackeys with him. I heard we had a bombing here. Yes, a man was coerced into wearing a bomb vest. The threat has been contained and no one was hurt. Kepler updated his superior. Currently, I am working with the local police to investigate further until more FBI resources were made available. I have brought a team with me, stated Epps. I have decided to take over this investigation. Excuse me? What prompted this? Kepler gave Epps his full attention. I assure you that isn't necessary. I believe it is, noted Epps with some satisfaction. I have given you a long leash on this investigation, and there needs to be some results. The governor is getting antsy. It's an election year, and his platform includes a stance on getting tough on crime. The Ramsleys and their constant media attention are starting to chafe him. While your contribution has been invaluable, you're now directed to turn all information over to me. I'm taking the lead on this case as a personal favor to the governor. Sir, if there's something I have done, questioned an irritated Kepler before he was interrupted. As I said, your contribution has been invaluable. The annoyed eyes of Epps met his. However, I intend to wrap this up in a more timely fashion. The results have come back from the financial investigations, correct? Yes, admitted Kepler as he gritted his teeth. The results had come back. Yet what was on paper wasn't necessarily what was reality. Kepler didn't fully believe what the conclusions were. He had decided to dig deeper before pressing charges, which was part of why Kepler had been confiscating passports so none of the Ramsleys could flee as he delved further into their financial lives. Good. You can update me with the cliff notes, decided Epps. He turned to one of his lackeys. Get some coffee for me and Kepler here. How do you take your coffee? questioned the lackey. Black, ground out Kepler. He knew Epps had already gone over the reports. He would also have gone over the conclusions and Kepler's reservations. Epps was the type of guy who liked to do his homework on cases, especially those cases he interfered in. Drug money was laundered through each of the Ramsley companies in America. I have orders not to prosecute anyone on the hospital side except for James Ramsley, since he made a plea bargain with those stipulations. Robert, Oscar, and David were all charged with drug running and money laundering. David was murdered at the hospital. The autopsy showed his heart was stopped with a cardioplegic drug administered through an intravenous line. Where are we with charging anyone for the murder? asked Epps. There was little physical evidence, grimaced Kepler. Video footage was erased. The scene was contaminated with multiple medical persons. There were no witnesses, as I believe the murderer disguised himself as one of the medical staff and went undetected. You put in a requisition to dig up the body of Nate Ramsley, observed Epps. He presented as a heart attack, even though he has no history of heart disease, revealed Kepler. If David Ramsley had not been in protective custody and had the autopsy, he too might have presented as a heart attack. I want to know for certain if Nate's death was natural, or if we have a serial killer amongst the Ramsley clan. Seems like a bit of a jump in conclusions, grimaced Epps. He accepted his takeout cup from the lackey. Considering someone has been poisoning Henry Ramsley, there's a distinct possibility one of the Ramsleys is cleaning up any loose ends dryly stated Kepler as he took his own coffee. I read the report on Henry Ramsley, replied Epps. It all happened overseas, not our jurisdiction. True, reluctantly allowed Kepler. However, it still plays into what is happening in the Ramsley family. Where are we on arrest for the financial side, besides the family patriarchs? Epps wanted to know. I want this investigation wrapped up when it comes to the money laundering and drug running. The murderers are a side event at this point. Perhaps we can stick that crime on one of the sons who was involved in the money laundering. Christian Gaines was arrested from Ramsley Pharmaceuticals, responded Kepler. 
He and David have been involved in the money laundering from the beginning. Noah Ramsley is now head of the company. There's no proof Noah had any knowledge of what was occurring until we stepped in with our investigations. What about Michael Ramsley? He was head of the company while funds were being laundered, mentioned Epps. He waved an agent over. Get me a report on the bomb ASAP. I want to know what materials, how big the payload is, and who to arrest by sundown. The agent nodded before scurrying away. Michael was head of the company. He had already started an investigation into the accounting based on discrepancies he found, noted Kepler, ignoring the interruption from Epps. I hardly think he had anything to do with the illicit money when he was investigating it himself. Unless he thought the FBI or police might be on to him, and Michael preemptively tried to make himself look innocent, Epps theorized. Michael isn't necessarily that smart, muttered Kepler. He took a sip of the too-hot coffee and scalded his tongue. Look, they all deserve to be heavily fined along with the companies. They were heads of their divisions and should have known what was happening. I cannot find any evidence of any of them profiting personally from the money laundering. The only one I think was actively involved was Nate Ramsley. He was essentially the head of the American Ramsley hotel chain. Oscar was just a face for the company. Oscar has not made any decisions or done any of the work for years now. It was Nate. No way could the money laundering have continued without his knowledge. Nate was our best suspect, and he is dead. A dead man cannot be charged with a crime, observed Epps. He signed off on some paperwork one of the lackeys brought forward. The governor isn't going to be satisfied with only hefty monetary fines. He wants further jail time. Money laundering is a crime. Only if they had intent and were involved in their father's schemes, retorted Kepler. Careful, Agent Kepler, warned Epps. You can't afford to become too involved in this case. I don't want to think you might be prejudicing the outcome because you happen to like the Ramsley family. I don't like the Ramsley family, growled Kepler. I just want to make certain justice is done. The FBI's reputation on building good cases is important. There's enough evidence to take each of them in for money laundering and being involved in the illicit proceeds of the drug trade, insisted Epps. As for the murder, we will exhume Nathaniel Ramsley and find out what we can. Otherwise, unless the killer strikes again, there's little we can do without further evidence. We can wait, replied Kepler. We can observe lay a trap, and find out who was helping David Ramsley. Jumping forward because the governor is impatient means we might make mistakes which would cost us convictions in the courts later. Epps had a long drink of coffee before looking at Kepler with annoyance. The governor is running for re-election now. The vote is this month. He doesn't care if the conviction sticks. He wants us to throw everything we have at the Ramsleys and arrest them. It will play well to the public. So now we're a tool for the political elite, rather than the citizens of this country? Questioned Kepler in icy restraint. We always have been, Bill, stated Epps. Is that going to be a problem for you? There's a promotion on the line for you, and I would hate to have to defer it because of your political leanings. Let me think about it, said Kepler as he ground his teeth. Don't think too long or hard, advised Epps. It would be unfortunate to demote you instead. You're a good agent. They both fell into silence, watching as the all-clear was given so that people could re-enter the hotel. Firefighters started loading up, getting ready to leave. Most of the ambulances had been unneeded and began the process of leaving as well. Only one person had been brought to hospital that Kepler was aware of, a juvenile female who had a knee injury. Otherwise, the evacuation had run somewhat smoothly considering it was a bomb threat. Kepler supposed that it was a credit to Henry and Garrett Ramsley with how they had trained their staff. Guests slowly started to make their way back into the hotel. Kepler could see Ben pacing while talking on a cell phone, likely ordering new computer equipment. Garrett was talking to staff from the Waters Hotel across the road. Several of the Ramsley guests were warming up in the Waters lobby. He didn't see Drew or Molson Colburn, but the rest of the Ramsleys seemed to be talking together in a tight-knit group. 
they were probably discussing the events of the day and trying to figure out what to do about it. He had not seen Molson all day, he reflected. Kepler frowned. Molson had been the only one missing during the hostage situation. Waters had mentioned the bomber told him to listen to further instructions after the list was complete. How had Waters described the man who had put the bomb on him? An inch shorter than Waters. That was plausible. White and not overweight. Molson certainly fit that description. Brown eyes. What color were Molson Colburn's eyes? Kepler didn't know. He needed to find out. More than that, he needed to put a ski mask on Molson and have him repeat instructions in front of Lincoln Waters to know if he was the bomber. The only flaw was Kepler couldn't think of any reason Molson would want to harm the Ramsley family. Sure, he and his brother, Drew, were illegitimate sons of David Ramsley. The Colburns weren't technically part of the Ramsley family, but had been included more and more in the Ramsley's activities. Molson had even helped to clear his half-brother Michael's name when the FBI had erroneously arrested him for drug trafficking after Michael was framed by David. Why would Molson suddenly want to harm them? Kepler saw no motive. Nor did he believe Molson had the expertise to create a bomb. Then again, Kepler was assuming Molson was a sane human being. He was a son to Margaret Colburn, unaffectionately nicknamed Wacko Margo. Kepler would have to find out what Molson had been doing, and see if he had an alibi before clearing him from the list of possible suspects. With a glance at Epps, Kepler decided not to divulge this piece of information. Let Epps try to discover it on his own. Kepler wasn't a fan of the Ramsley family. However, he felt he had a good idea of who was innocent versus who was likely to be engaging in criminal activities. Proving it was another matter. Kepler also had a strong sense of justice. He didn't like Epps' ultimatum. Yet, was he ready to tank his career over it? Not really. Perhaps the courts would settle it properly. The Ramsley family certainly could afford the best in lawyers. Arresting the head of the companies would be the only thing the FBI could do at the moment. It would be up to the prosecution to determine how far the charges went. It really wasn't Kepler's job to judge who was innocent or guilty. He was only to collect evidence. The Ramsley family group started to make their way inside the hotel, no doubt seeking somewhere warmer to continue their discussions. For a moment, Kepler envied them. It would certainly be better than standing out in the cold winter wind. Kepler took a drink of his coffee, which had cooled to a drinkable temperature. He made a decision. Kepler turned to Epps. Prosecuting the Ramsleys isn't a problem for me. I would like the promotion right away, though. Always the negotiator, muttered Epps. I suppose you want a pay raise, too. Pretty standard with the promotion, Riley noted Kepler. Done. You should wait until Boxing Day, or the day after, to make arrests, suggested Kepler. You just agreed not to go soft on the Ramsleys, frowned Epps. Why wait when they're all here right now in easy pickings? Sterling Denver just married into the family, revealed Kepler. Bad press to arrest them on Christmas Day in front of their kids. The governor wouldn't want public sympathy to be swayed by sentimentality of a holiday gone wrong. He would probably appreciate waiting a day or two so he can come out the hero and not the villain. Good suggestion, grunted Epps. He crumpled up his coffee cup and handed it off to one of the agents hovering nearby. Tomorrow or the next day, I want you personally in charge of the arrests. Don't disappoint me, Bill. Chapter 22 Parker Parker followed Garrett to his hotel room. He had left Adriana in the care of some of the Ramsley ladies downstairs. While Parker felt a twinge of conscience for leaving her directly after the bombing incident, he needed to get to the bottom of what was going on with Garrett and the drug that he had stolen from Mercy Hospital's drug dispensary. As soon as his cousin swiped the door key card, Parker put a hand on the door. We need to talk. I'm tired, Parker, and I have had enough of a lecture from Gabe, 
an irritated Garrett said, This could wait until you come back from your honeymoon. You have been avoiding me for almost a month now, quietly asserted Parker. We could just have this conversation and get it done with. Fine, ground out Garrett. He led the way into the room. He stopped by the kitchenette, taking a half-empty bottle out of the cupboard. Drink? No, declined Parker. He folded his arms as he watched Garrett pour himself a glass. You were in our hospital. We have video of you taking a medication out of the dispensary at Mercy. One of the doctors thought I was Gabe. It happens on occasion. We look enough alike, shrugged Garrett as he had a zip. Maybe the doctor was new or something. The place was chaos. I guess there had been a big accident on the freeway, and most of those who were hurt were coming into mercy. I asked for the code. I brought them what I thought was the right thing. The nurse said I screwed up and she would take it back. I was trying to help. Parker digested Garrett's words. Why were you at the hospital? Scans, a disgusted Garrett said. More and more scans for my back. The doctor never does anything with them, just piles on the charges and fees. Then why not just say so? Questioned Parker with a sigh. It was easy enough to follow up to find out if Garrett had been in to see his doctor on the day the theft occurred. It had been his hope this was the case. However, it didn't explain why Garrett had been refusing to speak to him or Gabe. Why keep avoiding us and making it seem even worse? Garrett gave Parker a level look before downing the rest of the alcohol. First, because you guys are family, you should trust me. Second, I've been avoiding giving you this. Parker frowned as Garrett picked a letter up from the top of a dresser and held it out to him. He slowly took it from Garrett's outstretched hand. What is it? A letter from Uncle James. I tried to talk your father out of it, grimaced Garrett. Kind of how I tried to talk Nate out of his plan to just leave everything to Nick. Now I have to tell Cora that I need to liquidate all the large assets, including her home, to put them in a trust fund for her first son. Nate left her and Oliver with nothing. Are you serious? Parker paused from unfolding the letter, looking at Garrett in shock. I wish I wasn't, stated Garrett. He poured himself another drink. All I have is bad news lately. I had hoped to purchase Cora's home and vehicle, putting them in her name without her knowledge, set aside some funds for her and Oliver. But with the way the FBI is killing Ramsley Hotels, I can't afford to. I just put my own home on the market so I can downsize and use the funds in the interim for expenses with the business. I have to talk to Henry, but we need to start laying off people too. Not something a luxury brand of hotels generally does. It's going to hurt our reputation, our shares, and make things harder. Why can't Cora use the money that is in trust for Nick? wondered Parker. Why would Nate do that? Nate thought Cora was going to leave him, confided Garrett with a bitter laugh. He wasn't too disposed to treat her well. He also wondered if Oliver was even his son. He was convinced she was having an affair. Nate made sure the trust can't be accessed until Nick is 21. The lawyers have made it airtight, and fighting it in court would just spend more money I don't have. It's a mess. Parker opened his own letter and scanned it. For a moment, the breath was knocked out of him as he read. Sure enough, James's scrawl was attached to the bottom. He can't do this. He did, confirmed Garrett. He poured a new glass and offered it to Parker who declined it with a dazed shake of his head. Uncle James reneged on your deal. I guess having Gabe and Marshall turn him down made him feel that none of you were worth being in charge of the family business. He blackmailed me to carry the letter and keep it hushed until after your wedding. It's cruel of him. Blackmailed you? A stunned Parker asked. With what? Garrett shook his head. I'm not about to say. This isn't something I'm proud of, nor do I want it getting around. How Uncle James knew, I have no idea, but it seems to be a trend in our families. I can't believe this, murmured Parker, rereading the letter. Congratulations, you got married for absolutely no reason. Garrett tipped the glass to Parker in a mock toast before sipping from it. Uncle James just wrote you out of the family business. 
You and I both know why, even if no one else will say it out loud. I need to speak to him, a determined Parker stated, ignoring the fact that Garrett knew his secret. It was a bit of a surprise, but Parker didn't have time to pursue it. Maybe Garrett had read the letter. He certainly seemed to know what it was about. Parker folded the paper, putting it in the inside breast pocket of his suit jacket. I'm going to straighten this out. I did everything, he asked. Best of luck, wished Garrett. Parker exited the room, intent on going straight to his father to get some answers. He willed the elevators to hurry as he pulled out his phone. Dialing James, Parker entered the elevator, thankful he was alone. There was no answer. Deciding not to leave a message, Parker was surprised when the phone suddenly rang in his hand. It was his mother. Frowning, Parker answered the call. Hello? Oh, Parker sobbed Dotty. I tried calling Gabe, but he didn't pick up. Mom, are you okay? What's going on? A concerned Parker asked. It's your father. The nurse called and said he's gone to the hospital. A tearful Dotty explained. He overdosed on his medications. The elevator doors opened. Absently, Parker stepped out and to the side so he wouldn't be in the way of a group of people who needed to use the elevator. It was busy in the lobby with guests returning to the hotel. For a moment, Parker didn't know what to say. The doctors did all they could, but he's gone, sniffed Dottie. I'm at the hospital. I don't know what to do. I will be there as soon as I can, Parker said woodenly. Thank goodness, a relieved Dottie replied. Parker said his goodbye, putting the phone away. Where he had felt anger just moments before, felt hollow. The old man was dead. Parker would never get his answers. He had lost his father without really ever having him. Across the lobby he could see Adriana talking to Anne, his wife, whom he had not needed to marry. The letter, burning a hole in his suit pocket, reminded him that James had decided to disinherit Parker. James had taken away the condo, the job, the salary, everything he had been promised if Parker had continued to do as James had bargained for. It said how James couldn't stomach Oscar's illegitimate son taking the helm of RHMC. It was all for nothing. Adriana spotted him, a smile lighting her face. Parker swallowed hard, taking unsteady steps toward her. Sensing his mood, her smile faded to a look of confusion. Parker? My father died. Whatever Parker had thought he might say, it wasn't that bald statement. He felt like he was without an anchor. Ruefully, Parker realized this was probably what Gabe had felt when he lost his position and Brittany. He could now fully sympathize with his brother. Adriana's concerned eyes met his before she stepped forward, hugging him. It was the first time she had initiated contact with him. Parker slowly brought his arms up, holding her and breathing in her clean and simple scent. His reasons for marrying her needed to change, realized Parker. He had lost his inheritance. Simple altruism wasn't enough. The thought of sending her, her sisters, and her mother back wasn't tenable. There could be a child already. They had not used protection. There had been no need since the goal was to have Adriana become pregnant. No, he wasn't sending her back, reflected Parker. Not when there was any chance she could be pregnant. He would do his best to be a better father than James or Oscar. Parker guessed it meant he intended to keep the marriage. Five days and this slip of a woman had him firmly bound to her. Maybe she would be his anchor. Maybe that was all he really needed. Is there anything we can do? Anne was asking. No, rasped Parker. I need to get to the hospital to be with Mom. Do Marshall and Gabe know? Questioned Anne. As Parker shook his head, she continued, I can let them know. I will get the desk to call you a car as well. Anne went to the lobby desk to organize the car service. Can I come with you? Adriana asked, to the hospital. 
Parker's arms tightened around her for a moment. Yes. Then we should both get our coats, she murmured against him. It's cold outside. Parker nodded numbly. Reluctantly, he slowly let go of her, and was pleasantly surprised when Adriana kept hold of his hand. Adriana told Anne they were going to retrieve their coats and would return. Parker let her take charge. It was curious to see this timid woman lead him through the hotel. Part of him reflected he liked that she was taking care of him. At their suite, Adriana grabbed the necessary garments and they returned to the lobby, still holding hands. The car service came, and Parker held the door open for his wife. His wife. He wasn't going to let James taint his marriage, Parker decided. It didn't matter how the marriage had come about. It mattered what he and Adriana chose to do. He had made vows which he had every intention of keeping. Once inside the back of the car, she took his hand again. My father died when I was young. Iona was just a baby, she confided. He read books to me. Did your father read books to you? No, curtly replied Parker. James had never spent time willingly with Parker. For a moment he felt the old anger build. Then he realized Adriana had fallen silent. She had tried to distract him, make conversation, and he had cut her off. Parker glanced at her. Adriana was biting her bottom lip and looking at the road ahead. I would read books with you and our children, quietly promised Parker. Adriana immediately looked at him, rewarding him with a smile. I would like that. No, Parker vowed. James wasn't going to taint this fragile marriage. He wasn't in it for James's rules or manipulations any more. Parker was married because he wanted to be, he decided. He gave Adriana's hand a squeeze. Do you swim? Yes, answered Adriana, a little confused by the change of subject. It has been a long time, not since I was a little girl. Have you ever seen the ocean? questioned Parker. Adriana shook her head. Only through the glass of the airplane. Have you? Parker had a smile. I'm going to take you to see the ocean. Maybe even see if you can balance on a surfboard. A surfboard? echoed Adriana, frowning over the word. Parker tried to explain as they continued through the traffic. You do this for fun? she asked in disbelief. You're not worried about sharks? No, I'm not worried about the sharks, replied Parker. Then I will try the surfing of yours, decided Adriana. Any further attempt at conversation was lost as the car pulled up to the hospital entrance. Parker helped Adriana from the car. He continued to hold her hand as they made their way to the desk and inquired about the room number for James Ramsley, even though James was now deceased. Dottie would either be in the room with him or in a nearby private waiting area. Parker knew the layout of Mercy, easily navigating the maze of corridors. His office was on the fifth floor. Correction, his former office. He supposed he would have to collect his things to make room for the person who would take his place. He wondered briefly who it might be, then decided it didn't matter. After a brief conversation with the nurse's desk, they found Dottie in the nearby waiting room. A nurse who had been comforting her vacated the room after they entered. Parker sat next to his mother, with Adriana sitting next to him. Oh, Parker, sniffled Dottie, pressing a wet tissue to her eye as she grieved. He wrapped an arm around her, letting her lean on him as fresh waves of tears came. Parker didn't try to break the silence, letting Dottie cry on him instead. Minutes later, Marshall and Gabe came into the room. Seeing her sons, Dottie came forward, giving first Gabe a hug, then sobbing on Marshall. It was always this way. Gabe was favored by their father, while Marshall was favored by their mother. Parker tried to push the resentment away. It was just the way life had always been. He should be over the rejection by now. Adriana added her second hand to their clasped ones, leaning closer to him and suddenly he was fiercely glad she was there. "'Have you gone to see him?' quietly asked Gabe. "'No.' Parker shook his head. 
had been here with Mom. Gabe took the empty seat beside Parker as Marshall tried to comfort Dottie. How did this happen? frowned Gabe as he talked softly so Dottie wouldn't overhear their conversation. He seemed well enough at the wedding. Mom said something about an overdose on the phone. I think his nurse told her that. Quietly mentioned Parker. James had a part-time nurse who helped look after his medications during the last few weeks. It was someone Parker had personally vetted for the position. Intentional? whispered Gabe in disbelief. I know he wasn't looking forward to prison, but he was the one who made the deal, who turned himself in. I don't know, shrugged Parker. Maybe it was accidental. I hope so, breathed Gabe. This is a mess. Parker nodded. With any overdose, there will be an investigation. With the FBI involved, it might drag out a bit. With Kepler, it will drag out as long as he can make it, darkly said Gabe. True, agreed Parker. He played with Adriana's hands between both of his. How are you holding up? Gabe paused before dragging in a breath. I really haven't had time to process it. You? Not sure. Parker felt the letter in his pocket mocking him. He debated telling Gabe, but decided it wasn't the right time. It was better done in private. Plus, Parker needed time to think. The consequences of what the letter stated had barely begun to sink in, and he needed to process the situation James had put him in. Parker and Gabe looked up as a doctor came into the room, discreetly closing the door behind him. Parker recognized him as Dr. Ned Barnes. He was a long-standing member of the hospital. Mrs. Ramsley, he greeted Dottie. If you don't mind, I would like to speak to Mr. Gabe Ramsley and Mr. Parker Ramsley. You can use my office down the hall, offered Marshall, rubbing Dottie's back as she continued to weep softly on him. As a practicing physician, he had an office on the floor. Marshall had not fully moved out of it, so they could be afforded some privacy by using it. Marshall had expected to give Jasmine a tour of his hospital, grab the last of his things. Then they were scheduled to go on their honeymoon. Not that anyone had their passports anymore, thanks to Agent Kepler. Thanks, Marshall. Gabe stood, heading for the door. Parker looked to Adriana as he reluctantly let go of her hand. I'll be back as soon as I can. She nodded, and he followed Gabe. It didn't take long for them to be in Marshall's office. There were a few boxes, half filled with items, on Marshall's desk. Parker shut the door after them so they could have some privacy. I didn't want to speak in front of Mrs. Ramsley, began Dr. Barnes. At Gabe's nod, he continued, I'm very sorry to tell you. We believe it was a drug overdose. Mom already knows, quietly stated Parker. She told me over the phone. Barnes sighed. I had hoped to keep it quiet. I told the staff not to disclose the information to her. Perhaps she overheard it accidentally, suggested Gabe. Is there something more you wanted to tell us? There is bruising along his forearms and the back of the neck, disclosed Barnes. He held up a hand. It doesn't necessarily indicate anything. The bruising on his left forearm could easily have come from the intravenous line from his last episode a few days ago where he was dehydrated. Mom didn't say anything about that, frowned Parker. James didn't want anyone to know he had been in the hospital overnight, explained Barnes. He was touchy about things like that. No kidding, sighed Gabe. What about the other bruising? What does it mean? The neck could be the nurse or your mother helping him sit up. James had become delicate, and he bruised more easily in the past few months with the medications he was on. His arm could be from a fall. Barnes reluctantly continued. However, they could also be indications of foul play. Are you saying he could have been forced to take the pills? Gabe choked on the words, bringing a hand to his mouth. It's possible, sighed Barnes. Nothing can be said definitively until an autopsy is performed. The police investigate every suspected overdose we have. I just thought you should know. Thank you responded Parker. He wondered just how much Barnes knew about the FBI investigations into the Ramsley family and businesses. 
Parker was certain there were rumors circulating the hospital. Then again, it wasn't his hospital anymore. James had taken all of it away. We appreciate your help. Parker quickly brought the discussion to a close. Gabe was distressed, and he wanted to protect his brother. Thank you. Of course. If there's anything else I can do, please let me know. Barnes offered before he let himself out of the office, closing the door behind him. This is just too much, muttered Gabe, before he took a seat in Marshall's chair. He buried his head in his hands. You heard Barnes. It's all inconclusive at this time. Parker said as he stood. He started pacing the small office. We won't know anything for certain until after an autopsy. Uncle David was murdered, stated Gabe. Do you really think this is just a coincidence with Dad? I don't know what to think, muttered Parker. What if Garrett took the cardioplegia drug to kill Uncle David? What if he did something to our father? Questioned Gabe. For what purpose? asked Parker a little sharply. I already talked to Garrett about the cardioplegia concoction. He was at the hospital. Someone mistook him for you, asked him to get it for them. There was a mass casualty event, and he thought he was helping. He even said he got the wrong stuff by accident. Is there any way to verify that? wondered Gabe. Why should we have to? Parker grimaced. He's our cousin. I believe what Garrett told me. Suddenly, the letter in his pocket seemed even more poisonous than before. If he had shown the letter to Gabe, would his brother be jumping to the conclusion that maybe Parker had a hand in James's death? Surely not. Gabe knew Parker better than that. At least, Parker hoped he did. Parker stopped pacing. What would FBI agent Kepler think of the letter? For a moment, Parker was tempted to burn it. However, Garrett knew exactly what it contained, and no doubt James's lawyers would have a copy on hand as well. Besides, no one in the family would believe Parker if he suddenly stepped down from his position of his own violation. Everyone knew how much Parker enjoyed his job. Well, he had been with his family and Adriana the entire day, he had an airtight alibi. I don't know what to do. Gabe rubbed a hand over his face. We don't do anything, decided Parker, not until there are conclusive findings from the autopsy. Gabe sighed and slowly nodded. They both sat in silence, each lost in their own musings. The letter continued to weigh down Parker's pocket and he ruefully thought about how the secrets just kept piling higher and deeper. Chapter 23 Everett Everett followed an angry Bree to the reception desk of the hotel. They are not going to give you his room number. I would have Marty hack the system and find out for me, but since everything's still down, that isn't going to work, pertly replied B. Plus, you know how persuasive I can be. I'm going to get Bill's room number. He might not even be staying here, countered Everett. He could have left or gone to a different hotel. Bill likes to stay near the action, a confident Bree retorted. He is here. Just hang back a minute. She came to the reception desk with a fixed smile on her face as she leaned on the counter, waiting for the clerk to greet her. The man finished scribbling something on a piece of paper before looking up. Hello, welcome to Ramsley Hotels, he said warmly. Hi. Bree trailed a fingertip along the counter and purposely batted her eyelashes just a little before inquiring in a breathy voice, My boyfriend is staying here, and I wanted to surprise him. Could I get his room number? I'm sorry, miss. We don't give out guest information, regretfully stated the clerk. I could perhaps call his room if you give me his name. Then he can meet you in the lobby if he does happen to be staying here. His name is Bill Kepler. It might be under William. Bree leaned forward to touch his forearm with her hand. It's his birthday. And it would really ruin the surprise part if we called him. Are you sure you couldn't just give me his room number? I apologize. It's against hotel policy, he repeated. 
Is there any way you can make an exception, just this once? wondered Bree in a sugary, sweet voice. The clerk shook his head regretfully. Bree, you know we can't give out guest information, sighed Ben. Bree leaned over the counter to see Ben sitting on the floor, matching up cables for the new computers being installed at the reception desk. It's FBI agent Bill Kepler. I want to grill him and find out what I can about what he knows regarding the FBI inquiry into the Ramsley family businesses. Come on, Ben, inserted Everett as he came to the desk. It might be the best way we can get ahead of the impending lawsuits. The computers are down, so unless anyone remembers booking him in, I'm not sure we can help you, a slightly frustrated Ben stated, although I would happily give you the FBI agent's room number. 263. Supplied a clerk who was sorting papers to the side. I'm sorry, I couldn't help but overhear. Mr. Kepler is in room 263. I booked him in yesterday. Thanks, grinned Bree as she turned, heading to the stairs. Appreciate it, echoed Everett as he quickly followed her. I must be losing my touch, murmured Bree as they headed for the second floor. Or it could be that Garrett trains his staff well when it comes to guest privacy, dryly noted Everett. You could slow down, and we could devise a plan before confronting Kepler. Where would be the fun in that? smiled Bree. She headed down the hallway, looking at the door numbers. We could provide a united front, maybe have some sort of strategy, get an explanation of events, suggested Everett. He is going to explain himself firmly stated Bree. She knocked briskly on the hotel room door. I will make sure of it. Everett leaned against the wall, watching his girlfriend as she glared at the door. You seem more upset than I am, which is interesting because it's my family which is under investigation. Bill is supposed to be my friend. Friends don't treat each other this way, retorted Bree, as she pounded on the door again with her fist. First, he lets me in on the investigation when it comes to capturing David Ramsley, and now he's gone silent. We need to know what's going on. He should be combining resources with us to clear your brothers and cousins. No one is going to be combining resources, stated Kepler dryly as he opened the door. In case you hadn't noticed, you're not an FBI agent. Bill, don't be so dramatic. Bree rolled her eyes as she slipped past him into the room. You can't just barge your way into every situation, groused Kepler as he turned to follow Bree. Everett took the opportunity to step into the room as well. It's her specialty. You should keep your girlfriend under control, Ramsley, muttered Kepler as he watched Bree look over his tidy hotel room. You used to go out with her, Riley stated Everett. You of all people should know there is no controlling her, nor do I try. It's part of her appeal. Bree gave Everett a dazzling smile. That is why I like you. Kepler took a deep breath to stem his growing impatience. There is no reason for both of you to be here. I am not about to discuss an ongoing investigation with the two of you. Come on, Kepler, said Everett as he sat down in the room's armchair. We all want the same thing. Justice. Even if it means putting some of your family in jail? Shrewdly questioned Kepler. Have you made any headway with the mad bomber? Deflected Bree. No, reluctantly revealed the FBI agent. The footage was erased. The bomb destroyed the cell phone trigger. The only thing we know is the earpiece was from a local electronics store. An agent is currently reviewing the store's video surveillance. Not that I expect he will find anything. Ben has gone through the data from the virus which erased the hotel systems, mentioned Everett. He thinks he knows who did this. Ben says he'll try to confirm his suspicions after everything is back up and running. Maybe he can get a lead on who the hacker transacted with for the virus. Why are you giving me this information? asked Kepler. He folded his arms across his chest. Bree picked up the laptop on the desk, opening it. We thought if we cooperated, perhaps you would. It's password encoded, mentioned Kepler dryly. If you break my codes, I will have to arrest you. You are getting testy in your old age, sighed Bree as she set the laptop back down. She took a seat on the bed. 
Bill, we can help you with the investigation. No, thank you, tersely replied Kepler. My boss would have a fit. I'm not going to risk his ire, nor am I going to risk this case, by allowing the two of you access to information and the temptation to inform the Ramsley family. Hey, we can keep things confidential, protested Bree. He is a Ramsley, observed a wry Kepler. Telling him anything violates my investigation. Okay, so maybe I stay out of the loop, offered Everett. You and Bree work together. I have the utmost confidence in Bree. She can help you to find out what you need to clear the rest of my family. No one is going to be helping on this investigation, growled Kepler. The FBI is perfectly capable of bringing those responsible for crimes to justice. In other words, Bill is at a standstill, smiled Bree. You need us. I have a bomber on the loose. I have murders to solve, money laundering, which the financial analysts are wrapping up, and some arrests to make, snidely returned Bill. I'm not at a standstill. What did the financial analysts find? Questioned Everett, suddenly concerned. Surely they recognize it was only the uncles and my father who were involved. They can't possibly consider anyone else. They considered several people. Kepler turned his icy stare on Everett. My boss is starting to put some pressure on this case. Apparently, they believe with the publicity and the fact that it's election year, some people are about to get nailed to the proverbial wall. It looks good when certain politicians are seen as tough on crime. The Ramsley family has been getting a lot of the wrong type of press lately, and the higher-ups are drooling to make an example out of your family. Even when people are innocent, asked Everett as he got to his feet, you cannot charge them with something they didn't do. I will let the courts handle it, stated Kepler. All I can do is make certain of my evidence. Bill, you can't be serious, inserted an angry Bree. This family has done nothing but cooperate with you. They have tried to find out what they could and helped to put David Ramsley behind bars. You can't just bow to political pressure from your bosses and put innocent people at risk. Who says they are innocent? inquired Kepler. You don't really believe that, said Everett with some heat. There's at least one murderer within your midst or closely associated with your family, responded Kepler. David Ramsley didn't just die on his own. I have every reason to believe Nate Ramsley's death was also foul play, which we will find out soon enough as I put a rush on the autopsy. Your cousin Henry is being poisoned. Nate's death was a heart attack, protested Everett before Kepler's words registered. He stared at him in shock. What do you mean Henry is being poisoned? Anyone who looks at him can see he isn't in good health. I subpoenaed his medical records, curtly replied Kepler. Henry has been poisoned for a number of years. His most recent doctor was allergic to the fact by a cardio surgeon. Everett appeared speechless by the news. He shook his head and started pacing the room, thinking over what Kepler had revealed. Does Henry know? softly questioned Bree. He was informed of it a couple weeks ago, sighed Kepler. The proper authorities from the overseas office of the Ramsley Hotels were notified and cooperated with the police over there. An investigation was carried out, and they have placed someone under arrest for knowingly poisoning Henry Ramsley. While the herbal treatment was originally legitimate for the complaint, the prolonged use of it created his current health situation. It was discovered the person who supplied the herbal remedy knew the long-term effects of it. They have yet to state if they colluded with someone in the Ramsley family or an associate of the Ramsley companies to deliberately poison Henry. Under arrest already? So quickly? Bree was impressed. The burden of proof in that country is different than here, Triley mentioned Kepler. However, I'm sure they thoroughly examined the case and came to the proper conclusions. Who would want to kill Henry? murmured a disbelieving Everett. Everyone likes Henry. He's a great guy. I have a few guesses, a grim Kepler said. Who? wondered Bree. No, emphatically stated Kepler. I have shared far too much as it is. No more. You need to stop trying to insert yourself into this debacle before either of you get charged with interfering in an investigation. You like to use those words a lot, but you never back them up, scoffed Bree. It might not be my choice, admitted Kepler. 
there is a lot of scrutiny from higher up on this case. My supervisor just took over the investigation. All I am is a tool in the cog now. All the more reason to let us help you, repeated Bree, hopefully. No, responded Kepler. We are done here. The next time I see either of you, I will be making arrests. Now go make sure your family have good lawyers. It's hard to have good lawyers when you're being driven into bankruptcy, Everett bitterly told the FBI agent. All I can say is the Ramsleys are going to need them, firmly said Kepler. Now this meeting is over. Recognizing that Kepler wasn't about to discuss anything further with them, Bree hooked her arm in Everett's, tugging him out of the room. They stood in the hallway as Kepler shut the door on them. Do you think he was lying about Henry? wondered Everett with concern. No. Bill has no reason to lie, softly replied Bree as she hugged his arm a little tighter. It makes me wonder if something was missed with Nate. The hospital said he died of a heart attack while running, frowned Everett as they walked along the hallway, headed for their rooms. I don't see why they would get that wrong. Cora found him on the street. It must have been horrible for her. Now Kepler is digging Nate up. I wonder if Cora knows. I hope not, sighed Bree. I can't imagine what she's gone through, and adding that would be awful. I just don't understand, admitted Everett. How would their deaths even be connected? Other than the fact it was their hearts, I don't see how. Nate was out jogging. David was in prison before being temporarily transported to the hospital for physical complaints. David died of a heart attack. At least that was the initial cause of death before it was revised, remarked Bree. I had Marty pull the files from the hospital. He sent it to me this afternoon. The autopsy revealed a cardioplegia concoction was used to stop his heart artificially. It would have been inserted into his intravenous line. Within a minute or so, the heart would stop. Without further drugs or stimulus, the heart wouldn't restart, and David died. How did they get past the security at the hospital? Scowled Everett. It would be risky. Marty says the computer systems went down, just like here at the hotel during the bomb scare, revealed Bree. There are no records of who was in the room with David before his death. The security details stated only doctors and nurses went in, which we can surmise means someone wearing hospital scrubs went in to give David the fatal dose. While you were talking to Sterling earlier today, I overheard Parker at the hotel reception area talking to his wife. He said his father had died. A grim Everett said, How much do you want to bet Uncle James's death is suspicious as well? I wonder if it had something to do with his heart. Seems to be a trend here, other than the poisoning. That is a different method. I wonder if Henry will recover. Someone has it in for the Ramsleys, noted Bree. We need to figure out who it is before anyone else gets hurt. I'm officially wiping my calendar clean until we get down to the bottom of this. Bill might not appreciate us investigating, but he can't stop us either. Chapter 24 Marshall An exhausted Marshall put his hotel key card into the door, waiting for the green light before turning the handle. It was nearly midnight and he was finally returning after leaving his mother Dottie with Aunt Rachel, who was the most sympathetic and caring of his aunts in his opinion. With assurances to check in on his mother in the morning, Marshall had made his way back to Jasmine's in his room. Expecting Jasmine to likely be asleep, Marshall tried to be as quiet as he could, softly shutting the door behind him before kicking off his shoes. Undoing the knot of his tie, he was surprised to find Jasmine sitting up on the edge of the bed, her attention pulled away from a tablet in her lap to watch him. How did it go? she softly asked. Marshall drew in a breath, tossing the tie in his suit jacket on a chair before coming to sit beside her. Not great. I should have been there, she chided gently. He shook his head. There was nothing much to do. I could have supported you. Jasmine leaned against him. Marshall wrapped an arm around her, pressing a kiss into her hair. It's okay. We weren't there very long. Most of my time was spent trying to get Mom to calm down. I gave her a sedative and left her with Aunt Rachel. I will look in on her in the morning. The doctors ruled it an overdose, so the police are currently investigating. 
Accidental or intentional? asked Jasmine. Uncertain. Marshall swallowed thickly. I guess they will let us know what their best determination is. I'm sorry, said Jasmine. So am I, agreed Marshall. He gestured to the tablet. What have you been doing while waiting? I'm struggling to write my last official email as a doctor, sighed Jasmine. It's a rejection letter. A rejection letter? echoed Marshall with a frown. What do you mean? The case of dead man walking, replied Jasmine, activating the tablet and pulling up information. That is what the cardio team nicknamed this patient. A rhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. His heart and vein walls are so thin, he has started heart failure. He needs a heart transplant. However, I cannot see any way to make it happen. A needle and thread would just shred the walls of the veins. Marshall frowned as he looked at the scans. That is a big aneurysm under the heart. Jasmine nodded. Normally, we would go through the groin to place a shunt to solve that. But not with so thin of vein walls, Marshall said. Is the measurement correct? Yes, responded Jasmine. It's three weeks old. I have been trying to think of anything we might be able to do to help him, but I cannot see it. Now we are leaving for my homeland, there really is nothing to be done. At least we will travel once we get our passports back. I'm just trying to word the rejection letter. Telling someone they are going to die isn't easy. This is your last case? Marshall flipped through the patient file. Where is the name? There is no name, explained Jasmine, hence the dead man walking nickname. It's surprising he's still able to function at a reduced level outside a care home setting. We were told he's still working, but on decreased hours. The file came anonymously from his doctor care team. I suppose they don't want us to know who he is. Maybe he's famous, murmured Marshall, intrigued. I wonder who he could be. An actor? A politician? A sports star? guessed Jasmine. Who knows? I just know he isn't going to qualify for a transplant like this. Is it genetic? wondered Marshall. If the walls are just going to continue thinning, then there's no point in trying to give him a new heart. He would die eventually anyways. It's not genetic, revealed Jasmine. I had him forward a complete history. From here, I have determined he has been poisoned. Poisoned? Marshall looked at her in surprise. Yes, affirmed Jasmine with some satisfaction. Accidentally or intentionally, I don't know. He has been ingesting salidrocide. I don't know what that is, admitted Marshall. An herb, clarified Jasmine. It was in a tea he was taking for depression and energy for years. Traditionally, it's used in Chinese medicine. More lately, it has been studied for positive effects of reducing myocardial ischemia with mixed results. The guy's tea is killing him? Marshall asked with some disbelief. It's like a murder mystery. More of a misguided attempt to treat ongoing depression with an herbal remedy and neglecting to realize the long-term consequences. It's in his history, shrugged Jasmine as she switched the screen to show the highlighted parts of the document of patient history. I found out after I had the tea and a few other things analyzed at his expense. His primary physician was open to any sort of testing and gave the impression we could charge whatever we want if we can come up with a solution. The patient would put bags of this tea in his coffee and has been doing it for years. He's a bit of a caffeine addict. Have you had him stop using the tea? questioned Marshall. Yes, nodded Jasmine. As soon as I knew what was causing his medical condition, I immediately contacted his doctor. Apparently, no one else had thought to check the tea. Could catch, said Marshall as he studied the screen. You must be pretty wealthy to authorize all these tests. It's too bad you can't find a way to make the veins thicker. Then you could put in the stent during the heart transplant. Jasmine sighed. I have been procrastinating on the letter. I don't know why. I can't change the outcome. The poor man is simply inoperable. Maybe, muttered Marshall. Marshall, warned Jasmine, I have tried to think of anything to help him. Numerous doctors have been reviewing his case, and every one agrees it's inoperable. Okay, it's inoperable. Marshall put down the tablet, turning to face Jasmine. Pretend in a perfect world you could change that. 
what would you do? Jasmine laughed. Nothing. The world isn't perfect. It's perfect with you in it, declared Marshall. He gave her a gentle kiss and stood up, pacing the floor. Now, you have unlimited budget, amazing hospital staff, and those talented hands of yours. You need to make his veins thicker so he will tolerate a heart transplant. How do we achieve that? Jasmine shook her head, but decided to play along. My hands are talented, but we would need something more. Can you take veins from elsewhere in his body and use them to bridge between these veins and the new heart? Questioned Marshall. His entire system is thin, warned Jasmine. Whatever is done, it cannot involve cutting or using a needle on those vein walls. What about from a lab? Artificial veins? Or from a donor? It still does not work. Jasmine shook her head. No transplant will in his current condition. Marshall stopped, looking at Jasmine. Insulation. Pardon? A confused Jasmine asked. Insulation, repeated Marshall, gaining enthusiasm. Could you wrap the veins in something? Something to fuse to the vein in a short period of time, which would thicken the walls, thus creating enough viscosity to allow for surgery. The risk... Jasmine automatically protested, even as her mind started to sift through possibilities. A simple accidental scrape of the vein wall, and he could bleed out since there would be no way to fix it. There's too much chance of something going wrong. Plus, the chance of rejection or infection with his immune system is high. True, admitted Marshall. He had an impassioned plea. Would it not be worth the risk, though? The only other option is to let him die. Sometimes it's their time, softly stated Jasmine. She stood, standing before Marshall and putting her hands in his. Sometimes we have to let people go. Marshall sighed. Now you're talking about my dad. Maybe, acknowledged Jasmine. Are you sure you're not suddenly invested in this case, because you wish you could have changed your father's outcome? Perhaps, admitted Marshall. You should get ready for bed, advised Jasmine, giving his hands a squeeze. I'm going to finish the letter. Marshall nodded, his shoulders slumping a little. He gave Jasmine a quick kiss before heading to the washroom. It didn't take long to go through his nightly routine. Wearing far more comfortable pajama bottoms and a simple t-shirt, Marshall rejoined Jasmine. He pulled back the covers, tossing a couple of pillows to a chair. What about the same stuff which is used to patch holes in the hearts of infants? Marshall, sighed Jasmine, looking up at him from her side of the bed where she was comfortably sitting, blankets up to her waist and tablet in hand. They are sterile, bond with organs with few complications, offered Marshall. The bed dipped under his weight as he sat down. Just a thought. Marshall arranged the pillow behind him and leaned back against the headboard. He watched as Jasmine typed in a few last words for her email. Read it over and see what you think, said Jasmine, giving him the tablet. Marshall reluctantly took the tablet. He started reading aloud. Dear sir, please be advised I will require updated scans to fully evaluate your condition. After careful consideration, I would like to offer a potential solution. Although extremely risky, I recommend... Marshall lowered the tablet and looked at Jasmine in awe. You're going to try it. In a perfect world, you will give me a surgical team and privileges at Mercy. Plus, we would have to skip the honeymoon to do the surgery if the patient is a candidate. And if he can be here within the week, warned Jasmine, we cannot delay going home any further than that, which means my parents are going to have to pull some strings to get our passports back. If he heals and qualifies for a heart transplant, it will have to be another surgeon who does that surgery. I love you, smiled Marshall. As long as you're not disappointed, I would be happy to watch you do surgery instead of going on a honeymoon. Then press send, grinned Jasmine. Henry Henry leaned back against the cold glass of the window as he sat on the window ledge at the end of the hallway. It had been a long and tiring day. 
Only now did he feel comfortable leaving matters in the hands of the night team of the hotel. Exhausted, Henry had decided to find his own room, and sleep probably the next day or so away. The elevators had been in use, and foolishly, Henry had used the stairs. He had a glance at his watch, noting his heart rate wasn't too bad. He would wait a few moments in the quiet of the hall before making his way to his room. It was the early morning, and so far, it was quiet here in this corner of the hotel. He must have closed his eyes for a moment, because the next thing he knew, someone was sitting down on a ledge beside him. Do you remember when our art group had the entire university student body dressed like the early 1900s? Sighed Cora as she reminisced. We had them bring slates and chalk to classes. Symbolism of an unevolving education system. A smile tugged at Henry's mouth over the memory. I think that was what we called it. I still have no idea how we pulled that off without any of the other teachers knowing, admitted Cora fondly. They were so shocked. We got an A+, plus. remembered Henry. Do you remember when I fell in the fountain? Cora had a surprised laugh. I had almost forgotten. Or when we entered the Fanduzel races. Hey, those were fun, remonstrated Henry gently. They were dangerous, recalled Cora, shaking her head. And all because I let you buy me coffee once. It was the right thing to do, since you couldn't find the coffee cart, mildly mentioned Henry. Only because you and the rest of the Ramsleys attending the university had all the coffee carts moved to different areas of the campus to bother everyone, exclaimed Cora. Henry shrugged. It was April Fool's Day. Those were good times, softly mentioned Cora as she leaned back against the window. Yeah, they were, agreed Henry. They sat in companionable silence, lost in their own thoughts. So, why are you sitting on a window ledge at the end of the hall at one in the morning? Gently questioned Cora as she studied Henry's profile. Personally, I just couldn't sleep. Are you on the hunt for coffee again? Henry had no desire to tell her he had run out of breath simply climbing the stairs. As it was, he was dog-tired from all the day's activity. Henry desperately needed a rest, but the room was too far away, and he had sat on the window ledge in an effort to recover some energy. Henry decided on a partial truth. I had an email. It was a bit of a surprise. How so? asked Cora. Henry hesitated, then pulled out his phone, typing in the passcode. He flipped to the important email and handed over his phone to Cora. Henry looked at the hotel hallway without really seeing it as Cora read through the brief email. The surgery sounds very risky, ventured Cora. It is, agreed Henry. If it goes as planned, there is a chance I would be put on the heart transplant list. That's a good thing, right? Cora handed back his phone. I wasn't expecting it. Honesty won out, and at Cora's look of confusion, Henry tried to explain. All of the other doctors I contacted said there was no solution. They basically sent their regrets and condolences. Cora took a moment to think this over. If you can't get a transplant, how long? Not long. My immune system is pretty shot, so it would depend if I caught a virus or a bacterial infection, admitted Henry. Definitely this would be the last Christmas. You're having the surgery, Cora told him. The boys need you. I need you. Oscar, Mary, Ben, and Addison need you. Notice you forgot Garrett, dryly mentioned Henry. Slip of the tongue, lied Cora without remorse. She focused on looking at the pattern in the carpet. You didn't answer me. I suppose I plan on having the surgery. It just took a moment to sink in that I had an option replied Henry. It has been months of chasing doctors in Asia, Europe, and America to try to get someone willing to figure out how to fix this. With all the rejections, I honestly thought this last doctor would say no as well. I had finally come to terms with the fact that I was done, that my time was limited. It's a surprise. Did you notice the signature at the bottom of the letter? questioned Cora. I did. Henry allowed himself a half-smile. I didn't realize she was the doctor marrying Marshall. She started with, Dear Sir, notice Cora. 
I asked my personal doctor to make the request for treatment anonymous, revealed Henry. We didn't need further negative publicity as a family. Also, with the Ramsley family owning a number of hospitals, I didn't want to have doctors refusing or extending an offer of treatment they might be uncomfortable with because of my last name. That makes sense. Cora took the phone out of his hands and quickly began typing on the screen. Hey, frowned Henry, what are you doing? Supposing planning on getting the surgery isn't good enough, Cora crisply told him. You're having it done. You just accept it and have asked for the earliest appointment to verify your candidate. You can't just do that. Henry held his hand out for his phone. I believe I just did. Cora arched an eyebrow and deliberately kept his cell phone. You're having the surgery. You're also moving into my guest room, just as we discussed. The kids and I will make horrible convalescence nurses. You will want to heal as fast as you can just to get away from us. Cora, you're about to have a baby, Henry pointed out. You might not want to have a recuperating patient as well. It's non-negotiable, firmly decided Cora. Remember? You promised me and the boys a cooked breakfast in the mornings as part of the rental agreement. However, only when you feel up to it. I don't want to be responsible for any relapses. All right. Henry shook his head in amusement. The moment I overstay my welcome, kick me out. I believe we already agreed to those terms, promised Cora as she handed him back to his phone. We did, noted a tired Henry. He put his phone away. I must be getting old. I'm starting to repeat myself. You are not allowed to be old, decided Cora. If you're old, that makes me old, and I can't have that. You will never be old, he told her. Henry rubbed his eyes for a moment. She might not want to do the surgery. Why not? frowned Cora as she studied him. I'm her cousin-in-law now, explained Henry. It might be considered a conflict of interest. At least give her the option, advised Cora. Henry nodded. When Cora had sent the email, it had automatically populated his name at the bottom. Jasmine would know soon enough who he was. It's a good Christmas gift, remarked Cora. Merry Christmas, said Henry. Merry Christmas, softly repeated Cora. Chapter 25 Christmas Morning Kitty Kitty wiped sweat from her face with her towel as she climbed the stair contraption in the gym of the hotel. She could never remember what the machine was called. Ben was beside her, doing the same on his. It was awkward. Ever since the kiss, they had been avoiding each other's eyes, ignoring the embarrassing tension and being ultra-polite. Kitty was tired of it. This time everything was different from what she normally experienced trying to start a relationship with a guy. Mostly, the guy gave some sort of indication of what he felt, what he wanted, and she would respond to the given cues. If he didn't seem into her, she would try to clear the air, joke that the kiss had been a mistake, and move on. If he did seem into her, then she would flirt up a storm. Ben was keeping his feelings close to the chest, waiting for her to make the first move. Kitty didn't know what to do. She hoped Ben and she would remain friends no matter the outcome. She supposed she wanted more than friendship from him. After yesterday's events, where he had disappeared all day after that crazy guy had held them hostage with a bomb, Kitty knew that she cared more for Ben than she had previously thought. She had been worried sick about his welfare while he totally forgot about her and worked to get the hotel back up and running. It was a little depressing. Perhaps he just didn't feel the same way about her that she was starting to feel about him. Kitty was going to have to scold her friends for putting the thought of a future with Ben in her head. His probable rejection wouldn't hurt so much if she had not realized how much she wanted a guy exactly like him. Who was she kidding herself? thought Kitty. Ben was who she wanted. Ben, who made her feel safe and cared for. He was always available to help her with anything. Plus, ever since last night, he made her palms sweaty and her heart skip a beat when she looked at him. All because of that ill-fated kiss. Holly had said she could blame it on the booze. Kitty didn't want to. She would rather repeat it. The timer on her watch went off, and Kitty slowed her exercise machine to a crawl. 
Ben would do at least ten minutes more than her since his goal was to lose weight, or rather, the goal Kitty had set for him. When Ben's brother Nate had died of a heart attack, Kitty had taken over Ben's nutrition and gym time. She wasn't going to lose him. Even now, as she did her cool down, Kitty could see another woman at the gym sizing Ben up. This was something new, which had started lately. Ben had dropped some weight and was losing inches. In response, some of the women who liked a huskier, fit fellow were starting to notice him. Kitty already had to fend off a couple of women who looked like they had been about to ask for Ben's phone number. It was starting to happen more frequently, the appreciative looks. Kitty wasn't a fan. She didn't want Ben to go out with some other girl. It was selfish of her, she knew. Kitty found she had become possessive of him. Her watch beeped again, indicating the workout was over for her. She shut down the machine and descended from it, grabbing a spray bottle with a cloth to sanitize it. Normally, Kitty would do some stretching while she waited for Ben to finish. There wasn't much room to do that in the hotel gym. While it had great machines and weights, the gym itself was small, almost as an afterthought in the design of the hotel. Kitty supposed guests paying this much didn't usually use the hotel gym and likely had a membership somewhere more exclusive. Putting the spray bottle back, she was almost bumped into by the woman who had previously been eyeing Ben. Kitty stumbled out of the way and watched in surprise as the bottled blonde Instagram body perfect in nearly every way sidled up to Ben's machine. She practically purred a hello. Ben gave an uncertain greeting in return. Oh, definitely no, thought Kitty with a scowl. I was just, began the blonde, but Kitty, stepping beside her, nudged her a little briskly. Hey! I'm sorry, Ben, but could we cut this short? asked Kitty, ignoring the woman beside her. I'm not feeling very well. Uh, sure, agreed Ben. He shut off his machine and quickly sanitized it. Your friend should go to her room and lie down said the blonde with concern as fake as her eyelashes. I'm all alone in the hotel, and I was wondering if you would like to have breakfast with me. If you'll excuse me, Ben gave her a confused look. I'm going to see my friend upstairs. Kitty shot the blonde a triumphant look as Ben threw the cleaning cloth into the appropriate bin. She grabbed onto Ben's arm as they exited the gym. She was a little odd, remarked Ben. Do you need anything from the gift shop? They sometimes have medications there if you didn't happen to bring any. Kitty didn't bother to explain the woman had been angling for more than breakfast. The whole episode had seemed to go over Ben's head. Once he lost a few more pounds, she had the feeling she might be fighting off all sorts of women. It was a little depressing. She was just about to confess that she was feeling fine when they ran into Mary, Ben's mother. Kitty had been getting mostly a cold shoulder from the impressive woman for the weekend. She didn't know what she might have done to deserve the attitude Mary was giving her, but she hoped by the time the weekend was over to get into Ben's mother's good graces. Hello, Mary. Mary looked her over from the sweaty head to sneak her feet. Finding her wanting, she turned her attention to Ben. Benjamin, I think it's time we had a discussion on your choice of company for the weekend. Excuse me? questioned a surprised Ben. Kitty blinked at Mary's tone. I'm sorry if I've given any offense. Offense? Your very existence at this event is an offense, sniffed Mary. She lowered her voice. Really, Ben? Bringing an escort to the weekend wedding? Is this what it has come to? She isn't even a high-end escort. I had to suffer your father's many infidelities. I'm not going to suffer you openly consorting with prostitutes in front of the family. Kitty's jaw dropped. She had no words for what Mary had said. Mom, Kitty is my friend, defended Ben. I asked her to be here. This is probably an indication of your income, tutted Mary as she ignored what Ben had just said. You don't make enough money to pay for class. If you would just stop with that silly company of yours, I'm certain Henry and Garrett would hire you. You could have a nice, comfortable life with Ramsley Hotels. There was absolutely no need for you to try to do the modern thing of becoming an entrepreneur. It's a fad, and obviously you're not doing well. Don't worry, I will talk to Garrett on your behalf. I'm sure he can come up with a suitable position. 
I'm happy with my job. Ben drew in a frustrated breath. I don't want to work for Ramsley Hotels. Mom, you need to apologize to Kitty. What you said to her was rude and untrue. Apologize to that tart? questioned Mary in shock. Why would I? You should be ashamed for even thinking of bringing her here. Mrs. Ramsley, Kitty inserted herself into the conversation. I'm not a hired woman. I'm Ben's friend. We've been friends for at least six years. I hardly think, began Mary, but Kitty cut her off. Ben is the best guy that I know. He's amazing, and he would never disrespect you or his family by bringing, what did you call me? A prostitute or escort to a family event? Defended Kitty with a small amount of heat. Also, Ben is happy with his work. He might not make as much as his brothers or be in the family business, but he enjoys what he does. How many people enjoy their job? Ben has a comfortable income, pays his bills, and is happy. Why would you want to change that? I can't believe any mom would rather their kid make a bunch of money and be miserable. Ben, are you going to let her speak to me like that? An offended Mary asked her son. Ben sighed. We have had this argument many times, Mom. I'm not going to work for Ramsley Hotels. I like my work and I have no interest in changing careers. What Kitty said is the truth. The truth, harumped Mary as she eyed Kitty. I spoke to Hilda Sutherland. She told me how you've been hanging out for her son Tristan, making an absolute spectacle of yourself, and it's absolutely shameful. How you were basically a kept woman. You built Tristan and his parents out of tens of thousands of dollars. Well, I won't have you digging your claws into the Ramsley family. As I said, I expect better of my sons. Kitty gasped in disbelief. Are you calling me a gold digger or an escort? I can't be both. If the shoe fits, bit out Mary. Mom, Kitty barely makes rent, asserted Ben. She certainly didn't get that kind of money from Tristan. He probably lied so he could get more cash out of his parents. He isn't a great guy. You're going to believe someone like her over me? demanded an indignant Mary. I'm saying you may only have part of the story, stated Ben calmly. I didn't take anyone's money, an upset Kitty stated firmly. I'm not going to stand here and listen to her lie, sniffed Mary. I'll see you at the luncheon today. I expect you will have sent the hussy away. I'm not sending her away, replied Ben to Mary's retreating back. He ran a hand over his face before turning to Kitty. I need to apologize. No, she needs to apologize. Kitty dragged in a breath. You did nothing wrong. If you want to cut the weekend short, we can, offered Ben. Kitty took his arm again, steering them towards the elevators. No, we were having a good time, and I like the rest of your family. I'm sorry she seems to have taken a dislike to me. Tristan's mom never liked me either. I guess they talked at some point. Apparently, sighed Ben. They entered the elevator, thankfully alone. Did you mean what you said about my job? Sure, shrugged Kitty. You love what you do, I can tell. I would never want you to change something that makes you happy just to chase a few more dollars. Your brothers might make more money than you, but if doing what they do won't make you happy, then you should stay as you are. Your bills always seem to get paid, so it's not like you're hurting financially. Sometimes I envy you a little. You do? asked Ben, surprised at Kitty's admission. I wish I had a job that I loved, admitted Kitty. It's not that I don't like working. I just get paid so little. I'm always behind. Also, I don't know what I want to do as a career. I'm not talented like you. I just want to have some kids and take care of my own little family. Most people think that's outdated. I think it's nice, mentioned Ben as they got off the elevator and headed toward their rooms. My mom didn't have a career. She does charity work, but I don't recall her ever having a job. Of course, we were mostly left to the care of the nanny. I don't want a nanny. I would want to raise my own kids and be a good wife, responded Kitty. I thought I would have that with Tristan, but I've realized since that Tristan isn't any good for me. I don't think I was really good for him either. Maya and Haley were right. I was more in love with the idea of what I thought he could give me, which isn't a good thing in a relationship. Ben paused outside her door. He hesitated. So are you over, Tristan? I am, truthfully replied Kitty. 
I doubt he will be happy in his marriage, but honestly, I wish both of them the best. I'm glad, said Ben. You deserve better than him. Kitty fished out her room key. I guess we had better get ready for the luncheon. Yeah, agreed Ben. We should. I'll see you in a bit. Kitty waited until he was near his own door before entering her room. Tossing the key card onto the side table, she decided to have a shower first. Ben's mom thought she was the scum of the earth. Kitty sighed as she wondered if Ben would want to date someone who wasn't liked by his mother. Then again, he had stood up to her when it came to defending Kitty. Maybe he didn't think of her that way at all. Maybe Ben kissing her back had just been a fluke. More depressing was the thought that she might have imagined Ben kissing her back, Kitty thought with sudden self-doubt. She had been kind of buzzed. No, he had definitely kissed her back, Kitty decided as she shampooed under the spray. Hesitantly at first, but after a bit, it had been a great kiss. Even now, she could feel herself heating up a little from the memory. Ben was a better kisser than Tristan, which was saying something. If Kitty had never kissed Ben, she would have never known how he might make her feel. Not that she minded being safe and secure with him. Tristan had never made her feel like that. Kitty felt that she could tell Ben almost anything. Except, did she dare tell him she was developing feelings for him? She put on the hotel robe, and after rubbing away some of the condensation on the mirror, regarded her wet reflection. If she didn't tell him, Kitty had the feeling they would return to their normal routine as just friends again. They would ignore the kiss this weekend, pretending it never happened. It would be awkward at first, but eventually, it would be as though nothing had changed. Kitty looked at the girl in the mirror, who stared at her with sad eyes. She didn't want things to stay the same. She was going to have to do something about it. What had Holly said? Ben was used to other people making the moves. Well, she was about to make a big one. If she were wrong, Kitty was going to need to find a hole to hide in for the next month or two. If she were right, it could be wonderful. Giving the now determined looking girl in the mirror a nod, Kitty headed directly through the small sitting room to the adjoining door. She wrapped her knuckles sharply across it. Ben opened the door. He was already dressed in his dress pants, undershirt, and unbuttoned dress shirt. Kitty, are you all right? Did you change your mind about going to the luncheon? You will notice I am perfectly sober, solemnly stated Kitty. Okay, agreed a now confused Ben. I wasn't last night, but I am now, reiterated Kitty. I want you to know that. Ben frowned. Why? You seem to think I only kissed you last night because I had a little too much to drink, explained Kitty as she took a deep breath. If you would lean down, I would like to repeat the experience without the alcohol. Kitty, a surprise Ben managed to utter her name. I like you, Ben, confessed Kitty. Her voice started to trail off as her confidence waned at Ben's uncertain expression. I was hoping you might like me, too. Are you sure about this? questioned Ben with concern. Just a few weeks ago, you were with Tristan. I'm not exactly the type of guy that girls are interested in. Maybe you're going through a rebound phase or something. Are you trying to talk me out of this? wondered Kitty, a little taken aback. I'm just trying to find a logical reason, clarified Ben. Kitty stared up at him. Her face grew hot. She sucked in a breath as the bottom dropped out of her stomach. You don't like me. You're not interested in me. You were just being nice to me last night, as you always are. I'm like your kid sister. Kitty, began Ben, but was interrupted. No, that's how you treat me. Like the troublesome kid sister you're always bailing out, nodded Kitty as she voiced the revelation. She blinked back sudden tears. I feel so stupid. I have made a huge mistake. I'm sorry I shouldn't have said anything. Please ignore me. She abruptly turned, walking rapidly towards the safety of her room. She was going to die. Just die. Kit! Ben caught up with her before she could close her door, putting a hand against it. Will you just stop and talk to me a moment? I think we've said all we need to, sniffed Kitty, folding her arms across her chest in an attempt to shield herself from what he might say. You got to say a lot, but I didn't, Ben pointed out. Forget what I said, stated Kitty. 
She looked at the wallpaper, or she tried to. It was blurry from the tears gathering in her eyes. Kitty fervently wished not to cry in front of Ben. Why was she suddenly so embarrassed, or so invested in his feelings? A little over a week ago, she hadn't even thought of Ben this way. She was going to kill Maya for suggesting Ben as relationship material. I was wrong. We're friends, right? No big deal. Kitty, would you just let me talk a moment? asked Ben with an aggrieved sigh. I have to get ready for the luncheon, said Kitty. It was the last thing she wanted to do right now. However, it was better than listening to Ben try to let her down easy. We don't want to be late. I like you too, revealed Ben. What? Kitty wiped away a tear, looking up at him in disbelief. I have had a crush on you since the day we met, said Ben in a rush. Really? whispered Kitty. Ben nodded, suddenly looking as vulnerable as Kitty felt. He was right in front of her. Kitty took a step towards Ben, putting her hands on his shoulders and going up on her toes. It didn't take any coaxing on her part for Ben to lean down and kiss her. She closed her eyes, leaning against him, and enjoying the kiss. Ben was magic, she decided dazedly. Her body felt flushed and fevered. More importantly, for the first time in her life, it just felt right. Kitty? Ben cleared his throat. Kitty looked up to see his face beat red again. He was holding her robe closed, as at some point the tie had come undone. Hmm? Maybe you should get dressed, he asked. Okay breathed Kitty. Briefly, she had the wicked thought of simply letting her robe fall to the floor. However, it might not be her best idea. Ben was a gentleman, she reminded herself. Things were going to go a lot slower in this relationship, and she realized she didn't mind at all. Kitty tied the robe firmly closed. I'll see you in a little bit. Yeah. Ben cleared his throat again and shut the door behind him, giving her privacy. Oh, I have so much to teach you. Kitty grinned as she headed back to the bathroom to brush and dry her hair. She hummed as she got ready for the day. The girl in the mirror had a silly grin on her face, and Kitty thought she looked very happy indeed. Chapter 26 Adriana Adriana still wasn't used to the idea that a maid was supposed to be cleaning up after them while they stayed at the hotel. She had been cleaning up after herself most of her life, a maid was a complete luxury. Adriana put her new robe on the proper hook in the closet with all the other clothes Mrs. Matron had ordered for her. The woman had ensured Adriana would have everything she needed to fit into her new world while staying in a conservative style. Adriana was grateful, especially when she had seen how the other woman in the family dressed. Mrs. Matron had also thoughtfully provided for Adriana's mother and sisters. Eyeing Parker's clothes draped over a chair, Adriana scooped them up to put them away as well. She stepped on the plush carpet towards the closet, when she felt a paper under her foot. Adriana picked it up with an empty envelope from the floor. She frowned. Perhaps Parker had accidentally dropped it? Opening the paper to determine if it was his, Adriana's eyes scanned the letter. She gave an involuntary gasp dropping the clothes as the written words registered. Parker's father had decided not to allow Parker to continue in the family business. He had essentially disinherited his son. "'Are you ready to join everyone?' asked Parker as he adjusted his shirt cuff. He stopped abruptly as he saw what Adriana had been reading. His features hardened as he took the paper and envelope from her trembling fingers. "'I hadn't intended for you to see this.' Adriana stared at the floor. She felt a little light-headed. What had started as a lovely Christmas morning was now turning into a possible nightmare. She clasped her hands so tightly together they hurt. Adriana managed to whisper a question. When did you get the letter? Yesterday. Parker shoved the offending paper into the envelope before putting it in a drawer, as if hiding it would make any difference. Just before I learned my father had passed away and we went to the hospital. Yesterday, he had known while he was making promises in the car to read books with their future children, she reflected. A hollow feeling permeated her chest. Had he lied to her? 
this perfect fairy tale husband of hers had known the premise of their marriage was null and void yet had continued to make promises of teaching her to surf and see the ocean it doesn't make any difference stated parker adriana looked at him in absolute shock not make any difference his whole reason for marriage was gone where did it leave her what was she supposed to do adriana tripped over her words her voice shaking mrs matron was very clear why you need marry and what my role would be she said this was to keep your work your father took away the work the job so he also takes away the reason you marry me her uncles had gone home their flights had left last night her mother and sisters were relying on her adriana bit her lip as she waited to see what he might say you're right a grim parker said my father did take my previous reasons for marrying you away. He was going to send her back. Adriana closed her eyes, dragging in a breath to try to steady herself. For a moment, she wished she had never met him. Better to be ignorant of how wonderful a marriage and husband could be than to have all her hopes ripped away by cruel fate. If this had happened a week ago, I would be backing out of the marriage, confessed Parker. I will admit I had no intentions of getting married or having kids. It wasn't something I had thought about doing before my father's ultimatum. Adriana opened her eyes to warily watch him. He held her future in his hands. Things have changed. Both our circumstances have changed. I was thinking, began Parker again after a brief hesitation. If you want to stay, we might try to figure out this situation together. It's true my initial reason is gone. That doesn't mean your initial reason has changed. I want to help you. Adriana thought over his words. You would help me by letting me and my family stay? Yes, agreed Parker. Would I still be your wife? Do you still want a child? She wondered. What am I to do for you? Exactly what you did yesterday. Parker struggled to clarify. He came forward, taking her hands into his. It was nice having you there, supporting me. I haven't had much of that in my life. I would like to support you as well. How? Adriana noticed he had not clarified his position on having a wife or child, other than he had not wanted one in recent history. Maybe he still didn't want them. Maybe I'm going about this the wrong way, sighed Parker. You want to stay here in America, right? Yes, slowly agreed Adriana. Very much so. Do you want to be married to me? Or did you agree just because your uncles forced you to? Parker studied her intently. Marriage is very important in my culture, ventured Adriana. I have been hoping for a good marriage. I hoped we would have a good marriage together. I like you. I like you as well softly stated Parker. I would like to stay married, not because we were forced into it, but because we choose to be married. Adriana had a tentative smile. I would like that. Good, nodded Parker. Then that's what we will do. Parker gently cupped her face in his hands and gave her a sweet kiss. Adriana felt it was over far too soon. She searched for something to say. Can we still try the surfboarding? Absolutely, said Parker with a smile. Once the weather turns warm enough, I will happily teach you and your sisters all about surfing. Adriana brushed an imaginary piece of lint off of Parker's shirt. I like it when we plan for our future together. So do I, admitted Parker. He drew in a breath. I suppose we ought to go downstairs and join the rest of the family for Christmas. I have a present for each of us. For the exchange. Maybe next year we can go shopping together. Adriana gave him a pleased smile. Perhaps she had no reason to worry about Parker and their marriage. Perhaps he had meant what he said in the cab about reading to their children. It was a heartening thought. Parker grabbed their two gifts and held out a hand to her. Adriana happily slipped her hand in his as they made their way to the Ramsley family activities. Cora Cora scanned the room to be certain she had not forgotten anything. Mom, asked Oliver, can we go now? 
She gave him a distracted smile. Of course. The key card for the room? Quietly said Nick, picking up on the fact that Cora was trying to remember everything. He already had his hands full with two large gift bags. So did Oliver. Cora scooped the key card off the dresser. I think we're ready. She picked up her own small gift bag and followed the boys out of the room. They had almost made it to the elevators before they were interrupted. Cora, could I have a word with you? asked Garrett as he approached them with his own gift for the family exchange. Cora could feel Nick stiffen beside her. Oliver was too oblivious to the tension, only slightly curious as to why his uncles had stopped them. Right now? I would appreciate it, replied Garrett. We should discuss the estate. It's Christmas, protested Cora. The boys are about to exchange gifts with their cousins. It shouldn't take very long, insisted Garrett. Cora held Garrett's gaze in a contest of wills for as long as she could before looking away. You boys go downstairs. I'll be along shortly. We can stay, offered Nick, keeping an eye on Garrett. Nick, objected Oliver with disappointment. Boys, you should listen to your mother, stated Garrett. Mom? questioned Nick once more. It's fine, Cora insisted with an unfelt smile. I will see both of you downstairs. She waited until Nick and Oliver had entered the elevator the door shutting before rounding on Garrett with a glare. This was unnecessary. Cora tried to be calm, even though she was upset by the interruption. It's Christmas. Whatever we must talk about could have waited until tomorrow. I don't want to fight about this, Cora, a tired Garrett replied. It's been a long weekend, and I just want to get this conversation over with. Cora folded her arms. Well? In private? Garrett mm -hmm. frowned. We don't need to be talking in public where we can be overheard. Pulling out her key card, Cora led the way to her hotel room. She opened the door and waited for Garrett to enter before raising an eyebrow. There's no need to have an attitude, Cora, mildly remonstrated Garrett as he took out an envelope from his pocket. How many times had Garrett, Oscar, or especially Mary, told her to mind her attitude? How many times had they made her feel at fault? told her to behave, to try harder, to be better, that her concerns weren't important, that she had to be a good wife to Nate, a good Ramsley, and uphold the family name, to ignore any bad behavior on the part of her husband, to not make a fuss. Cora bit the inside of her cheek to prevent herself from responding, an old habit which had formed a number of scars inside her mouth. Here, Garrett thrust the papers at her. What is this? questioned Cora as she took them. A copy of Nate's will, explained Garrett. You can have your lawyer look it over, but I have been trying to find a way to break it, and my lawyers haven't succeeded. Break it? echoed Cora, looking up from the blur of legal jargon she didn't understand. Why would you want to break Nate's will? Garrett gave her a pitying look one he often wore when he talked to her. Cora felt all of ten years old and so very stupid when he looked at her like that. It's not very complimentary to you or Oliver. I tried to talk Nate out of it, but he was adamant. I thought I might be able to get a court to circumvent it, but the lawyers told me it would be a waste of time. What did he do? whispered Cora with a sinking feeling. He left everything in trust to Nick baldly stated Garrett. As executor of the estate, I'm supposed to liquidate all assets and put them in the trust. The trust is to remain intact until Nick is 21 years old. Nothing can be taken out of it. Please tell me you have a separate bank account. No, replied Cora, shaking her head. Nate never saw the need for me to have a separate account. Nate had not seen the need to make his account a joint account either, her mind reminded her. Cora pushed the thought away. She had not used Nate's money since his passing. She simply didn't know his pin codes. Garrett sighed, pulling a card out of his wallet. Here, you can use this for the moment. However, I'm going through a bit of a financial crisis with the FBI freezing the hotel chain's assets, so don't spend too much. I don't want the card. Cora eyed the piece of plastic. 
she knew it would come with strings. Everything from Garrett always had conditions attached. You need money to live. An impatient Garrett continued to offer the credit card. By law, I must sell your home, the car, the furniture. All the proceeds are to go to Nick's trust fund. There is nothing else, Cora. All I can do is try to help you out. You can stay here with the boys for a while until we get you situated in a new house somewhere. As for Livingston Academy, the only good thing is that Nate paid up for the rest of the year. Cora stood still, thinking. She could believe Nate had done this to her. It was his last laugh from beyond the grave, making a pauper out of her and Ollie, his last way of controlling their lives. No doubt the trust fund for Nick would have conditions on it as well. She was about to lose her home. Correction, Nate's home. He had picked it out. He had picked out the car. Even the furniture. Honestly, she would be glad to be rid of the vehicle. Cora had never liked it. While the house had never been what she would prefer, she would miss the place as it was where she had raised her boys. Nick and Oliver would have a difficult time understanding not being able to stay in their home. It would take a lot of adjusting. Things were changing. She was changing, Cora decided, straightening her shoulders. She met Garrett's gaze. Keep your card. Ben gave me an emergency credit card a little while ago. I can use it. She trusted Ben. Comprehension lit Garrett's face, his features hardening as he put the credit card away. Ben was helping you. Were you really going to leave Nate? Cora decided it was best not to answer. He suspected you might. Garrett's voice was cold as he took a step closer to her, invading Cora's space. You really are an ungrateful wretch. Nate was a great person, the best man I knew. He deserved the finest of everything, yet here you were, plotting behind his back, planning on running away while pretending to be happily married to him. Were you going to take the boys away from him? Nate loved his sons. I think this conversation is over said Cora in a firm voice. She quickly stepped back, opening the door to the hall. You can leave. You can go begging to Ben, spat out Garrett as he made his way past her. Forget living off my generosity. I at least have some family loyalty. Family loyalty and no viable options were what had made Cora stay for far longer than she should have, reflected Cora. She closed the door, locking it, then leaning against it. She was shaking. Cora wrapped her arms around herself, hugging them tight to her body. She drew in a deep breath in an attempt to steady her nerves. Nate had had the final laugh, doing this to her and the boys. The inheritance would no doubt eventually drive a wedge between Nick and Oliver. It was cruel to uproot the boys, making them lose their childhood home like this. There was little she could do about it, Cora supposed. She would need to contact a lawyer. Not Nate's lawyer, either. She didn't know how long Garrett would give her before he started to sell the house and larger items. Cora should have asked him. How was she going to have Henry as a guest now? It just wasn't possible. Part of her was relieved she couldn't offer her soon-to-be non-existent guest room to Henry. Another part wondered how he was going to get good care after his surgery. She would have to tell Henry. Cora knew he would likely offer his help, and she would likely end up accepting some of it. She would also have to tell Ben of the developments. Ben would help. He probably knew a good lawyer. What a mess. Cora looked at the small gift she had purchased for the gift exchange. Garrett had certainly ruined the day. She had been looking forward to the Christmas celebration. This weekend, she felt like she was finally making friends among the Ramsley ladies. Other than at the boys' school, she rarely had the chance to talk to other people. Now the day would be overshadowed by the fact Cora needed to try to sort out her living arrangements. Cora sighed. Staying in her hotel room wasn't going to solve her troubles. She needed to go downstairs and find Ben. Then she could put together some sort of plan to fix things. Perhaps there was a silver lining in all this. She didn't ever have to talk to Oscar or Garrett again. Oscar was in prison. Whatever lawyer she retained could deal with Garrett on her behalf. It was time to start over, to have a fresh beginning without Nate.
These thoughts cheered her a little. Feeling somewhat better, Cora decided it was time to join the luncheon downstairs. Chapter 27 Merry Christmas Max They had drawn lots, and Noah had ended up wearing the Santa suit. Three pillows later, and he looked like he was in his twelfth trimester. Max knew from prior experience the white beard was itchy, but Noah was taking it well, posing for pictures with the kids and handing out presents for the children's gift exchange. Gabe, Parker, Marshall, and their brides were grouped together, talking about rearranging their planned honeymoons since the passport confiscation. Max had overheard Marshall stating something about Jasmine having one last planned surgery before return. Max had overheard Marshall stating something about Jasmine having one last planned surgery before turning his attention back to his mother who was sitting beside him. Of course I will grieve for him, sighed Rachel to Dottie, patting her sister-in-law's hand. Even if David was a scoundrel, I had been married to him for many years. I'm sorry to hear about James. Dottie nodded. Beverly reached over to take Dottie's other hand. If either of you need anything, do let me know. Please, sniffed Dottie. It's Christmas. Let's just focus on the children. Max, where are Ryder and Morgan? questioned Rachel, looking over the crowd. I had something for each of the grandchildren. Perhaps they can help me by distributing the gifts. I will find them for you, promised Max. He rose from his seat, taking his mug of eggnog with him. Wandering through the crowd of family, he found his two sons, Morgan and Ryder, who were admiring the brace on Cece's knee. Max told the boys their grandmother wanted to see them, and they easily enough went to help distribute her small gifts. How is Kelly? asked Max to Caden. They had a text come through yesterday that baby Jackson had arrived. Mom's great, answered Caden. We got to speak with her a little bit on the phone. She says everything is good. Jackson is super cute, added Cece with a grin. We visited the hospital nursery after the doctor fixed my knee yesterday. See, even Cece thinks new babies are adorable, Max casually mentioned to Paget as she happened to join them. No more babies for us, replied Paget with a smile. Max sighed and wrapped an arm around his wife before giving her a kiss. You know what? I'm okay with that. We have two amazing boys. We do, agreed Paget, leaning into him. She turned her attention back to Cece and Caden. Did you get to see Jackson? We got a picture, responded Caden, as he got out his phone to show them. The nurse held him up to the window for us. Mom was sleeping and Dad said we should let her rest. They all agreed Caden's new baby brother was indeed adorable while admiring the photo. Oh, we have a runner. Paget scooped up one of Anne and Michael's triplets. Max could never tell them apart. I thought they were just walking, frowned Max. I guess this one decided she could sprint, smiled Paget as she bounced the toddler on her hip. Shall we go find your mama? Max watched as Paget weaved her way through the crowd to find Anne chatting to the baby. He shoved the wistful idea of another little Max and Paget baby from his mind. Max could understand Paget's point of view. The boys were getting older. He and Paget were working full-time jobs they loved. He could admit to himself the thought of a little girl was missing. Max decided he and Paget would need to borrow from Anne and Michael more often. Perhaps he could convince Anne to lend Paget and him one of the triplets in turns. Did we find out who was expecting? Questioned Everett from beside Max. Good grief, you scared me half to death, sputtered Max as he took a deep breath and gave his cousin an annoyed look. You were lost in your thoughts while staring at your wife, noted Everett. I was, admitted Max. As for the mystery pregnancy, no leads. I'm kind of disappointed. Maybe it was one of the maids, a dissatisfied Everett said. We did kind of assume it had to be one of the Ramsley women, nodded Max. I suppose it could have been one of the maids. Is that Lincoln Waters? wondered Everett. Max spotted Addison and Lincoln talking to Aunt Mary. Yep, he and Addison are married. What? A surprised Everett looked at Max. When? Max shrugged. A while ago. They've been keeping it a secret. Guess it's out in the open now. 
he could see Mary scolding Addison before Lincoln took charge of the conversation, gently talking to his new mother-in-law. Lincoln wrapped an arm around his wife as Mary touched a hand to her lips in delighted surprise. Addison nodded as she touched her own abdomen. Addison. Both Everett and Max stated at the same time. Did anyone bet on Addison being pregnant? questioned Everett. Nope, no one, smiled Max. I suppose everyone keeps their cash. Probably a good thing, considering the state of most of the family's finances, agreed Everett. Max nodded easily. It had been a fun diversion, and he wasn't sorry no one had won. He looked over the room and frowned as a thought came to him. Hey, have you seen the Colburns? They do know that they were invited to the Christmas Day festivities as well, right? I saw Drew and Bethany yesterday, replied Everett. It could be around somewhere. Hey, Ben, have you seen the Colburns? asked Max as he laid a hand on Ben's shoulder as his cousin was about to walk past him. Not today, answered Ben. The last time I saw Drew was when he said some Dr. Ursham had been kidnapped. I didn't catch the doctor's first name. Max paled. Dr. Urshman? That was it, nodded Ben. Holly. Her name is Holly and she's Molson's girl, revealed Max with some alarm. What do you mean kidnapped? Drew came to the security office to find out if we had any video of the bomber or the guys who kidnapped Holly, replied Ben. Our systems were compromised. Everything was erased. I spent most of yesterday trying to get things back to normal. I suppose Drew might have said something further to Henry later, but the last I heard from him, Drew was going to report her missing to the police outside the hotel. Why would anyone want to kidnap Holly? wondered Everett. Is her kidnapping related to the bombing? I don't know, mused Max. Do you know what room they are in? I'm going to find out if they're still at the hotel. We can help them. They were on my floor, frowned Ben. Give me a moment. As Ben left, Noah came beside Max, divesting himself of the beard and Santa hat. This beard itches. He shrugged out of the Santa jacket and tossed it on top of a pile of three pillows. Noticing Max and Everett's serious demeanor, Noah asked, What? Someone kidnapped Holly, said Max. What? Noah repeated himself. Did you just say someone was kidnapped? Holly supplied Everett. It happened yesterday and we just learned about it. Holly who? asked Noah with a frown. Urshman supplied Max. She's Molson's girl, the doctor who was Bethany's psychiatrist for a while. This is surreal. Noah shook his head. A bombing, a murder, money laundering, and now kidnapping. How much can one family take? I know the room number and I have a master key card, stated Ben as he rejoined their group. They haven't checked out, so I'm assuming Drew and Molson are still here. How is Beth? wondered Noah in concern. As far as I know, she's okay, shrugged Max. Let's go find out. The four of them headed to the hotel room, registered to Drew. Ben knocked on the door. Do you happen to have their phone numbers? wondered Everett. If he isn't here, then we should call and see if there's anything we can do to help. I have Drew's phone number, confirmed Max. I have Beth's, said Noah. Weren't you and Beth engaged for a while before you married Elle? questioned Everett. Yes, confirmed Noah. We're still friends. Ben knocked on the door again. He might not be here, or he isn't answering the door. Max pulled out his cell phone, but the door across the hall opened. Can I help you? questioned a tired Bethany as she stood in the doorway. She looked pale with dark smudges under her eyes. What is going on? Did you even get the right room number? wondered Everett as he looked at Ben. Ben gave Everett a dirty look. It's my system. I know who's where in this hotel. We heard Holly was kidnapped? responded Noah, ignoring Everett and Ben. Is it true? Yes, sighed Bethany. She was taken yesterday. Bethany moved to the side so they could come into the hotel room. Are you okay? questioned Noah in concern. I'm fine, stated Bethany. I'm worried for Holly. What is all this? wondered Everett, as he picked up some paperwork and eyed Molson, who was pacing the room, 
looking through some more papers. A medical file? Max frowned as he picked up a paper from the bed. Blood type, genetic markers, what is going on? Bethany gathered her thoughts. I think I should start from the beginning. Yesterday, when we went down to breakfast, Holly came to her room to get changed. She'd been with me overnight in my room, you see. Drew and I went down to breakfast, and later we were in the ballroom with all of you during all the excitement. Yet Molson and Holly weren't there, remembered Ben. Holly was kidnapped, softly stated Bethany. They took her and left a medical file with a note. The note said, save her, save them both. There's also a picture of Holly, a Polaroid. She looked unconscious and was tied with duct tape. Why would someone take her and give a medical file? Asked Everett. We know Molson is becoming a doctor, but that seems extreme. When Molson helped Michael get out of prison on the false FBI charges, he made a bargain with a man named Tremblay, explained Bethany. Tremblay is one of the biggest gang leaders in the city. Molson owes him a favor. In exchange for a testimony that Michael was never involved in drug running, Tremblay has now called in his favor. The medical file is of his daughter. Drew said he had his gang members take Holly for insurance. Where is Drew? questioned Noah. Trying to find Holly. He managed to get video footage from street cameras pulled and found a vehicle she was transported in. It's a stolen van. All the cops in the city are looking for it. He called me this morning to say they found the vehicle, but not Holly. Bethany's voice cracked as she wiped a tear. Hey, Drew is a detective, right? Noah pulled her into a hug, rubbing Bethany's back. He will find her. Max shuffled through papers. Who is the patient? Isla Tremblay. She's the gang leader's daughter, revealed Bethany. Molson has been trying to think of anything he could do which might help her. We've been calling doctors and hospitals. It must be the millionth time Molson's gone over the paperwork, but he can't find anything that would save her life. What does she have? wondered Ben. What condition or disease? Tay-Sachs disease, replied Molson, speaking for the first time since they had come into the room. A genetic disorder which affects the nervous system. It's caused by the absence of an enzyme, which aids in breaking down fatty substances called gangliosides. If they aren't broken down, they build up to become toxic in the brain and spinal cord, affecting nerve cell function. How old is the patient? asked Noah. She's three, responded Molson, looking at Noah for a long moment as something clicked in his brain. This ain't about me at all. I've been spinning my wheels trying to figure out how to help this girl, and wasting my energy. Excuse me? frowned Everett. What do you mean? I ain't a geneticist, stated Molson, staring at Noah. I ain't a scientist. I'm a resident who's just starting. Tremblay knows this. You, however, you're a scientist with a whole lab at Ramsley Pharma. You got a drug for this. Tremblay don't care about me solving it. He knows Ramsley Pharma has a solution, and it's my connection to the Ramsley family he needs. Do we have a drug on the market to help with Tay-Sachs disease? wondered Max. No, not on the market, slowly answered Noah. You're testing a drug, or a therapy, though, ain't you? questioned Molson. If we can give it to Isla, she could live, and Tremblay will return Holly, a hopeful Bethany said. No, stated Noah. We can't do it. What? An incredulous Molson demanded. This is Holly we are talking about. Tremblay has her, and he doesn't make idle threats. If his daughter dies, he will kill Holly. Each drug needs to go through rigorous testing and evaluation, insisted Noah. At this point, the therapy we have is being used on mice. I haven't even seen the preliminary results yet. For all I know, it could be killing the mice. Or curing them, said Bethany as she backed out of Noah's arms, wiping her eyes. Even if it stops the progression of the disease, which is doubtful, the damage to the brain, spine, and nerves isn't reversed, explained Noah. There is no improved quality of life. You said this child is three years old. Most infantile Tay-Sachs disease patients die before or around age five. 
At this point, she's probably unresponsive, may have trouble swallowing, may have seizures, be on a feeding tube. Just what sort of life would this kid have? Not only that, Ramsley Pharmaceuticals cannot release a drug to the public without FDA approval. If it ever got out into the press that we gave an untested drug to a child before human trials were approved, we could lose everything. There would be no Ramsley Pharma. What about Holly? asked Molson with a hitch in his voice. All Isla has to do is live, pleaded Bethany. If she lives, Tremblay will return Holly. You don't know that, grimly stated Noah. You said the guy is a criminal. He may not keep his word. Not only that, there is no guarantee the drug will work to any degree. Are you seriously saying no? questioned Molson. We cannot give an untested drug to a child, repeated Noah firmly. Noah? Max didn't know what to say. You, of all people, should know why we put safeguards into effect to prevent unready drugs from getting to the market, retorted Nora to Max. This isn't the same, stated Max. It's one drug for one child who is already dying. Please, begged Molson. No one needs to know. We don't need to notify anyone. Just a dose for her. There are protocols in place for thefts. Each vial must be accounted for, stated Noah. We can't just grab a dose from the lab with no one the wiser. I'm not going to risk the entire company for one person. We are responsible for hundreds of jobs, suppliers, and investors. I can't chance it. I can't believe you would just let her die, accused Bethany through her tears. Noah ran a hand down his face, shaking his head. You said Drew was looking for Holly, softly stated Everett. Maybe Bree and I can lend a hand. Max, text me Drew's phone number. I'm going to find Bree. Sure. Max took out his phone, tapping at the screen a moment. I think Noah, Michael, and I need to have a discussion. There is nothing to discuss, stated Noah flatly as Everett left the room. I'm the CEO of Ramsley Pharmaceuticals. We are not risking the company. Molson found a way to get Michael out of prison, Max reminded Noah. We owe him. You know that Michael is going to side with you, growled Noah as he ran a hand through his hair. I hate to be the bad guy, but we are talking about the chance of getting the company permanently shut down. Let's talk to Michael, decided Max. He grabbed Noah by the shoulder. We will be right back. Max steered Noah into the hallway. As the hallway door closed behind them, Bethany sat down in a chair, putting her head in her hands. They will do the right thing, Molson. Michael and Max will convince Noah. And if they don't? Noah's the only one with the security clearances. The only one who knows where things are in the lab, sighed Molson, tossing the clenched paperwork in his hand onto the bed to join the rest of the strewn papers from Isla's medical file. We can't do this without Noah. Maybe we can, slowly offered Ben. When Molson and Bethany looked at him, he explained, I can bypass security. I can erase the video or send it in a loop, so it appears we were never there. I can find out where any of the medications are stored, as long as they've been electronically entered into a log. I can even change the amounts on hand in the logs. I'm the one who takes care of their security measures, so I have full access. As long as you can verify the drug is correct, and we never run into any security personnel, we could potentially just take the drug. You mean steal it? questioned Molson in disbelief. Yes, I suppose so, faintly stated Ben. Oh, my word, breathed Bethany putting a hand to her mouth. No one would know. After the fact, probably, nodded Ben. You would do this? asked Molson. You would really do this? Ben hesitated, then nodded. It would be a simple theft. Then Ramsley Pharmaceuticals isn't at risk. Noah can easily state he didn't know what was happening to any FDA investigation. Noah wouldn't be at risk, nor Michael or Max. I'm pretty sure you're on board with the risk. Absolutely, nodded Molson. What about you? They're going to find out you bypassed your own computer system. That is the sticky part, 
said Ben thoughtfully. If I do it, I'll end up leaving a signature that can be traced back to me. If that happens, I won't get jail time. I'll get a permanent non-negotiable position with the hacking department of the NSA, FBI, CIA, or some amalgamation of letters. If I can get one of the other dark web hackers to do it from another country, it will be virtually untraceable for any consequences. Can you do that? wondered Bethany. It can be done, nodded Ben. Just consider this a plan B. I don't want to do it, but if we have to. Thank you, whispered Molson. Let's just hope the drug does help her, said Ben. Perhaps Max and Michael can convince Noah. Maybe there is a third way, ventured Bethany. Max, grimaced Noah, we can't do this. You keep saying that, but there has to be a way to keep the company safe from liability while still helping Holly, calmly stated Max. I don't see how, sighed Noah, as he followed Max down the hall to the elevator. I highly doubt Michael is going to come up with an idea either. You never know. Max pressed buttons, and they boarded the elevator. We are talking about a woman whose life is in danger. We need to do what we can to help. I understand, and I feel for her, said Noah. However, how do we risk the livelihoods of hundreds of people for one life? If we can find a way without exposing the company, we should take it, stated Max firmly, as they exited the elevator. It didn't take long to find Michael. He was off to the side of the group, listening to Jake and Sterling, while holding on to one of the triplets. The rest of the Ramsleys were crowded around, chatting. "'Michael, can we talk a moment?' asked Noah quietly. Sensing something was wrong, Michael followed Noah and Max into the hall. "'We have a situation,' began Noah. He explained, with Max's input, what they had discussed upstairs about Holly and Tremblay's daughter. The problem is the liability it opens the company up to. We would risk being permanently shut down by the FDA, should they find out. There's also no guarantee the drug works. I haven't read the latest reports, so I don't know how it's doing in the trials. We cannot fast-track it this time either, a grim Max said. It takes months for approval to be given to for human trials. Holly doesn't have months. She needs our help. Michael nodded. He gestured with one hand. I agree, concurred Max. We need to help her. I want to help Holly as well, but not at the expense of the company, sighed Noah. Let the police do their job and find her. Michael grimaced. He handed the toddler to Max, who easily took her. Using both hands, he tried to communicate to them. You're going too fast, a frustrated Noah frowned. I get that you're upset, but you need to slow down. Max gently bounced his niece as he tried to interpret Michael's now slower hand gestures. Yes, I think the whole thing was a setup too. The gang leader, what was his name, Tremblay? He had the idea Ramsley Pharma might be developing treatment for his daughter's disease. Somehow he found out about the treatment trials in our labs. He got Molson under his thumb, and now Molson really can't say no since Holly has been kidnapped. This is a mess. Noah dragged a hand through his hair. Michael nodded. We owe Molson a deep debt, softly stated Max. If it weren't for him, Michael might still be in prison. We need to help. If there were any way to help her without putting the company at risk, then I would happily agree, responded Noah. We need to let the police handle this. What if there was a way to help her without any liability to Ramsley Pharma? asked Bethany. Michael, Noah, and Max turned to see Ben, Bethany, and Molson standing in the hall behind them. Ben can hide any evidence of any missing vials of the drug. He has the computer know-how to alter the logs and the security cameras, calmly stated Bethany. Molson can administer the dosage. You know where everything is in the lab, Noah. You can get in and out without any issues. The scientists working on the project are going to notice when vials go missing protested Noah. For one dose, they are likely to chalk it up to a wrong count, or misplacing something, countered Ben. This is a therapy, grimaced Noah. It needs to be administered the lifetime of the patient. 
we would need multiple doses. Then we treat it as a theft, offered Ben. Once the lab notices the doses are missing, we report it. It draws suspicion away if Ramsley Pharma voluntarily reports the theft. If you don't want to get the Tay-Sachs drug, I will do it. Insert it as Sirius Molson. Just draw me a map. You can even turn me in after Holly is freed. I don't care if I go to jail or have a record if Holly is okay. Molson, your career, protested Bethany. You have to have a clean criminal record to be a doctor. I will be the fall guy, repeated Molson. Just let me steal the stuff and use it. Then once Holly is safe, you can turn me in. The company can't be held liable. It was all on me. You can even record it on security video. I don't care as long as Holly is okay. Just stall any investigation until Holly is returned. What if the drug doesn't work? What happens to Holly then? Questioned Noah. Tremblay is a dangerous man. He don't like failure, scowled Molson. I expect he will bury her somewhere. You mean he would kill her? Questioned an alarmed Max. Molson gave a tight nod. Michael laid a hand on Molson's shoulder. Okay, nodded a reluctant Noah. We'll do it your way. Molson will take the vials. Ben covers your tracks. We cooperate with a theft investigation. If the FDA becomes involved or gets too much, I will turn you in, Molson. Understood, agreed a resolute Molson. Hopefully it doesn't come to that, said Max. We will help you out however we can. You and Drew are part of our family. I appreciate it, Molson softly replied. Let me know when you're ready and I'll make myself available to help with the security, offered Ben. I had better go find Elle and see what trouble the boys are into, decided Noah. I'm going to give Drew a call to update him on what's happening here, softly said Bethany. Perhaps he'll have some news. I'll go with you, stated Molson. The group dispersed, leaving Max and Michael. Michael held out his hands for his daughter. Oh, no, answered Max, moving slightly away. She and I are getting along just fine. You can have her back when she starts crying. He patted his niece on the back while Michael gave him a wry look. I'm going to borrow you and your sisters, promised Max as he made faces at the toddler. Paget and I are great babysitters. Michael had a half smile and made a gesture. Of course I know her name, protested Max. It's Emma. Michael shook his head no, amused at Max's mistake. I was just kidding. She's Isabella guessed Max. He was rewarded with a nod from Michael. Surprise, everyone! The group looked behind them to find Dylan and Kelly approaching. Dylan was carrying a car seat with a tiny baby in it. Wow, you made it! Max greeted Dylan. This must be little Jackson. Kelly didn't want him to miss Christmas, smiled Dylan. He held up the car seat so they could easily see the sleeping baby. We're going to visit for a little bit, then get some rest. I just had to come back to the hotel to show him off, admitted a tired but happy Kelly. He's just the cutest baby. He is, agreed Max, cooing over Jackson. There were handshakes and congratulations offered to the couple. Dylan carefully took the newborn out of the baby carrier, cradling Jackson in his arms. He and Kelly went to join the rest of the Ramsleys in the ballroom. I think... This is going to go down as one of the most exciting Ramsley Christmases yet, murmured Max, as he watched his family gather round, chatting to Kelly and Dylan. Who would have thought, just a few years ago, we were all mostly bachelors. Now most of us are settled and have families. Family is the best Christmas gift there is. Michael had a nod. They watched the kids playing with their new toys. Their mother was happily conversing with the aunts, holding court in their own area, as Dylan approached them with the newest member of the Ramsley family. Max's eyes were drawn to Paget, who chatted with some of the other ladies in the group. Hands down, even after two children, she was still the most beautiful woman in the room, in his opinion. Max really was the luckiest guy. Merry Christmas. Max gave his brother a smile, before heading into the ballroom to join the family. Billionaire Henry Ramsley needs no stress 
a miracle, and a heart transplant. His family is facing scrutiny from an FBI investigation, and the arrest of his brother sees him back to overseeing the family business. Yet, this is the least of his concerns. Newly widowed Cora has two boys and a third on the way. Her husband left her purposely destitute and struggling. She has no home and an uncertain future. Years ago, Henry let Cora slip through his fingers when she married his brother Nate. Hoping to rekindle their friendship, he is trying to be someone she can depend on. However, as their friendship turns into something more, can Cora trust her feelings? And will Henry be there for the future? Find a second chance at love, book 11 of the Ramsley Brothers series, on Amazon in the fall of 2024.